24. Bolshevik Treachery Thus, there were certain signs which hinted that, in the reckoning of Lenin and others of the regime's dignitaries, the agreement concluded with the Maknavists had been mere opportunism and could not endure beyond the time it would take to finish off Rangel. The relative concessions granted to the insurgents had been designed only to put them at ease, in spite of the famous item 4 of the political part of the agreement, which in principle made provision for autonomy for Maknovia, to borrow the expression of Soviet historians. This matter was left hanging and had to be worked out directly with the Kremlin. In his, it is true, posthumously published, memoirs, Trotsky is clear that Lenin and he, quote, had at one time seriously envisaged allocating certain territories to the anarchists, with the consent of the local population of course and allowing them to conduct their experiment with a stateless society there. This plan was aborted at the discussion stage though the fault was not ours. The anarchist movement failed itself when it underwent the test of the events that followed one upon another in the course of the Russian Revolution. End quote. Victor Serge also mentions such a plan by Lenin and Trotsky, but indirectly, borrowing from the text by Trotsky that we have just quoted. Victor Serge opines that, it might have been equitable and advisable and perhaps such a broad-mindedness might have spared the revolution the tragedy towards which we were all drifting. It must be obvious that for Lenin and his side tolerance of any such experiment was absolutely out of the question, it would have been tantamount to admitting the shortcomings of their own ability to resolve the country's problems and that was inconceivable for anyone familiar with Lenin's trajectory ever since the break with the Mensheviks in 1903 and right through the squabbles, polemics, splits and other exercises which had carried him into power. A regime of free Soviets in the eastern Ukraine. The contagion would immediately have consumed the whole country and the house of cards known as worker peasant government maintained only by Bennett, and the bullet in the back of the head would have evaporated in a trice and lingered in the memories of workers only as some ghastly nightmare. Let us look at the explanation offered by Guzev and Yakovlev, the two signatories to the agreement on the Bolshevik side. Guzev reckoned that, quote, Markno's proposition of an alliance with the Red Army was accepted, not in order to secure a complementary force on the front, none was needed, but in order to rid ourselves for a time of an enemy behind our lines. As soon as Rangel was defeated, this alliance was quite naturally broken, for the proletarian revolution can fellow travel with the Kulak only in the struggle against the Pomeshik, but further along their paths diverge radically. End quote. One can spot the misrepresentations of the facts immediately, the proposition was Markno's, the backup on the front was not needed and there is the utter cynicism of the explanation of the quite natural breakdown of the alliance, so we know what was to be expected from that quarter right from the start. In 1920, for the first Congress of the Red International of Labor Unions, to which some anarcho-syndicalists had been invited, Yakovlev, the second signatory, wrote a pamphlet simply overflowing with poisonous attacks directed against the Russian anarchists and, above all, against Markno. He skims over his own part in the arranging of the agreement and cites Franz's explanations, regarding the breakdown which is attributed wholly to faults on the part of Markno, on the basis of a number of acts perpetrated in various locations around Ukraine against the Red Army. He rails against the solidarity displayed by the remainder of the anarchists towards Markno whom he depicts as a bandit deserving of no regard. Sure wasn't he for the whites in the Crimea? And Bolsheviks had not been great ones for the Christian virtue of forgiving trespasses against them, but even so, thereby demonstrating that the agreement which they had initially had been, as far as they were concerned, a mere scrap of paper. This was on a par with the practices of Bismarck and other exponents of realpolitik and negotiated something quite new in Russian revolutionary circles. Soon it was to become the stock in trade of the state system. As far as the Maknavists were concerned, Without harboring any illusions, either about the durability or solidity of the agreement, Arshinov, the view was that, in spite of everything, the agreement would hold up for three or four months, and they were counting on this interval to enable them to make the libertarian option known to Ukraine's laboring population and to demonstrate, by contrast, the inadequacies of the Bolsheviks' options. If there was to be conflict, the insurgents at first anticipated that it would be confined to the realm of ideas. 
Machnavists also had high hopes of the General Congress of Anarchists due to take place at the end of November in Kharkov. It was for this reason that a part of their delegation had stayed behind in the city and availed of the opportunity to participate in meetings and debates which drew sizable audiences and at which the delegation's members, especially Viktor Popov, were blunt about the necessity of powers being restored to local Soviets and about implementation of the famous Item 4 of the agreement, which had been shelved twice thus far. The delegation put out a newspaper, The Machnavist Voice, in which they spelled out their views and their complaints regarding the Leninist authorities. In its third issue, which was also to be its last, dated November 21, the editorial announced that having done their duty by the social revolution, the Machnavists delivered a whole series of lethal blows against Rangel. Also, of the Soviet government of Ukraine and Russia we require honest implementation of item 1 of our agreement, immediate release of all Machnavists and anarchists still languishing in the prisons and camps of the Soviet republics. According to Arshinov, Marknos then aide de Khan Grigory Vasilevsky, upon hearing on November 15 or 16 of Koretnik's breaching of Rangel's defences in Perkop, had cried out, that's the end for the agreement. Take my word for it, within one week the Bolsheviks are going to come down on us like a ton of bricks. And even more telling, in Guliaipoli and Polagui on November 23, the Machnavists arrested nine spies from the 42nd Red Army Division which was stationed nearby. These confessed to having been sent in by their intelligence branch to discover the precise whereabouts of Markno, members of the staff and of the insurgent Soviet, as well as those of Machnavist unit commanders. They were to have remained on the spot until the Red Army showed up and pointed out the domiciles or shadow the Machnavist officials who might not be at home. According to what they claimed, an attack in Guliaipoli was to be expected around November 24 or 25. The insurgents promptly tackled Rakovsky and the Red Army officials in Kharkov to press for the arrest and punishment of the officials of the 42nd Division, and then for a veto upon any Red Army units passing through the Guliaipoli region, so as to forestall any incidents. Kharkov replied on November 25 claiming that the whole thing was just a misunderstanding and that a joint commission would look into it. In fact, finding their plot blown, the Bolsheviks decided to unleash their onslaught the very next night. On the morning of November 26, Pyotr Rybin, secretary of the Soviet of Machnavist Revolutionary Insurgents, telephoned Rakovsky to find out what this proposed commission was all about. Rakovsky replied that everything was going to be smoothed out peaceably along with the controversial Item 4, when in fact he knew that the attack on the Machnavists and anarchists had been launched that very night. The entire Machnavist delegation, Viktor Popov, Budinov and Kokhokva, was placed under arrest, shipped to Moscow and shot. Apropos of their execution, Kubanin writes that, Moscow was not joking with the Machnovskina and acted without losing any time. In all, 346 anarchists and machnavists were rounded up in Kharkov in this operation. 40 were sent on to the Moscow Chika. Among them was Sereda, one of Markno's closest associates, Zinchenko, commander of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment, Kolesnichenko, commander of an insurgent detachment, Kazenko, commander of one of the infantry regiments, all seized by treachery. Learning of this outrageous behavior, Rybin again telephoned Rakovsky and told him of his feelings of indignation. Thanks to this phone call, the Chica managed to track him down, arrested him and shot him shortly afterwards. Nearly all of the membership of the Ukrainian Anarchist Confederation, Nabat, were also arrested and jailed, Volyne, Mrachny, Baron, David Kogan, Joseph Gottman, Bogush, and others. Kubanin records this roundup of anarchists by noting tersely, the Nabat was liquidated by organs of the Chika. That very same day, the 42nd Division with its five infantry brigades and cavalry brigades attacked Guliaipoli. A second cordon around the town was thrown up by Die 2nd Cavalry Corps, Volga Brigade and two special regiments. In spite of certain precautionary measures taken the evening before, Markno was wrong-footed by the suddenness of the attack. In Guliaipoli all he had to upon was his personal escort, die black guard, some 150 strong. Caught in a vice, he was encircled on every side, the end looked near when, all of a sudden, in the afternoon, 
one red unit hurriedly withdrew. Fearful of a trap, Markno hesitated and then, spotting that the way was clear, broke out of the cordon through this unexpected gap. Soviet historians ascribe his miraculous escape to treachery on the part of the commander of one of the red units. It is likely then that once they saw what was expected of them, some of the red troops showed solidarity with the Makhnovists and whereas the officers spoke of treachery, the fact is that some of these red troops and especially their commanders were to pay with their lives for this gesture of revolutionary solidarity. The 3rd Makhnovist Regiment, stationed at Malayatokmachka, was less fortunate, it was almost entirely rounded up by the 126th Division Brigade and a regiment of red cavalry. Markno counterattacked and beat the enemy back as far as Novo Uspanovka. Confusion set in among the many red units, the International Cavalry Brigade which had occupied Guliaipoli was attacked on November 27 by other brigades from the 42nd Division who thought that they were tackling insurgents. It was only after a day's fighting that this misunderstanding was cleared up. Markno promptly regrouped various insurgent units. Some red soldiers, sickened by the conduct of their officers, came to join him or surrendered to him at the earliest opportunity. In this way a contingent of 1,500 infantry and 1,000 cavalry was mustered. Duliaipoli was recaptured after a week, and the troops of the 42nd Division chased out, for now realizing the dirty work that had been entrusted to them, the red soldiers had no stomach left for the fight or fought with very little enthusiasm. In this way of the 6,000 red soldiers stripped of their weapons on the day that the town captured, one in three joined the Makhnovists. Guliaipoli was recaptured in a few hours, too late unfortunately to save 300 local peasants who were cut down by the henchmen of Bolsheviks. In the Crimea too, Moscow's instructions were enthusiastically implemented. As early as November 17, the strong partisan detachment of the anarchist Mokrasov, which had carried out significant harrying operations behind Rangel's lines, had been placed under the direct command of the 4th Army and been absorbed into regular units. On the same date, a secret order stipulated that Markno's army, i.e. Koretnik's detachment, also be placed under the authority of the 4th Army and that it was also to be transferred without delay to the Caucasus to take on insurgent Cossacks and that, of course, without the principals concerned being informed of what was going on. Koretnik and his staff, cut off from their detachment, were summoned on November 25 to a supposed meeting in Guliaipoli, arrested en route and shot out of hand. Gavrilenko, Koretnik's chief of staff, was killed, meaning probably that he was liquidated after having defended himself. The following night, at 1.35 am an attack was launched against the contingent itself. It would appear that a band of insurgents had been encircled by some Czechist units and wiped out by crossfire from several hundred machine guns, but the bulk of the contingent managed to break out of the circle shortly before this attack in circumstances related to us by Yefimov, the red military expert on the anti makhnovist campaign, quote, One way or another, it became apparent to us that Markno was building up to something and that in any event a break with him was inevitable and indispensable. On that basis, a plan was drawn up to encircle his two-foot bands, the Crimean band, and the one in the rear, the Guliaipoli one. Koretnik's band was ordered to occupy the Crimean coastline at the village of Zamruk near Saki, which it did. Then the Red Army troops were to encircle it, to this end the following units were redeployed for November 26, three cavalry divisions, three infantry divisions of three brigades each, and one brigade of artillery. On November 27, all these divisions received the order to attack the Makhnovist contingent and wipe it out. Of course the encirclement plan could only have succeeded if there was the element of surprise and immediate, resolute action by the Red Army which could be ensured only after painstaking political groundwork. A good explanation needed to be devised, to explain why, after an agreement had been concluded, the Red Army nonetheless had to wipe out the Makhnovists. This political groundwork reduced the element of surprise to zero which is in effect what happened. The Makhnovists were alerted several hours in advance of our attack and were partly able to avoid it. It was also obvious they knew well enough why red units had been deploying around them. On the evening of November 26, Koretnik's band struck out for the road leading from Simfropol to Perkop. Along the way they defeated the 7th Cavalry Division. 
As soon as the Machnavists' breakout had been discovered, the entire 3rd Cavalry Corps and the 52nd Division were dispatched in pursuit. However, these units acted in a half-hearted and hesitant fashion. Thus the Machnavists were able to reach the outskirts of Perkop on the evening of the 27th, there they split into two groups, one crossing the Sivash the other travelling through the Perkop Isthmus facing the 1st Infantry Division's small and non-pugnacious units. The two groups rejoined at Stroganovka on the mainland, on the morning of November 28. Thus were the Machnavists able to escape from the Crimea by covering 130 kilometers in two days while fighting a rearguard action. Our own units displayed no initiative. They all waited for orders to act and would not budge unless issued with specific orders. End quote. Yefimov was not afraid to contradict himself in the matter of the exact date of attack. He mentions the 27th so that this fits in with the justification of the formal order from Franz, allegedly issued on the 26th, the date mentioned in every other Soviet source, then explains that the Machnavists took two days to cross the Crimea before arriving on the mainland on the morning of the 28th. The military precision that he was required to display was not so easily reconciled with overriding political motives. Let us also note the exceptional deployment of forces on the Bolshevik side to confront this tiny Machnavist phalanx, this was probably indicative of the relative fear on the part of the Red leadership who still recalled the insurgents' exceptional feats against the Whites. Also, Yefimov cannot stop himself from acknowledging the Red unit's lackadaisical approach to the carrying out of this sordid assignment. All of the Red soldiers were well aware with whom they were dealing and believed not one single treacherous word of their commander's cock and bull stories about Markno's alleged treachery and other nonsense, so it was much against their will that they had to contemplate taking on their comrades in arms now. That is why, despite the tremendous fighting abilities of the Machnavists, it is hard to conceive of their having been able to penetrate a dense cordon of more than 200,000 Red troops between them and the Perkop Isthmus unless one considers the latter's reluctance to engage them. Moreover, Yefimov acknowledges that the Machnavists had been tipped off several hours in advance by Red soldiers about what was being plotted against them and had acted accordingly. This mentality had not gone unnoticed by the Red High Command which had to act ruthlessly, as the Red Soldiers' Army Journal reports, 2,300 Red troops had been shot in the Crimea at this time on charges of having undermined the just endeavors of the Soviet authorities and of their valiant Red Army. A significant figure that, if compared with losses suffered in the capture of Perkop, 8,000 killed and 1,200 wounded. Further on, Yefimov estimates the strength of the Machnavist contingent upon leaving the Crimea at 4,000 men, which may bear out the thesis that a thousand insurgents were massacred on the night of November 25 to 26, having been cut off from their comrades and not having had time to escape the Chika's machine guns. By way of justifying this act of treachery, Franz first issued an order dated November 24 and intended for the Red Army. It spoke of a communique of November 23 urging the Machnavists to be assimilated into the Red Army's regular units. What is more, he drew up a veritable list of charges against them, they were accused of undermining the Red Army's rear, of distracting Red soldiers from their duties, of having committed criminal acts against Bolshevik officials or Red Army personnel, and of having refused to carry out the order given to them on November 20 to march on the Caucasus. In passing he claimed all the glory of the victory over the Whites for himself and his troops. He gave Machnavists two days in which to comply with his instructions. What is at once disturbing and revealing and what proves that this was unquestionably a lie cobbled together after the event to meet? The requirements of circumstances is that at the same time he ordered his troops to have done with the Machnovskina in a trice. All red units must act boldly, decisively and ruthlessly. The bandit gangs must be eliminated as quickly as possible, the entire armament of the Kulaks must be seized also. This Krasfossad was followed up by a second order dated November 26 and issuing from Kharkov at 1.35 am, alleging that the November 23 order had not been carried out by the Machnavists and that, instead, Markno had begun to take action against Soviet authorities, as a result of which he and his units were being declared enemies of the revolution and of Soviet power. This latter order seems less of a formality than the first but was not made official on the day in question, 
for it was to appear in the Bolshevik press only on December 15, it had been backdated as is readily understandable. The element of surprise had to be preserved, as Yefimov admitted earlier. Not until much later and then quite by chance did the Maknavists find out about it while reading the Bolshevik papers. Now, these ultimata with their provocative style had been drafted under the supervision of Lenin himself, the general in command of the front, Sergei Kamenev, attests to that in his memoirs. B. It the Antirangel Compact or the order from Franz, the whole effort had been mounted with Lenin's consent and in accordance with his directives. So the responsibility lay at the highest levels, in the highest echelons of the party and with Lenin himself not that that was any impediment to Franz's breaking his word and reneging upon his signature. In his mind, these were peccadilloes, and he was above all else anxiously courting the praises of the supreme guide, preparatory to winning some medals with view to climbing up the party hierarchy. The will was soon to turn, and he would in turn come be ensnared by someone who outbetrayed him. The authorities' tactics, then, consisted of shifting blame for the breakdown of the alliance onto the Maknavist insurgents although as we have seen the latter had observed the strictest loyalty in implementation of the agreement concluded. Now, we have unpublished, first-hand and we might add, weighty evidence its author, Marcel Olivier, was one of the French founders of the Third International, Rosa Luxemburg's chief translator into French and an active member of the French Communist Party for many a long year before he broke with it abruptly in the 1930s. At this time Olivier was in Russia and had been invited, along with other French representatives including Alfred Rosmer, Jacques Sadoul and Henri Barbousse, to come to Ukraine to witness the defeat of Rangel. Upon arriving, he travelled on separately by truck, thus it was that at one stopover in the open countryside he saw, quote, a troop of horsemen loom all of a sudden from behind an outcrop. They, swooped down on us so quickly that they were upon us before we could lift a finger to scramble back on board the truck and seize the rifles inside. Mounted on small, highly strung horses and armed to the teeth, carbines slung across the shoulder, saber by their side and daggers at their belts, their chests crisscrossed by leather ammunition belts, and their heads topped by enormous fur chapkas, they had an appearance that was unsettling. I might even say unnerving. End quote. It transpired that these new arrivals were Maknavists, Marcel Olivier and his fellow travellers reckoned that their time had come, not knowing that a compact had been concluded between Bolsheviks and insurgents, but the latter treated them in friendly fashion and they were able to continue on their way unmolested. They reached Melitopol and at headquarters attended a soiree during which Olivier noticed a, quote, group of officers immersed in animated discussion. In their midst stood a fellow of about 25 years of age whom the others appeared to be besieging and who was replying with passion and order to the queries and arguments of his interlocutors. I asked Victor Taratuta what the discussion was all about. He explained that this officer was from the Markno division recently incorporated into the Red Army, and that he was defending his libertarian viewpoint against the others. I remarked upon the impassioned tone in which he was doing so, Taratuta told me, literally, once we have done with Rangel, we will shoot him. This model revolutionary, Taratuta, this 100% Bolshevik whom Bogdanov and Lunakarsky had accused of being an Okrana agent and whom Lenin himself, in conversation with Professor Rozhkov, had referred to as a con man told me that, in as many words. It will be readily understood that it came as a shock to me. But, to be honest, I did not take it seriously. A throwaway remark, I thought. Shooting a man who was fighting alongside you and with whom one had just signed an alliance open and above board, merely because his beliefs did not square with one's own, would have been an act of infamy of which I did not then think the Bolsheviks capable. In which belief, I was mistaken, as we shall see. End quote. Shortly after this, Marcel Olivier crossed the Pecop Isthmus and was amazed to see no signs of the fight which the Whites had put up in these entrenched positions which at first sight looked impregnable. It was only when he discovered that the Whites had been attacked from behind following the Maknavists and other Red Units crossing of the Sivash Straits that he was able to comprehend, and he then found even more scandalous the treatment to which the Maknavists were subjected shortly after. Then he learned of the breakdown of the agreement and upon arrival in Melitopol, 
was informed of the fate of the young Macnavist officer whom he had seen in discussions with Red Army officers, quote, The day before, before the garrison assembled in the square, he had found himself one, mentioned in army dispatches for his brilliant conduct under fire and two, sentenced to death for rebellion against the Soviet authorities, sentence followed by immediate execution. So Taratuta had been farsighted, or, to be more precise, well informed. As for the deed itself, I leave it to the reader to reach his or her own opinion of shooting a man only moments after having commended him in army dispatches for his brilliant conduct under fire. As for myself, let me say that I regard it as infamous. End quote. On the same occasion, Olivier learned of the failure of the push against Warsaw which had been covered up for five months. This is precious testimony for Marcel Olivier simply cannot be suspected of entertaining any sympathy at all for libertarians or macnavists, being at this time of rigidly orthodox views and outraged only by specific infamous methods rather than querying the very principle of the nature of power. John's ideas, from whom we have already quoted, a bourgeois liberal with little time for ideology, speaks very prosaically of an immense thirst for power in explaining the conduct of the Bolsheviks, quote, power of itself, power as the goal, such was the Bolsheviks' ruling notion. Their doctrine set them free of all restraints. Morality, law, justice were so many bourgeois prejudices. Hence the total indifference in the selection of means, hence the monstrous amorality of the Soviet regime which shows itself in all the minutiae of Bolshevik life and Bolshevik politics, hence their recourse, during the war and before the revolution, to the most sordid methods, treachery, perfidy. End quote. Without dwelling too long at this point on possible explanations for the conduct of the Bolshevik leadership, let us recall their essential justification, namely, that they were invested with an historic social mission of capital significance to mankind's future and in order to achieve this mission, all seemed licit to them. This formula left them free to resort to all of the methods of rule known thus far, concentrating on the best of them, which is to say the worst, in order to maintain themselves in power. However, they were not fully conversant with the mechanism for, further down the road, it was going to mangle them too just as tragically, as we shall see anon. What was at stake was neither more nor less than the basic ethical connection between the chosen end and the means used to achieve it. Arshinov also demonstrates the undeniable premeditation behind this Bolshevik treachery, on this point he cites two assassination bids against Markno in the months of October and November, then two handbills found on the first captured red soldiers on November 27 headed, death to the Maknovskina, and forward against Markno. These were undated but had been issued to the troops on November 15 or 16, 1920. Thus, to their great misfortune, the Maknovists had yet again snatched chestnuts from the fire only to see the Bolsheviks alone reap the benefits and they were paying dearly for the lesson. Now they needed to fight desperately in the direst of circumstances for their very survival. 25. The last year of fighting and the death throes of libertarian revolution in Ukraine. The Red Army High Command took it ill that Koretnik's detachment, penned up at the other end of the Crimean Peninsula, managed to pierce the dense cordon and escape from the rat trap. The troops dispatched in pursuit of him, who included Latvians, displayed little urgency about catching him up, probably because of the still fresh recollection of their brotherhood in arms, so the Red Army leaders called up troops stationed in the rear, on the continent itself they, having played no part in the capture of Perkop did not know it was the victors over the whites that they were now under orders to confront. A sea of red troops was deployed to forestall the Maknavists' return to Guliaipoli. Traced to Mikhailovka, they were encircled by a division of Kersantis, Lenin's Junkers, the 42nd Infantry Division, the International Cavalry Brigade, and the 4th Red Cavalry Divisions commanded by Tymoshenko. The insurgents were still a daunting force, 1,000 horsemen, 300 Tachankis, 250 machine guns and 6 cannon. However, they were heavily outnumbered, by 20 to 1. Though that was not the most serious thing, above all, they were short of ammunition, for the Red Army had taken care not to restock them after the capture of Perkop and Simfropol. On November 30, they evaded a first enemy unit and then, the following day, December 1, in the town of Timoshevka, 
they engaged the 42nd Red Division all day long, inflicting heavy losses. The following night, they seized Timoshevka, capturing an enemy regiment down to the last man and stocking up on arms and ammunition again. At this point they made a grave mistake, which Markno himself would assuredly have avoided, by not moving on immediately and allowing enemy forces to regroup and flood towards Timoshevka from every direction. In the early hours of the morning, they repulsed every enemy attack wave and even counterattacked but running short of ammunition, were obliged to cut and run for Mikhailovka that afternoon. There they found themselves pinned down by enemy cavalry and artillery. 600 insurgents died heroes' deaths while others broke up into small groups and tried to slip through the net thrown up around them. 200 insurgents were again intercepted and cut down by the International Cavalry Brigade's sabers, this brigade was made up of Germans, Hungarians, and other ex-POWs enlisted by Moscow. Over half of this valiant body undoubtedly the strongest fighting unit of all those which saw action in the civil war perished in this unequal confrontation. Some escapees did manage to slip through the Red's Ring of Steel in several places. The last remaining compact body of some 250 to 300 horsemen linked up with Markno on December 7 in the Greek village of Kermanchik, some 80 kilometers east of Guliapoli. The meeting was a dramatic one. Mochenko and Taranovsky who were leading the contingent announced with pained irony that it was their honor to announce the return of the Crimean army. Mochenko added, yes, brothers, now we know what these communists are. Markno remained, Samba, the sight of this tiny band of survivors from his 1,500 elite cavalry who had set off a month before having shaken him to the core. He held his tongue and strove to control his emotions. The insurgents came together in general assembly. The escapees told how Koretnik and his staff had been treacherously arrested and shot out of hand. Outraged and infuriated by this monstrous treachery, the Maknavists were henceforth to fight spurred on by a terrible thirst for revenge. Against the insurgents, the Red Army marshaled two-thirds of the total manpower massed against Rangel, that is, around 150,000 frontline fighters drawn from five armies, the 6th Army, 59,404 men complete with staff and other services, the 4th, 81,339 men, the 13th, 26,356, the 1st, 21,089, and the 2nd Cavalry, 15,257. At this point the Red Army had a total of 5.5 million men in service, 130,000 of them ex tsarist officers. On December 5, it was decided that this sizable force would be cut by 2 million so as to facilitate a return to normal life, but this was a formality, for as we have seen, this army was all in all without any real appetite for battle and was only a crushing burden upon the population whose task it was to keep it supplied and billeted. It is noteworthy that, of the demobilized Latvians who had served as the regime's all-purpose troops, over half decided to make their way home to bourgeois Latvia in 1921, the rest, probably too compromised to go home, opted to remain in Leninist territory. The strategy laid down by Franz Visavis the Maknavists tended to provide for three concentric lines of encirclement around their chief base, the Guliapoli region, for pushing them towards the shores of the Sea of Azov and for wiping them out there. However, there was many a slip twixt cup and lip and Franz was forced to draft order after order, in great detail on some points, between December 5th and 15th in order to hone his maneuver further. On December 5th, he ordered a concentric offensive from the northwest, north and east, in order to beat the remnants of the Maknavis detachments back towards the Sea of Azov and ruthlessly exterminate them, the insurgents of the Pavlograd and Novomoskovsk region were forced back towards the Dnieper, there to be exterminated also. On December 11, all Red troops were ordered to carry out overlapping movements to forestall any one breakthrough by the Maknavists and to carry out a sweep of the entire area. The order of December 6 urged careful sweeps of all occupied settlements, with anybody found in possession of weapons to be shot. On that very day the liquidation of the Maknovskina and of banditry in Ukraine was acknowledged as a government target of the first importance by the military revolutionary Soviet of the Soviet Republic. All signs of insubordination, questioning and foot-dragging must be ruthlessly punished. 
The terms ruthless and annihilation endlessly recurred in all Franz's orders. He himself was under continual pressure from Lenin who, on December 17, issued an unequivocal resolution, that it be demanded of Comrade Franz in the name of the Central Committee that he redouble his efforts to liquidate Markno, and shortly afterwards, the Commander-in-Chief, S. Kamenev, and Franz must be nagged and hounded every day into completing the annihilation and capture of Antonov and Markno. Nagged and hounded in their turn, the Red Army troops did what they could but without much success the very opposite, indeed, according to one Red Army officer, M. Rybakov, Markno sauntered throughout the region as the fancy took him, picking his targets and suddenly popping up wherever he chose, capturing a regiment or a whole brigade, seizing transports, munitions and artillery pieces then bursting out of the encirclement as he chose. And this, according to Rybakov, thanks to the support of the populace and his intelligence service, composed of the most unlikely-looking types, vagabonds, red soldiers looking to rejoin their units, miners allegedly arriving to barter coal against bread, repentant deserters, ex-members of the Communist Party even, victimized women, widows, orphans, etc. Superbly briefed on the enemy's deployment, Markno struck where and when he wished. Brova, commanding a detachment of 600 Maknavists operating around Pavlograd, defeated a brigade of Red Hussars at Komor on December 2, on December 3 and again in Komor, Markno himself, at the head of 4,000 insurgents, crushed a brigade of Red Kyrgyz, Rybakov specifies there was, quote, the impression that Markno was striking everywhere, that he was irresistible, that he was beyond capture and that, with the forces at hand, a struggle against him was not feasible. The rout of the Kyrgyz brigade had so demoralized the combatants as to rob them of their absolute faith in their strength, in their expertise, so great was their fear that they did not dare wander far to carry out reconnaissance, in broad daylight, no more than a kilometer from their base and that in fat country, such was their terror of the Maknavists' saber work. End quote. On December 12, Markno linked up with Vdovichenko's detachment and captured Berdyansk, where 86 Czechists and Communists were sabred. On the 14th, he encountered numerous enemy troops at Andreevka and captured two whole divisions, i.e., 20,000 men. For their benefit a meeting was laid on, the meaning of the insurgent struggle was explained to them and any who so wished were invited to join the Maknavist ranks, the rest were sent packing. These new recruits were not always very dependable, some wasted no time in deserting, scampering away to brief the Red Command on the Maknavist positions. Thanks to such briefings, the insurgents were more readily located and on December 16 a great battle brought the two sides together at Fedorovka. All of the Red divisions converged on Fedorovka amid the greatest confusion with some even firing upon others. The fact is that everybody, Maknavists included, was wearing the same uniform. One Red Regiment was first taken prisoner by the insurgents, then rescued in a counter-attack by their own side. The engagement, which occurred in a temperature of 17 degrees below zero ended in a stalemate, but, since the insurgents escaped and left behind in enemy hands the black standard bearing their slogan with the oppressed against the oppressors always, the Red Command counted the outcome as a victory for its side. Franz sent off a telegram to this effect to Lenin on December 17. The contingent of 7,000 Maknavists which had managed to breach the triple encirclement, clashed, with the fourth cordon, following a lengthy engagement, its infantry has been wiped out and only Markno and 300 to 400 horsemen managed to get away. He reckoned this a fatal blow to the Maknovskina. That was not the opinion of Rybakov who gives a detailed account of the battle and estimates Maknavist losses at only 500 men. Franz knowingly misrepresented the outcome in order to play down his complete failure and thereby to avoid being unduly nagged and hounded by his master. At the start Markno believed that by defeating a few divisions he might stop the enemy offensive in its tracks, the facts tempered his optimism, and he came to appreciate that he faced a host of red troops whose aim was to encircle him and overwhelm him with their numbers. He was very quick to react and his strategical genius came to the rescue again. He split his contingent up into several detachments, scattering them throughout the region before setting off himself along with 2,000 partisans, in a northerly direction to begin with. He smashed some more enemy units along the way, derailing a trainload of Czechists and Bolsheviks near Alexandrovsk, 
before crossing the Dnieper and thrusting deep into the provinces of Kiev and Kherson, with a mob of red divisions on his heels. Through severe frost and blizzards, the detachment covered 80 kilometers daily, swooping unexpectedly on enemy units, who had no inkling that it was so close. On every side the Maknavists hit out at the oppression of people, coming to symbolize popular revenge, Czechists, militiamen, punitive detachments, looters on behalf of the state, Bolsheviks, all were fair game. On December 19, the staff of the Petrograd Kersenty Brigade was taken unawares and wiped out. Among the victims of this whirlwind assault, they were startled to find an ex-general of the Tsarist Army, Martinov, an ex-colonel, Drizhevinsky, and a high-ranking officer, Matviev of similar background, along with several Bolshevik political commissars. A prominent Bolshevik leader, A. Parkomenko, close to Budyeny and Voroshilov, perished with his staff on January 3, 1921, when they too were taken by surprise. A Red Army commander, Pavel Ashakmanov, a survivor of the Petrograd Kersenty Brigade, while bemoaning the loss of his comrades could not disguise his admiration for Markno and his tactics, quote. The aphorism to the effect that the art of warfare is not all but learning and that a well-made head is often to be preferred could not be more apt than when applied to the insurgent army's commander, Nestor Markno. Of course one cannot believe that he has followed in Napoleon's footsteps who disclosed the secret of his successes by saying, what I do is the product only of my talent, but I have always acted in complete accord with the precepts of the great strategist. All the same, one cannot claim he has followed Suvorov's advice and read Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Julius Caesar or Bonaparte. Here we are indubitably dealing with a well-made head and what is particularly interesting, all his sensible tactical decisions have always conformed to the fundamental laws of tactics. He has quite rightly played upon the psychology of the fighter aiming to strike a lethal disorganization into our Red Army. He has tried to drive a wedge between head and heart by letting it be largely known that he amnested simple soldiers and ruthlessly gunned down only commanders and commissars. Markno has captured the charisma of the commander superbly by throwing into the military balance his last reserve, himself. It is he personally who extricates his troops from all perilous situations. Every bush, every mound, every ravine, everything has been weighed. Upan is a factor in the equation. Intelligence, liaison, and protection are organized to perfection. He is not just very familiar with our weaknesses, but even takes the personalities of our commanders into the reckoning. He strikes on the left then veers to the right, attacks Berdyansk then makes for Guliapoli. He stays no longer than a day or night in any one place lest he be seriously encircled. In the event of not succeeding, he makes off, dispersing. He does not encumber himself with prisoners, at Andreevka he dumped 1,200 of them in our path. He is equally ready to jettison his baggage which he lays out as bait, when need be, for our cavalry while he himself makes off fast and far. Markno the partisan is enterprising and gallant in the extreme. The first time, he let himself be encircled in Berdyansk and thereby forced us to divert our troops southwards. This was a decoy action, we regrouped vigorously but Markno discovered that we had not diverted our troops sufficiently towards the south and let himself be encircled once again, in Andreevka this time. There, once our troops had been well and truly diverted, he assured himself that the road northwards was free and broke out of our circle in a flash, leaving our troops in disarray and thoroughly disappointed. Within days, he was on the far bank of the Dnieper, near Alexandrovsk, within a week, he was operating in Belgrade. End quote. In this astonishing tribute from vice to virtue, Ashakmanov forgets only one thing, that Markno was fighting for social revolution and freedom, whereas Ashakmanov served only the narrow interests of the Bolshevik party state and aspired only to a few medals to display on his breast. The difference accounts for a lot. The Red Army Command entrusted the task of giving chase to Markno to a flying corps under the command of Nesterovich, a corps made up of the best units from the five armies which had failed in the celebrated encirclement operation. This flying corps was charged with dogging the insurgents' footsteps, denying them all respite and facilitating the actions of the two best divisions of Red Cossacks which had been placed under the command of Primakov and Kotovsky. 
Markno had to avail of all the talents that Ashakmanov acknowledged he possessed in order to escape his terrible stalkers. Arshinov, who was along on this dangerous trek describes the seriousness of the situation, quote. All escape routes were blocked. The area was a veritable graveyard nothing but rock and sheer gorges covered by ice. Advancement was possible only with the most painful slowness, while continual fire spewed from machine guns and artillery on every side. No one could see any way out, any salvation. However, no one wanted to disperse in disgrace. They all determined to die together, side by side. It was unspeakably painful at this point to look upon the handful of insurgents surrounded by rocks, the vastness of the sky and enemy fire, they were motivated by the stiffest resolve to fight to the last, already convinced that all was lost. Sadness, despair and a peculiar grief gripped the soul. There was the urge to shout out to the whole world that a crime beyond expiation was in the process of commission, that all that was most heroic in the people, the best that it was capable of producing in heroic times was in the process of being done to death and perishing forever. End quote. At this point wounded, Markno gave proof of his exceptional strength of spirit, and of the unbelievable resourcefulness of his tactical genius and still managed to give the slip to the inevitable annihilation that seemed to await the detachment. He veered as far away as the borders of Galicia before turning back towards Kiev, crossing the Dnieper again and popped up as if by a miracle in the province of Poltava. With the Red Cossacks still in pursuit, he veered even further north and at last succeeded in shaking off his pursuers at Belgrade towards the end of January. It had been a fantastic trek across more than 1,500 kilometers and five provinces, punctuated by daily combat and against the backdrop of a hostile nature. To be sure, he had lost all of his baggage, his artillery and his machine guns, not to mention half his detachment, but now he was in a position to seize the initiative himself. Unable to defeat the insurgents on the field of battle, the Red authorities took it out on the population of their preferred theatre. On December 17, Franz ordered ale settlements to be encircled and repression of ale who aroused the slightest suspicion. In reply other Makhnevist detachments which had remained on home ground mounted reprisals against Czechists, administrative agents, militians, and the bands of plunderers commissioned to requisition all of the peasantry's foodstuffs. A report from Vitala Komisar Vladimirov, giving a catastrophic summary of the situation, left Lenin aghast. Working himself up into a frenzy, the great man conveyed his rage to Sklyansk, the secretary of the regime's military Soviet, quote, The 6th of November 1921, Comrade Sklyansky, I enclose a further warning. Our military commander has failed lamentably by allowing Markno to escape, despite huge numerical advantage and strict orders to capture him and now he has failed even more dismally by showing himself incapable of crushing a few handfuls of bandits. Have drawn up for me a short report from the commander-in-chief concerning what is going on, with a brief breakdown of the disposition of the bands and the troops. What use is being made of our thoroughly dependable cavalry? The armoured trains. Are they deployed rationally? Do they not move around haphazardly to recover wheat? Armoured vehicles. Aircraft? How are they used, and how many? Wheat and heating fuel, all are being wasted because of these bands while we have a million men in our army. Make every effort you can to get the commander-in-chief to get a grip on himself. Lenin end quote. At the 10th Party Congress in March 1921 with the Kronstadt sailors uprising at its height, he scathingly rebuked Franz, reminding him of the necessity that Mark no be liquidated with all possible speed, it is going to be an extraordinary, painful war. But we must have an end of Mark no. I wish you success. During the same Congress, in order to cow the internal opposition which banded together under the name of workers' opposition, he equated them with the anarcho-syndicalists and Machnavists. It is true that a year earlier, he had already deployed the same arguments to confound the leader of the so-called democratic centralist internal faction, i.e., a faction that supported the parties actually operating internally in accordance with democratic centralism. Lenin had good grounds for feeling uneasy, for not only were the Machnavists stymieing the many red units pursuing them, but they were also alerting some of their adversaries to the justice of their cause. In his memoirs, Budieny, 
the one-time Chief Sergeant Major of the Tsarist Army and now Commander-in-Chief of the 1st Army of Red Cavalry whose task it was throughout this period to combat Markno, relates that following the crushing of one of his army brigades, he had to have the brigade commander, political commissar and two regimental commanders shot in order to stiffen these units will to win. Budiany adds that, to the great disquiet of both himself and Voroshilov who shared command, they had had to face the face that, none of the commanders had any inclination to complete the task of wiping out Markno, regardless of cost and with all possible speed. Lots of red soldiers surrendered, in the knowledge that they had nothing to fear, as the insurgents executed only officers and political commissars, some red soldiers joined the Maknavists. While others were released and for the most part recaptured by special commissions from the Red Army which escorted them back to their units of origin. Such generosity backfired on the insurgents, for their ex-captives rejoined the fighting and even supplied intelligence about the Maknavists' strength and positions. The most spectacular defection was that of the commander of the 1st Brigade of the 4th Red Army Cavalry Division, 1 G.S. Maslakov who, to the absolute consternation of his superiors, defected to Brovers Maknavist detachment near Pavlograd on February 9, 1921, along with his whole brigade. Many other Red soldiers deserted and joined, throughout the country, the string of partisan bands fighting against the regime, on behalf of restoration of power to the people, in the format unanimously described as Free Soviets. Indeed, after the defeat of the Whites, the populace had awakened to the emptiness of the Bolsheviks' promises, so it aimed to assert its rights vis-à-vis -vis the party state which had snatched away the gains of the 1917 revolution. Hundreds of thousands of partisans rose in revolt and turned against the regime's representatives. Soviet historians have dubbed this period the Mini-Civil War, every whit as murderous as the one against the Whites, for it cost the Red Army, according to official figures, 170,000 dead in 1921 and 21,000 in the following year. The whole country was ablaze, in Byelorussia, in Russia itself, especially around Tambov where the social revolutionary Antonov marshaled a mighty well-organized army of 50,000 at the start of 1921, in Siberia, 60,000 partisans had revolted in one district alone, in Karelia, in Central Asia, in the Caucasus and in Kronstadt, the steadfast citadel of revolution which called Lenin and his confederates to account. It was the biggest scare of the time for the Bolshevik leaders who expected to have their throats cut by rampaging Mujiks. They wasted no time in climbing down, lifting the roadblocks, and other obstacles to direct barter between town and countryside, restoring private ownership and replacing their requisitioning looting with a Levi in kind, in short, they made full speed astern, temporarily shelving their ideological weaponry. The essential thing, as far as they were concerned, was to cling to power and protect their position of dominance and then bide their time. This was quickly followed up by the conclusion of trade agreements, the conditions did not matter, with Britain, Germany and any other country willing to enter into them. Through the good offices of humanitarian organizations set up by sympathetic bourgeois, application was made to the United States for charity, other cereal-growing nations too were called upon to rescue millions of peasants from famine, Wheat thus collected was of course distributed under the strictest supervision of the state machine. In parallel with this, the fight against the insurgents was stepped up, the Red Army took a back seat to special units and Czechists, they resorted to police provocations. Czechists infiltrated the insurgent groups, the better to expose and crack down on them. This strategy of the carrot and stick, with which all authoritarian regimes have been conversant, would nonetheless rescue the authorities and, after several years of intense fighting, contributed to the undoing of most of the insurgents. In Ukraine, a region prized on account of its natural resources, there were, again according to official sources, some 45 000, 50 000 degree in revolt against Moscow by the end of 1920. In the months that followed, a secret report from the staff heading the anti-insurgent campaign listed 30 partisan detachments numbering 27,500 infantry and cavalry and with access to machine guns and artillery pieces. The most significant of these was Marknos, he was credited with 2,000 infantry and 600 horsemen, 80 machine guns, 10 cannon and two armored cars with the telling names of death to the communist commissars, and Bakko Markno. 
For large-scale operations the Machnavists could field 12,000 men, 2,500 of those cavalry. Franz confirmed this estimate by reckoning that he faced 15,000 Machnavists in December 1920, 5,000 to 6,000 by January and a central corps group of 2,500 infantry and cavalry, with 80 to 100 machine guns and several cannons by March-April 1921. Adapting to the new mode of struggle, the insurgents overhauled their structures and activities. This was the first partisan war of this century and quite novel compared with all the previous forms of guerrilla warfare and fighting of that sort. For one thing, speed of movement was the priority, a speed of 80 to 100 km daily at times, to this end, outriders rode ahead of detachments to prearranged staging posts, to arrange fresh mounts and fresh food with sympathetic local peasants and regularly they plotted the deployment of enemy forces. Secondly, Given the huge numbers and concentrations of enemy forces, priority was given to small detachments of several hundreds of partisans operating in different sectors and coming together only for important operations. Certain units were permanently assigned to areas suited to rest and recuperation, and these represented bases offering fresh supplies and manpower. At the head of isolated detachments were tried and tested Machnavist commanders like Kirilenko, Kosin, Savinov, Brova, Ivanyuk, Shus, Vdovichenko, Zabudko, Pukhomenko, and Kristovoy as well as new commanders firmly ensconced in their theatres of operations. Around him, Markno kept Petrenko, Belash, Taranovsky, Zinkovsky and certain newer partisans, in order to train them in this curious strategy before they set off to implement it elsewhere once they had digested it properly. The above-mentioned secret Red Army report notes, for instance, that the chief of staff of Markno's main detachment was one Vasiliev, the head of intelligence service was Sider of Pavlovich, while command of the different units was vested in three ex-sailors, Kishko, Lyachenko, and Gora, and, the cavalry commander was former Sergeant Major Dolzhenko, almost all of them newcomers to the movement. Furthermore, nearly all Machnavists dressed in Red Army uniform, which only added to the confusion of their opponents. Their tactics also were very modern, all nerve points, communication lines, telegraph lines, guard and surveillance posts, sundry depots, etc., were methodically destroyed. All agents of the authorities, whether checkists, mobile requisition teams and administrative agents, were systematically subjected to a revolutionary hounding. And propaganda was not neglected either. The movement's draft theoretical declaration and the statutes of the Free Soviets were circulated in thousands upon thousands of copies. The Red Army's high command had a hard time stomaching its defeats. Budieni wrote that he and the other heads of the Antimarkno drive were ashamed to look at one another, and that he was loath to go to the telephone when Franz called. It looked like we were about to ensnare Markno at least, but instead of news of victory, disagreeable news was received. Franz and his chief strategists and lieutenants Kork, Eidmann, Voroshilov and Budieni pored over the reasons for their failures and made significant amendments to their strategy of straightforward encirclement. They analyzed the battle sites and the insurgents' subsequent movements, trying to anticipate and deploy strong units along the supposed itinerary and commissioned their best troops to take on Markno there. Every modern technology was pressed into service, armored cars, aircraft, armored trains, and mobile artillery. In March 1921, during the Kronstadt Sailors' Revolt, Markno dispatched Brova and Maslikov at the head of a special corps, to spread the fire of insurrection into the Don and the Cuban, Pukhomenko set off with another detachment for the Voronezh region in Russia, a third group of 1,000 insurgents under Ivanyuk, made for Kharkov. Markno himself crisscrossed the right bank of the Dnieper. Having been wounded in the foot, he moved around by Tachanka, but remounted his horse as soon as circumstances required it and was unfailingly and permanently to be found at the head of the detachment, personally directing all maneuvers. He returned to the left bank of the Dnieper and fell into an ambush in the vicinity of Militopol. He gave one body of enemy troops the slip and kept up the pressure on the rest for 48 hours solid made a forced march of 60 kilometers and overwhelmed another Red Army unit near the shores of the Sea of Azov. Then he split his men, dispatching Kurilenko to give a fillip to the insurgent movement in Berdyansk and Marupol district, 
charging him especially to track down and punish a Czechist unit which had earned itself a sinister reputation by shooting the wife and suckling child of one insurgent. He himself continued to crisscross the region along with Petrenko at the head of a contingent of 1,500 horsemen and two infantry regiments, routing several enemy units including an entire Kersenty regiment, and seizing munitions, weapons, artillery and horses. Two days after that, he had to tackle fresh red troops in sizable numbers, he charged them at the head of his partisans but in a counterattack that was intrepid to the point of madness, he was gravely wounded in the belly. Having passed out, he was evacuated by Tachanka, regained consciousness, split his unit up into 100 or 200 man groups, sending these out in every direction and was left behind with just his celebrated black Sotnia for company. He wanted to withdraw to some quiet spot to tend to his injury but had to engage one after another, with just his tiny unit, the 9th Red Cavalry Division and other fresh cavalry troops. A savage saber engagement ensued. Yet again the end seemed nigh, the insurgents were on the verge of being overwhelmed by numbers but a final square of expert machine gunners sacrificed themselves, allowing Maldino to break out of the tightening noose. Before their engagement, their commander, Misha, a native of the Berdyansk region had announced to Markno, Bakko, you are necessary to the cause of our peasant organization. That cause we cherish. We are all going to die shortly, but our death will spare you as well as all who believe and protect you. Do not forget to pass that on to our parents, then hugged him and set off to sell his life dearly against the enemy. Maldino was later to recall these heroic comrades, with some emotion, thanks to whom he was able to carry on with his fight. On March 6, 1921, the Fifth Pan-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets, organized by the Bolsheviks, ordained a drive against banditry, which is to say against all their political enemies, as a state task of primary importance. At the same time it declared an amnesty for all bandits willing to repent, an amnesty valid up until April 15 and then extended shortly afterwards by one month. According to the authorities, 10,000 insurgents availed of the chance to give themselves up, and these included certain leading Maldinovists, staff members Zverev and Paulino, Vladimir Shirovsky, who had been in charge of the movement's artillery from the outset, Markno's personal runner and the man in charge of the organization's rearguard, Dovichenko. This seems unlikely and is probably a product of misinformation for the last named individual, for instance, had according to Markno been seriously wounded and sent for treatment to Novospasovka. Taken prisoner, he was subjected to heavy pressure by the Czechists to get him to sign a declaration in favor of the regime. In the end, one could not swear by any of this it is very possible that a number of captured insurgents had, under threat of immediate execution, gone over to the regime. The Chica then attempted to press some of these to dismantle the Maknavists from within, but, as one Soviet historian stipulates, they are alleged to have been shunned or executed by their former comrades in arms. This defeatist propaganda went hand in hand with a savage crackdown on wounded insurgents and their close relatives. Once discovered, death was inevitable for them. Even so, the regime strove to improve its brand image in the eyes of the populace. Wide ranging propaganda argued that the new reforms and the Levi in kind would do away with the bones of contention existing hitherto, the peasants were no longer so brazenly plundered, and henceforth they were to be duly compensated or paid on the nail for requisitioned foodstuffs and horses. The authorities were keen to give the impression that they had mended their ways were not about to repeat past mistakes and that a return to civilian life would settle all of the problems which had been pending, provided of course that all bandits and wreckers were eliminated. In spite of all these blandishments, the insurgents pressed on with their war of partisans through April and into early May. By a quirk of fate, Budieni and Markno found themselves face to face. Cavalry had been evaluated as of little effect against the Maknavists and had been switched to the Crimea to put down the insurgency whipped up by Brova and Maslikov. Discovering that Markno was nearby, Bodieni decided to attempt to pull off a glorious coup. He rode ahead of his troops with a detachment of armored cars and horsemen who were supposed to be novices who would be blooded on this occasion. In his memoirs, Bodieni explains that he found himself cut off from his armored cars and, having to face superior forces, was obliged to make good his escape across country by car. 
He allegedly glimpsed Markno and his staff watching the engagement from atop a knoll. Markno's version of events is noticeably different. Bardieni showed himself to be a comic opera Cossack and had fled without a thought for anyone but himself in a trice. Bardieni, who had been galloping proudly at the head of his troops, turned tail and fled like a craven coward, abandoning his men to their fate. It seems that the latter were not such greenhorns nor as cowardly as their leader, for they offered ferocious resistance to the Maknavists, such as they had rarely encountered from any Red Cavalry unit. Even so, defeated they were, and this had a catastrophic impact upon the rest of the 1st Red Cavalry which fell apart, experiencing many desertions in the wake of its commander's shameful conduct and was in the end disbanded. This version of events seems a lot more likely than Bodienis, for it would be odd for the commander of the Red Cavalry, a Cossack to boot, to have departed by car and to have been able to escape his pursuers across country in this manner. Also his lack of courage was well known to other Red Army chiefs and to Stalin himself who, for that very reason, spared his life during his notorious purges. At the end of May, Markno made up his mind to strike a major blow by attempting to take Kharkov, the political capital of the Bolshevik Ukraine. He mustered several detachments and reconstituted an insurgent army of several thousand partisans, two thousand of those cavalry. Panicking, the Bolshevik leaders erected a veritable human wall of red troops around Kharkov, backed up by tanks, machine gun vehicles, and substantial artillery. The insurgents were frustrated in their intentions and were forced to revert to several detachments. During one month of incessant skirmishing, they lost 1,500 of their people, suffering their heaviest defeat at the end of June in the province of Poltava. Enemy losses were even more severe but on their side the manpower reserve was larger than on the insurgent side where new recruits could not always make up either in quantity or, above all, in quality, for the loss of battle-hardened partisans. Franz himself, who had arrived to oversee operations, was taken by surprise by a band of insurgents on June 26, his escort perished while he was wounded and he survived only due to the quality of his mount. His superiors seized upon this as a chance to remove him temporarily from operations, replacing him with Aksentivsky, a Tsarist ex-officer. The commander in charge of operations on the ground, Eidman, a great expert in minor warfare, went through a hard time. One of his adjutants was later on to write that he hovered by the telephone, very nervously awaiting the latest news of operations and, having been himself given a severe dressing down by his superiors, he, dealt harshly with his own subordinates and his staff, occasionally cursing them. The directives emanating from Kharkov did not consider his feelings and were increasingly laconic and imperative. Another brilliant Red Army chief, Blutcher, was called in. He arrived to conduct an on-the-ground inquiry to discover the real reason holding up the definitive liquidation of Markno. One Nikita Khrushchev, who was to make a sinister name for himself in Ukraine in 1936-37, earning himself the nickname of the hangman of Ukraine, won his spurs at this time fighting against Markno and other insurgents. I played my part in the bloody battle joined against the bands of Markno, Grigoriev, and Antonov. Was he perhaps among the red troops that Aksentivsky ordered on July 10 to wipe out the bands of Ivanyuk? Samaki and Luchenko, which furnished recruits for Markno's main detachment, within the space of two weeks. The fact is that the regime's whole supply policy was stymied by all these military activities and that, as soon as they learned of the approach of Maknavist, detachments, agents of the authorities scampered off as fast as they were able. The little war was at its height although the Reds tended to gain a certain advantage by defeating Antonov at Tambov as well as other insurgents in Karelia and Siberia. In mid-July, an official report still spoke of 18 bands of insurgents in the Donetsk Basin region alone, numbering 1,042 with 19 machine guns. Faced with the Maknavist detachments, which were also still active, Red commanders decided that Markno's core group had to be wiped out regardless of the cost, they fielded a special motorized detachment under the command of Germanovich with eight armoured machine gun carriers, two fortified transport lorries and two liaison motorcycles at its disposal. Having traced Markno and 200 insurgents to near Guliaipoli, the motorized detachment dismounted from its train at Sekonstantinovka on July 12 and set off in pursuit. 
One of their armored cars fell into a trap laid by the Machnavists, and its crew was captured. Markno himself boarded it and used it until it ran out of fuel, whereupon it was burned and its crew of Czechists executed. The motorized detachment's other units managed to locate Markno and chased him for five days, covering an amazing 520 kilometers in that short space of time. Short of ammunition yet again and with no weapons to avail them against the enemy armor, the insurgents sustained considerable losses and only with great difficulty did they manage to shake off the murderous machines. Towards the end of July, Markno again managed to slip out of reach of the enemy's Dutch to the great despair of Red Army chiefs who saw their careers increasingly compromised and certainly feared lest their failure might result in their being lined up before a firing squad. Eidman telegraphed the Kharkov military command on July 22 to insist upon the execution of Kojin and a certain Marisia who were reserves for Markno's core group. The following day, Franz outbid him by demanding once and for all the definitive liquidation of the Maknovskina. Markno was grieved to lose one by one his dose confederates from the early days, Mochenko, who died at the beginning of 1921, Kurilenko, Shus, Kuzhin and Zabudko during the summer of 1921. He himself was in a bad way, suffering from his many wounds and was no longer able effectively to direct operations. Even so, he pulled off two more tremendous raids into central Russia, striking out for Varanez and the Don and then decided in consultation with all the other detachments scattered throughout the country to go abroad to have his wound tended. In his absence and up until his return, Victor Belash was to assume command of the main corps group. On August 13, he left the Don along with his wife Galina Kuzmenko and about 100 cavalry, the most loyal of loyalists, survivors of the famed Black Sotnia, bound for Poland. On August 16, they crossed the Dnieper with the Reds in pursuit. On that day alone, Markno was wounded six times, albeit only slightly. On the right bank of the Dnieper, they countered several Maknavist detachments who wished him well in his recovery and that he might return to rescue them. On August 19, they unexpectedly ran into a brigade from the 7th Red Cavalry Division, with another cavalry regiment giving chase, they had no option but to swoop on the enemy encampment, smashing 600 enemy horsemen and carrying off 25 Tachankis with machine guns mounted. Recovering from their panic and realizing that they were dealing only with a handful of partisans, the entire Red Cavalry galloped off in pursuit, reinforced by an armored machine gun carrier and a rapid-firing cannon. The insurgents still defeated the 32nd Red Regiment, losing 17 men and covering 120 kilometers, the group escaped from their pursuers. On August 22, Markno sustained his 11th serious wound, a bullet penetrated the nape of his neck, exiting through his right cheek. On August 26, a final encounter pitted them against the Red Cavalry. In the course of this engagement, his last remaining confederates from the old days Ivanyuk, Petrenko and Taranoxi perished, effectively to direct operations. Even so, he pulled off two more tremendous raids into central Russia, striking out for Veronese and the Don and then decided in consultation with all the other detachments scattered throughout the country to go abroad to have his wound tended. In his absence and up until his return, Victor Belash was to assume command of the main corps group. On August 13, he left the Don along with his wife Galina Kuzmenko and about 100 cavalry, the most loyal of loyalists, survivors of the famed Black Sotnia, bound for Poland. On August 16, they crossed the Dnieper with the Reds in pursuit. On that day alone, Markno was wounded six times, albeit only slightly. On the right bank of the Dnieper, they countered several Maknavist detachments who wished him well in his recovery and that he might return to rescue them. On August 19, they unexpectedly ran into a brigade from the 7th Red Cavalry Division, with another cavalry regiment giving chase, they had no option but to swoop on the enemy encampment, smashing 600 enemy horsemen and carrying off 25 Tachankis with machine guns mounted. Recovering from their panic and realizing that they were dealing only with a handful of partisans, the entire Red Cavalry galloped off in pursuit, 37 reinforced by an armored machine gun carrier and a rapid-firing cannon. The insurgents still defeated the 32nd Red Regiment, losing 17 men and covering 120 kilometers, the group escaped from their pursuers. 
On August 22, Markno sustained his 11th serious wound. A bullet penetrated the nape of his neck, exiting through his right cheek. On August 26, a final encounter pitted them against the Red Cavalry. In the course of this engagement, his last remaining Confederates from the old days, Ivanyuk, Petrenko, and Taranoxi, perished. During this last fabulous foray, the little band of the bravest of the brave had covered over 1,000 kilometers in the space of three weeks, cutting a path for themselves amid daily fighting, through an unbroken curtain of enemy troops who had been alerted to their coming at that. Although Markno's departure did not diminish the activity of the movement's various detachments, his absence did make itself felt at the level of strategy. Belash, though he had learned from the school of hard knocks along with Nestor and himself a gifted organizer, did not have his colleagues' genius for partisan warfare and was unable to avoid his detachments being taken unawares at Znamenko one day in the autumn of 1921 by sizable enemy forces and almost entirely wiped out. The ones who got away also tried to slip across the border, and a few hundred of them were to appear later in Romania or Poland. Some emigrated even further afield, to Germany, France, Canada and elsewhere. The wounded Belash was captured and hauled off to the Kharkov Chika where he was to write his memoirs of his command before being tried and shot in 1923 along with some other Machnavists, which just goes to show that the movement was still extant. Lebeds, who had been officially commissioned at the end of 1921 to write an initial study of the Makhnovskina, notes that 30 commanders and 2,443 Makhnovist insurgents were to surrender during the autumn of 1921. Some of them allegedly even asked that their services against the whites be acknowledged, Lebeds adds, half in amusement, half in indignation. We may query the veracity of these figures, for a more recent official source records the elimination of a Machnavist band in the region of Poltava in 1922 and the dismantling of a clandestine Machnavist organization in 1923, as well as the existence of 18 Ukrainian insurgent bands in 1924, only three of which were of Petlierist sympathies. Thus it is possible that Machnavist bands may have survived as late as 1924 and beyond, for during the Second World War, some Ukrainian partisan groups were to hoist the black flag again and fight against Nazi and Stalinist alike. Perhaps one day when the regime's archives are more readily accessible, we may learn more. Eidmann, Markno's chief adversary during 1921, was to concede that the movement had not been beaten militarily but politically, quote, it was not our military successes against anti-Soviet movements but rather the strengthening of the union between the proletariat and the underlying mass of the peasantry that ensured that Markno, Antonov, the Siberian insurgents and the Kronstadt uprising failed to live up to the hopes of the class enemies of the Soviet state. End quote. 26. The Road of Exile, Bucharest, Warsaw, Danzig, Berlin Although formal diplomatic relations between them did not exist, Moscow contacted the Romanian Foreign Affairs Ministry by radio. On September 17, Shikarin, the one-time Tsarist now Bolshevik and People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs in Soviet Russia, and Rakovsky, the chairman of the Ukrainian Council of People's Commissars, sent a joint communique to the Romanian Premier, General Avaresco, to sue for Markno's return, quote, on August 28 the famous bandit Markno crossed the Bessarabian border near Monasterivka along with his band of supporters, seeking refuge on territory which is de facto under the authority of Romania. This bandit, leader of bands of brigands, has committed numerous crimes on the territory of Russia and Ukraine, burning and looting villages, butchering the peaceable population and extorting its property from it through torture. This is why the Russian and Ukrainian governments hereby make a formal request of the Romanian government that it hand over the leader of the brigand gangs mentioned above, along with his accomplices, as common criminals. The People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the RSFSR. End quote. The Leninists had no hesitation in making such diplomatic overtures to the bourgeois authorities of the Kingdom of Romania, though held up to public obloquy, these same authorities now proved very useful for the stifling of the fear which the Leninists felt of Markno. He had to be annihilated and any means would suffice. Of course Markno could only be referred to as a common criminal, 
Four, had he been acknowledged as a political opponent any application for his extradition would have been doomed to failure. Let us stress that until quite recently most of the Bolshevik themselves had been emigres subject to extradition proceedings, now they were in power and the methods that they had deemed worthy of condemnation were thoroughly respectable. However, their first overture met with rejection on the part of Avaresco whose response was passed on to them on September 27, 1921, quote, I did indeed receive your radio communication of the 17th dynasty, and I cannot agree either with its form or with its content. If criminals really have sought refuge on the territory of the Kingdom of Romania, your judicial authorities can apply for the return of these individuals and although no convention on this subject exists between our countries, the Romanian government might yet, on a basis of reciprocity, accede to such an application. But to that end one would have to act in accordance with the norms of international law, i.e., an arrest warrant would have to be forwarded, emanating from the competent judicial institution and detailing those articles of the penal code applicable to the offenders. Furthermore, the precise particulars of these offenders would have to be given. Given that the death penalty does not exist in Romania, you would, in addition, have to offer a formal assurance that the death penalty would not be applied against extradited individuals. Once those conditions have been met, the Romanian government will look into the case of the bandit Markno and his accomplices and will determine whether there are grounds for acceding to the request for their extradition. End quote. This bourgeois general was not only pointing out that the extradition request had not been very specific, but also reminding the applicants of the conventions of international law and stressing the absence of capital punishment in his own country. In short, he gave them a lesson in good manners. Shishirin, put firmly in his place, made a further overture on October 22, quote, The reply given on September 27 by the head of your government, General Avaresco, to our request that the bandit Markno and the accomplices who accompanied him be surrendered to us, is rather a statement of juridical principles than a communications of a practical nature and offers us no clarification of the real status of this affair. That statement contains no confirmation, even, of Markno's presence in Romania. As soon as the requisite materials have been collated and the legal forms required by you have been completed, the results will be communicated to you. However, the Russian and Ukrainian governments consider that formal procedures are only of secondary importance and that these pale into absolute insignificance before the fact that a gang of criminals that has long terrorized the peaceable population of Ukraine has found a refuge under the wing of the Romanian government. The legal pedantry displayed in this case by the Romanian government has not always been a feature of its conduct, even when more important matters concerning, say, treaty observance, have been at issue. End quote. The Romanians were intrigued by this unaccustomed obstinacy. Their foreign affairs minister, Teca Ionesco, made a soothing reply in view of what was at stake, the disputed treaty awarding Bessarabia to Romania, by quite simply asking for particulars about Markno, for he genuinely did not know if this individual was indeed among those interned by the Romanian authorities, and he announced that inquiries had been set in motion to trace him. In spite of everything and without setting his face against the possibility of extradition, he hoped that it might proceed according to the legalities. Sniffing a concession, Shishirin seized the chance to try to force a decision by somehow making the surrender of Markno a condition of normalization between the two countries, quote, We await your confirmation of Markno's arrival in Romania in order to be able to undertake further steps of a juridical nature regarding this matter. Through the good offices of their representatives in Warsaw, the Russian and Ukrainian governments stand ready to furnish the Romanian government with documentary and photographic evidence. It was only legalistic nitpicking by the Romanian government in the matter of the bandit Markno which we have raised, that obliged us to embark upon an evaluation of Romania's general approach to its international commitments and to point out, among others, Romania's breach of the Treaty of March 9, 1918, under which the Romanian government was required to evacuate Bessarabia within two months. The Russian and Ukrainian governments will thus consider that the attitude assumed by the Romanian government vis a vis this matter will be key to relations between Russia and Ukraine on the one hand and Romania on the other. In your reply of October 29th, we do not see adequate grounds for changing our viewpoint, as set out in our earlier communications, and we are still of the same opinion, 
that the attitude you have adopted with regard to Markno is distinguished by such partiality as to make it impossible to discern if your relations with Russia and Ukraine were in reality such as you describe them. End quote. The extreme importance with which Markno was invested by Moscow, which went so far as to make his extradition contingent upon implicit acceptance of a controversial treaty, placed the Romanians in a dilemma. They had to devise some honorable solution, in terms of their interests recognition of the disputed treaty and also of the conventions of international law to which they had just alluded, and that without loss of face. So they took advice, with regard to this famous Markno, from the Ukrainian nationalists, Petlyurists. Early as September 2, the nationalists had been contacted by the anarchist from Ukraine who asked them to place his detachment under their protection and to make it possible for him to speak with Petlura's authorized agents in Bucharest so as to examine the possibility of some concerted action aimed at delivering Ukraine from its enemies. Markno, his wife and two confederates had been invited to travel up to the Romanian capital for treatment and for talks with Petlyurist diplomatic representatives. The Petlyurist negotiator kept notes of these conversations. These notes record that Markno stated that it had been his intention to enter Poland, there to seek out Petlyura's main headquarters, but before he could reach the frontier, one of the outriders from his detachment had fallen into enemy hands along with the addresses of the stopovers necessary before crossing the frontier, and so he had decided to veer in the direction of Romania instead. The Petlyurist agent noted that Markno and his companions were very circumspect, do not speak openly of their strength, plans and intentions, nor above all of the reasons which forced them to leave Ukraine. He nonetheless managed to get them to tell why they sought an alliance with Petlyura. They declared that they had made for the territory of the Don Cossacks and then for Central Russia Voronez, Tambov and Kursk in order to assess for themselves the strength of the anti-Bolshevik insurgent movements operating there and had evaluated their limitations and relative powerlessness against the many and mighty special units of the Red Army. From which they had allegedly deduced that it was only in Ukraine that the insurgent movement stood definite chances of expansion and of throwing out the Muscovites' invaders, and so they had come to the conclusion that joint action with the Petlyurists was called for. In fact, Markno and his companions were laying a false trail, they had never collaborated with the Petlyurists and were well aware that a huge gulf divided them. However, their position could not have been more delicate, they realized that of the Romanians they could expect nothing, that they were at the mercy of an extradition order and that their only hope lay in some agreement with Petlura, even if only a circumstantial and temporary one. Only at that price could they avoid being handed over to Moscow, so they accepted they would have to recognize the authority of the Ukrainian nationalist government in exile although hitherto, as they told their interlocutor, they had reckoned social slogans a better device for the fight against the Bolsheviks. They went on to say that they reckoned the Ukrainian nationalist government which enjoyed the support of Poland and Romania and could call upon a well-equipped army could act effectively against the Red Army by opening up an external front while they could carry on with their partisan warfare in the interior. In this case, they seemed convinced of the prospects of their insurgent movement which accurately reflected the aspirations of Ukraine's population. But their Petlyurist interlocutor was not completely taken in by their sudden conversion, in his report he pointed out the necessity of his government's completely liquidating this movement and its organization before absorbing it into the Ukrainian nationalist movement. For neither side was the outcome of these talks very conclusive. Meanwhile, Shishirin's assistant, Kara Khan, traveled specially to Warsaw to meet with Romania's diplomatic representative there and to press the demand that Markno be extradited. But the Romanians by now knew what was what in this use of the label bandit to designate a political opponent. Moreover, they did not want to alienate the Ukrainian peasantry by handing Markno over, for they knew that a future armed conflict with the Bolsheviks could not be ruled out and should that come about their attitude towards Markno, if they failed to extradite him, might work in their favor. In view of the deadlock situation, Markno and some of his companions decided to carry on regardless, they escaped from their internment camp and tried to cross the Polish border. They were picked up by Polish border guards who turned them back into Romania, whereupon the Romanian border guards sent them back to Poland. This game dragged on all night until they were at last accepted into Poland and shipped on April 12, 1922 to an internment camp.
The moment he arrived in Poland, Markno besieged all of the country's official agencies, the Foreign Affairs Ministry, the Polish Socialist Party, Pilsudski himself, and others, for permission to move on to Czechoslovakia or Germany. In all he wrote off a dozen letters to this effect without result. On June 30, 1922, a Soviet repatriation commission visited the Skolkovo camp where he was an internee and for Maknovists, desperate or bewildered by their predicament, asked Markno to intercede with the Poles and Soviets on their behalf in order to have them return to Ukraine. The ramp commander turned down this request and thereafter had Markno and his companions closely guarded. On July 18, Galina Kuzmenko, Markno's wife, traveled to Warsaw herself to make overtures to the ministries concerned. She was cold-shouldered, a high-ranking official at the Home Affairs Ministry, one Jelikowski, abruptly snapped, wait until your case comes up, then we shall see what to do with you. We cannot let you go unpunished, for Polish citizens have suffered from your handiwork in Russia. For his part, Pilsudski replied on August 17 that he had passed your request to the Interior Ministry. None of these moves came to anything, for the Polish secret police, the defensive had plans of its own for Markno. First it assigned him to a major Sarbson to be persuaded to stay in Poland, and then it was on to Lieutenant Blonski who said to him, why leave Poland? The Czechs are cowards, and they will hand you over to Moscow. As for Germany, the Bolsheviks are quite at home there. Stay with us, just adopt Petlura's platform, and all will be well for you. The Poles wished to make use of him in conducting destabilizing exercises in Ukraine, but Markno bluntly refused all these blandishments. Not that Moscow had remained idle, having learned that Markno was an internee, it again approached the Poles with an extradition request, and then, seeing how slim the chances of its success were, targeted the Ukrainian libertarian for a provocation. It commissioned one of its agents, Y.A. Krasnovolsky, who had been keeping tabs on the Maknavists since Romania, to suggest to Markno that he lead an insurgent movement in eastern Galicia, a region populated by Ukrainians but arbitrarily awarded to Poland under the Treaty of Riga. Markno responded that he could not enter into any serious talks with the Bolsheviks until such time as all anarchists and Maknavists imprisoned in Russia had been freed. Not that Markno's answer unduly surprised the Bolsheviks, their object was merely to compromise him in Polish eyes so that the latter would expel him to Russia. There they themselves would see that he got a hospitable welcome in the Chica's dungeons. They arranged for their agent to fake an escape attempt on the night August 2-3, 1922 and for him to be caught in possession of documents which, he would spontaneously confess, had been addressed by Markno to the Soviet diplomatic representative in Warsaw, Maximovich. These documents were encoded using the same code that Markno had employed in other letters sent to Maknovists interned in Poland and Romania. In addition, they bore Markno's signature but not in his hand. No matter, for Krasnowolski took it upon himself to hand over the key to the code, there were plans for the insurrection in Galicia, apparently forged for that purpose by the Bolsheviks. Markno was promptly picked up by the defensive, as were his wife and two of his closest comrades, Kumara and Shak Domoshenko. All four were switched to the Paviak political prison in Warsaw and accused of subversive activities against the Polish state. An examining magistrate by the name of Luxembourg looked into the affair. They were to remain in prison for 13 months before being brought to trial. Meanwhile, Galina, Markno's wife, gave birth on October 30 to a little girl called Lucy. Only once during his long months in custody was Nesta able to see them together. An intense press and public opinion campaign was waged in libertarian circles worldwide and especially wherever the Russian anarchist diaspora had a presence, the United States, Canada, Argentina, France and Germany. Already, thanks to the intervention of some anarcho-syndicalists during the Profintons Moscow Congress, ten Russian anarchists, Volein among them, had been deported from Russia. For his part, Arshinov and his wife had managed to cross the border clandestinely and reach Berlin, where he hurriedly brought out a history of the Maknavist movement in Russian, followed up soon by German, French and Spanish editions. The anarchist press worldwide carried a fair number of articles on Markno and his role in the Russian Revolution. 
The Russian Libertarian Communist Weekly, Amerikansky Izvestia, published in New York, opened a subscription to help jailed Maknavists. By November 29, 1922, $1,476 had been raised. An attempt was made to pass these funds to Maknavists jailed or interned in Poland and Romania. However, some of these Maknavists, unable to bear their living conditions, applied for repatriation even at the risk of being shot or, at best, deported to Siberia. As for Markno, he had, so to speak, been vaccinated against imprisonment by his previous ten years of prison and penal servitude before 1917. He busied himself with drafting his memoirs which he had passed on to Arshinov, they were also published in the Berlin Review of the Russian Anarchist Exile Group, The Russian Messenger, in Russian, of course. He also penned letters to émigré Don Cossacks and an open letter to the Bolshevik Communist Party of Ukraine and Russia. All were intercepted and seized by the examining magistrate. Just to be on the safe side, he learned Esperanto and studied German. However, harsh conditions in custody in the Mokoto prison led to a recurrence of the tuberculosis which had been gnawing at him for about 10 years. As the trial scheduled for November 17, 1923 approached, the campaign by anarchists worldwide was stepped up, libertarian papers carried a lengthy appeal against the crime being hatched by the Polish and Russian governments, signed by German libertarian communist organizations, the French anarchist federation and anarchist personalities Rudolf Rocker, Sebastian Faure, Louis Lacoigne, Alexander Bruckman, Emma Goldman and others. The Polish libertarian, Kasimir Tesla, who had been in Ukraine with the Maknavists and who had just been deported from Russia by the Bolsheviks was frantically active sounding the alarm. The Warsaw Anarchist Youth Group also issued an urgent appeal, quote. Comrades. Demonstrate outside the Polish embassies in your countries. Send them your protest resolutions. Have recourse to the most extreme measures. The revolutionary proletariat must not allow the oppression in Polish jails of brave fighters for freedom and anarchy. Only vigorous intervention by the toilers can save Markno. End quote. In fact everyone's fear was that Markno would be extradited to Russia where one could easily guess the fate that awaited him. Though extreme measures advocated by the young Polish anarchists did not fail to make an impact upon Polish opinion which had at last seen sense and was swinging now in favor of the accused. And Bulgarian anarchists openly threatened to dynamite Polish embassies and establishments worldwide. In these conditions, the trial went favorably for Markno and his co-accused. It transpired that Krasnowolski had also been manipulated by the Polish secret police, the defensive, and that the prosecution had insufficient evidence. Markno spoke brilliantly and demolished the allegations, the court was obliged to acquit the accused. Freed nearly a month after his acquittal, Markno was given permission to stay in the Potnin region and then to leave for Danzig, today Gdansk, which at that time was a free city, albeit under Prussian administration. The stalking by Bolshevik agents, though, did not end. They contacted Markno, passing themselves off as Russian foreign trade representatives, and suggested that he return to Russia with solemn guarantees from the Soviet embassy in Germany regarding his safety and that of any who might accompany him. Markno's answer to them was that he could make no decision without first meeting his friends Volein, Arshinov, Rocker and Bruckman who were in Berlin. Whereupon it was put to him that he should go there, he agreed, thinking that this might get him to Berlin where he would be more secure. Along with a trusted friend, he set off by car along with two Bolshevik agents, shortly before they crossed the German border, his friend informed the driver that, once in Berlin, Markno would speak only to Krestinsky, the Soviet ambassador and then only in the home of a private citizen rather than on any premises under Soviet authority. Seeing their kidnap scheme fall apart, the Bolshevik agents backtracked, only to denounce Markno a few days later to the Prussian police. To begin with he was imprisoned, then, when his health deteriorated, he was transferred under guard to a hospital. Thanks to some German anarchists, he soon escaped from there and was preoccupied with reaching Berlin, a city that, on one hand, offered greater safety and where, on the other, lots of libertarians lived. It was at this juncture that there was an incident with Volein who, on November 24, 1924, 
had received $75 from Carpark, an Ukrainian anarchist in the United States, to secure a phony passport for Markno. Not a practical sort, and with a wife and five young children to support, Volein had spent the money on his personal needs, thus he was unable to secure the necessary papers. In his place he sent a German anarchist individualist from Hamburg who was on the run from the law. And also in need of reaching Berlin, this very queer go-between had 300 gold marks on him but was imprudent enough to hand them over in advance to the seamen who had undertaken to ferry them by launch across the Briny to the port of Stettin, in German territory. The seamen wasted no time in squandering the sum on drink the following night, then refused CM the promised passage. Exasperated by such delays and having now been clandestinely in Danzig for 40 days, Markno resolved to cross into Germany on foot along with a German comrade, bringing with them the nun to a street go-between. The plan succeeded, and Markno at last found himself in Berlin among his Russian anarchist colleagues and other anarchists there, people like Rudolf Rocker, Hugo Fedulai, and Alexander Bookman. Even there he was scarcely at ease, for the Germans could have brought him to book for his activities against them in Ukraine during 1918. David Polyakov, a Russian libertarian living in France, made the journey to Berlin and in April 1925 brought Nestor Markno back with him to Paris where, in theory, the Ukrainian leader no longer had anything to fear from officialdom. 27. Exile in Paris, 1925-1934 So, at the end of a long and eventful odyssey, Markno arrived in the City of Lights. He expected to find there a little ease and that he would be beyond the reach of his many enemies, white Russians, Bolsheviks, Ukrainian nationalists and other lesser species. The better to cover his tracks, he had had a passport issued to him in Berlin in the assumed name of Mikhnienko. His wife and daughter had gone on ahead to Paris, some comrades having seen to their direct transfer from Poland. Carried after arrival on September 18, 1924, they had at first been denied entry on December 27, probably because their papers were not in order, and then were given permission to settle in France after the socialist parliamentarian Paul for had intervened on their behalf. Back together again, the little family received a gracious welcome from May Picaret who always had a good soupe simmering or a cafetier ready to pour for foreign comrades in dire straits. She arranged temporary lodgings for them and took Markno off to receive the medical care he needed from some friendly physicians. Although the language barrier made communication difficult, the French anarchists made Markno warmly welcome, over the preceding two or three years indeed they had become conversant with the Maknavist insurgent movement, thanks to Arshinov's book and to essays and articles carried by the libertarian press. To begin with, Markno and his loved ones were taken in by some Russian friends at St. Cloud, then spent two months as George's Friquet's guests in Romanville until Fuchs, a French libertarian, found them a little apartment at 18 Rue Jari in Vincennes, into which they moved on June 21, 1926. For a time Nesta found work as a smelter's assistant at a foundry at number 6 on the same street before joining Renault as a lathe operator, but the state of his health obliged him to give up both these jobs. In fact, splinters from a dum-dum bullet were still lodged in the bones of his right ankle, the wound had ulcerated and gave him atrocious pain, so much so that he could not bear to stand upright, and walked with a pronounced limp. An operation in 1928 failed to cure his ankle and amputation was averted only by his steadfast refusal. His wife worked for a time in a shoe factory in Paris before spending a period in a small grocery store keeping the pot boiling, in both senses of the phrase. A well-to-do libertarian illegalist undertook to pay Nestor a small allowance to enable him to write his memoirs. He set about this task, and the first volume appeared in a French translation by Waletsky in 1927. It concerned the year 1917 in Ukraine, and was to appear in Russian two years later. As the cover price was quite high, the book sold poorly and this jeopardized publication of two follow-up volumes which were ready for publication by 1929 but which were to appear only after Markno's death. Nestor's health was further assailed by a recurrence of his tuberculosis and the pains from his many wounds. 
The physician and libertarian feminist Lucille Pelletty who was unstinting in her treatment of him was later to say that his body was literally encased in scar tissue. For a time his wife was obliged to move out lest their little girl be infected by her father's tuberculosis. Several Macnavists had managed to slip through the Chica's net and, crossing the frontiers, came to settle near Nesta. One of them, Vasily Zayats, found a life of exile so distasteful that he took his own life in despair on October 1, 1926 by shooting himself in the head, in Markno's very room. Fortunately Pyotr Arshinov, his old colleague, arrived to move into the same building along with his own wife and son. Together they were at last to make a reality of a scheme they had cherished some 15 years previously while in the cells of the Buterki prison, by bringing out a Russian-language libertarian communist. Theoretical Review, Dialo Truda. This review, of a very high caliber, appeared bi-monthly from 1925. In it Markno had an article in virtually every issue over a period of more than three years. The thought processes of the magazine's leading lights crystallized in the drafting of a plan for an organizational platform for the anarchist movement in which they sought to draw lessons from anarchism's experiences in the Russian Revolution, its weaknesses they credited to what they argued was the congenital defect of the traditional libertarian current, namely incoherence and lack of cohesion. For their part they proposed to work towards a precise redefinition of the underlying principles of libertarian communism and to arrive at a practical structuring of the movement subscribing to those principles into a collective operating in close liaison with the toiling masses. This scheme was to be the focus of debate in the libertarian circles of the day throughout the world. The debate among the Russian anarchists was turbulent as detractors, spearheaded by Volein, saw the whole scheme as an attempt to Bolshevize anarchism. This charge was rather silly when leveled against men who had engaged in armed struggle against the Leninists and paid very dearly for the experience in physical and psychological terms. A meeting was held to discuss this draft platform at the Les Roses Cinema in El Hay Les Roses on March 20, 1927. The premises were raided by the police who had been panicked. On the basis of inside information, by this gathering which drew Russian, Polish, Bulgarian, Italian, and even Chinese anarchists together. French cops rounded up the participants in the belief that perhaps they had stumbled upon some vast worldwide conspiracy. Caught up in the dragnet, Markno was sentenced to be deported from France on May 16th lobbying of the Prefect of Police, Chiap, by the anti-militarist anarchist activist Louis Lecoin, who had good reason to know him, having been arrested by him numerous times ensured that the deportation order was postponed for an initial period of three months by way of a trial period, from October 19, 1937, conditional upon Markno's observing absolute political neutrality. Henri Selia, the councillor general and socialist mayor of Cheresens, also stepped in and stood a guarantor for Markno. At this point, a dramatic incident focused public attention on Nesta. On May 25, 1926, the Ukrainian national leader Putlura, also a refugee in Paris, was assassinated by Samuel Schwarzbard, a Jewish-Ukrainian anarchist and an acquaintance of Markno's to boot. Schwarzbard had lost numerous family members in anti-Jewish pogroms in Ukraine and, holding Putlura to blame for these massacres, had gunned him down with his revolver. According to what the Bulgarian anarchist Kiro Radev has told us, Schwarzbart had called on Markno the evening before the assassination to consult with him and let him in on his plans. Nesta had tried to talk him out of it, telling him that anarchists fought against principles and not personalities and that, as far as he was aware, Putlura could not be held accountable for the pogroms in that he had always condemned them and had numbered Jews among his supporters and indeed even in his government, Arnold Margolin, an Ukrainian of Jewish origins had even led the Ukrainian nationalist mission attached to the Entente. All to no avail, for Schwarzbard went ahead with his scheme. We might point out that Schwarzbard's lawyers, Henry Torres and Bernard Lacake, made a special trip to Russia to collect documentary evidence authenticating Putlera's responsibility in the matter of the pogroms, but for all their eagerness to confound a political enemy, the Bolsheviks were unable to supply such evidence. Capitalizing upon all this sensationalism, a rather unscrupulous author, Joseph Kessel, himself a Jew of Russian extraction, published a far-fetched novel entitled Markno and his Jewess, 
wherein Markno was depicted as an abominably cruel degenerate ogre and bloodthirsty butcher nonetheless touched by the beauty and love of a young Jewish woman, even to the extent of leading her up the aisle and thereby achieving his life's ambition, to marry her in church and thus convert her to the orthodox faith. One would be hard-pressed to come up with anything more dismal and shabby, but the hack Kessel, desperate to attract attention to his pathetic self, claimed that his story was true or at least, as true as the documentation upon which it was based and that the novelist, whatever his subject matter, be it imaginary or historical, reserves the right of construction, composition and direction over his story, sick. The documentation to which Kessel was referring was a tale published in 1922 by a white officer by the name of Jurasimenko who was rather suspect convicted of espionage on behalf of the Bolsheviks in Prague in 1924 and subsequently deported from Czechoslovakia. Published in a white Russian magazine in Berlin, this tale had probably been intended to discredit Markno who was interned in Poland at the time and to speed his extradition. Gerasimenko argued in it that Markno had gone over to Rangel and placed the following words in his mouth, in Russia there is room only for monarchy or anarchy. Informed of the storm of indignation provoked by his novel, Kessel corrected his aim slightly in the second edition of his text in 1927. He now wrote in his foreword that he had invented the conflict that seemed to him most likely to throw into relief a figure and an atmosphere with which he was conversant. He also vouchsafed the information that he had discovered that Markno was living in Paris and had allegedly even uttered threats against me for having dared to portray him so penetratingly and, in his estimation, falsely. Thus Kessel had supposedly displayed tremendous courage in daring to portray penetratingly another publicity coup that was not allowed to go unexploited whereas Markno, hands tied by a threat of deportation, was denied the same facilities for expressing his opinions. As for his text, Kessel pressed on regardless and without amending as much as a single comma of it, hinting at a further source, one Arbatov, who describes in a Russian monarchist paper the alleged exploits of Markno, in much the same favours as Gerasimenko. The danger for Markno was that Kessel might so mislead his ill-informed readership that in the emotional climate then prevailing among European Jews, some hothead, keen to imitate Schwarzbard, might select Markno as a target. In the face of such a thinly disguised incitement to murder, Markno was thus compelled to speak up several times on the subject of pogroms, in Le Libertaire, he did not enjoy Kessel's access to the big circulation newspapers, he issued an appeal to the Jews of all lands to quote him specific instances of pogroms that could be laid at the door of the Machnavist movement. All in vain, for the very good reason that there had been none, as we shall establish anon. On June 24, 1927, the Club du Faubourg organized a debate on the issue in the Hall of the Learned Societies. Markno spoke on the facts about the pogroms in Ukraine and explained how he personally had protected Jews in the region under his influence. Other Russian and Ukrainian libertarians of Jewish extraction backed him up on this point and called Kessel to order, the only excuse that Kessel, who was there, could come up with was, the novelist's right to fictionalize. And there the Kessel affair stopped, the murder of Putlura and the controversy aroused concerning Markno suited Moscow down to the ground, she had never asked so much of the country which had taken in her sworn enemies. On July 21, 1927, Markno attended the banquet given by the Anarchist International Defense Committee to celebrate the release of the Spanish anarchists Francisco Ascaso, Deruti and Jova. He delivered a short address in Russian which was simultaneously translated for the benefit of all present. As the dinner ended, a meeting was arranged with Ascaso and Deruti. The meeting took place in Nesta's cramped quarters and went on for several hours in the presence of Jacques Dubinsky a bilingual Russian libertarian who acted as interpreter whenever Markno was unable to make himself understood in his poor French. The Spanish anarchists hailed Markno as the symbol of all revolutionaries who have fought for the realization of anarchist ideas in Russia, and they paid tribute to Ukraine's rich experience. Markno replied that by his reckoning conditions for a revolution of robust anarchist content would be better in Spain than in Russia, for Spain had a proletariat and peasantry with revolutionary traditions, the political maturity of which is evident from their every reaction. May your revolution come in time to grant me the satisfaction of seeing alive an anarchism informed by the Russian experience. 
In Spain you have a sense of organization that we in Russia lacked, for it is organization that ensures the thoroughgoing success of any revolution. He hoped that they would learn from the Machnavist experience which he spent several hours expounding to his Spanish colleagues. As he took his leave of them, he told them with an optimistic grin, Mark Nohas, never shirk to fight, if I am still alive when you begin yours, I will be with you. By this time Mark Noh was in fact ailing both psychologically and physically. He was suffering from his wounds and an aggravation of his tuberculosis. Moreover, the controversy regarding the draft platform degenerated and relations with its adversaries, especially Volein, their spokesmen, were strained. This is an important point and worth going into, for Volein was a prominent personality in the Russian anarchist movement and had also been chairman of the Machnavists' military revolutionary Soviet for over two months in the autumn of 1919. He had been persecuted by the Bolsheviks and arrested in November 1920, following the breakdown of Moscow's alliance with Markno. At the 1921 Profintern Congress, the French and Spanish anarcho-syndicalist delegates had spoken up on his behalf, after some difficulties, Lenin and Trotsky deigned to deport him along with nine other leading anarchists as well as their families. Then Volein spent some time in Berlin before moving on to settle in Paris, where he had lived prior to 1914. He was very active in publicizing the facts about the Leninist regime either on speaking tours or by drafting articles for the libertarian press worldwide, knowing several foreign languages as he did. He was a superb propagandist and above all an exceptional public speaker. During the Russian Revolution, he delivered upwards of a hundred talks. As a result, he felt a certain superiority over practical types and to some extent stood guard over the purity of libertarian principles although he himself was quite a newcomer to the libertarian persuasion having been won over while an emigre before 1914 on contact with Kropotkin. Thus he was violently opposed to the organizational platform scheme of Diallo Truda, and supported instead the anarchist synthesis advocated by Sebastian Faure, a sort of symbiosis of the three basic strands of anarchist doctrine, the individualist, the syndicalist and the communist. Whereas Markno, Arshinov, and colleagues held that libertarian communism was built upon an all-embracing notion of class struggle, incorporating syndicalism as a means and respect for the rights of the individual as a goal. The two views were different while not mutually exclusive and, had there not been the context of the failure of the Russian Revolution and the life of exile, perhaps the debate might not have been so embittered and passionate. Relations between the two men, Markno and Volein, were embittered when Kubanin's official book on the Maknovskina came out in 1927 and referred to the minutes of Volein's interrogation by a Czechist examining magistrate when he had been captured in December 1919. There, Volein complained of the abuses of the Maknovist intelligence service, which he almost placed on a par with the Chika, and spoke of his clashes with Markno on this point. Markno made his reply to Kubanin shortly after in a pamphlet and, in passing, dealt with the case of Volein. He explained how Volein had frequently turned to the Machnavist counterespionage service. Thus, at the time of his capture by the Red Army, on his way to Krivoy Rog to give a talk there he had been in the company of the leader and the finest men from the service. Then again, he had no cause to complain, for he himself took initiatives. For instance, it had been his own decision to seek Markno out along with a Bolshevik leader by the name of Orlov, during the occupation of Ekaterinoslav in order to secure for him a warrant for search and seizure of the goods of a Russian nobleman who had fed to join Denikin, with the benefits going to the region's Bolshevik committee. Markno had categorically refused to oblige and had scolded Volein for his political inconsistency. Things might have been left there, and the dirty linen could have been washed among intimates only. But there was no knowing what was eating at Volein and what induced him to publish a little pamphlet called Explanations over a year later, in which he reproached Markno for wanting to settle personal scores with him, thereby revealing certain character traits, to wit, a hostility towards intellectuals, his suspicions, and the mischievousness of his nature. He refuted everything that Kubanin depicted him as having said, gave an account of his capture and announced that at the time he had not been bothered about knowing whether or not his companions were members of the Maknavis counterintelligence service in that he had been sick with typhus.
He could no longer recall the episode with the Bolshevik Orlov either and hinted that Markno had mixed him up with somebody else, but nonetheless acknowledged that it had fallen to him to act in conjunction with Bolsheviks who had used him as an intermediary to deal with Markno and, anyway, dismissed this as being of secondary importance. Finally he recorded his assistance to Markno when Markno was caught in the rat trap in Danzig in 1925 and closed by stating that all that remained of Markno's reproaches of him was, a dark cloud of mischief and calumny. Whom and what can that all serve? According to Mark Mrachny, one of his own anarchist comrades from Ukraine, Volin was regarded as a shallow mind, but here he demonstrated singular inconsistency by pouring oil onto the fire and then asking what purpose it all served. In any case, Markno's answer came the following month, also in the form of a pamphlet, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Markno explained how Volin had been specially escorted by Comrade Golik and about 20 of the most reliable members of the Maknavist Counterintelligence Service and how it was because of his own stupidity that Volin had not only been captured but also brought about the capture of several of those with him. Apropos of his joint venture with Orlov, no, he wasn't mixing him up with somebody else, Volin was indeed the one. As for his, Markno's, alleged hostility towards intellectuals, he had always had high regard for genuine intellectuals and hates only those who are blackguards and whom he can readily distinguish from the former. Moreover, he had no scores to settle with Volein, for he could not do that with a comrade, which Volein had ceased to be in his view ever since he had discovered his true personality in the emigration. Finally what had him at odds with Volein was not personal considerations, although Volein's conduct had been most blameworthy at the time of his escape from the Danzig rat trap and was nothing to brag about, but rather the faucets and cowardice of the man who had for a long time been chairman of the Maknavist Soviet. Henceforth he swore undying enmity towards Volein who paid him back in his posthumous work The Unknown Revolution by ascribing serious personal shortcomings to him, as we shall see in the next chapter. The squabble can be put down to the poisonous atmosphere created by the controversy surrounding the organizational platform of Diallo Truda, or indeed to the difficulties of emigre life and the social differences, which it aggravated, between Volein the intellectual and ideologue, and the peasant worker activist Markno. Indeed one might speak of a dash of personalities or of misplaced sensitivities and with good reason, but there was something else as well. Markno was very well aware that, through him, it was the whole movement and the memory of his dead comrades who were under fire from all sides, as much from those who should have been closest to them as from their avowed enemies. This was the reason why he could brook no slight against himself or his comrades in arms, of whom Volein seemed to be dismissive, forgetting that it had been they who had been in charge of watching over him, for which duty they had paid a high price. Likewise he could not accept Volein's being so offhand about his own responsibilities when it was Markno himself who had insisted upon his being appointed chairman of the insurgents military revolutionary Soviet in October 1919, something which he obviously would not have done, he now claimed, had he been aware of Volein's true character as it had been revealed to him since his emigration. Viewed in this light, defense against all manner of attacks and criticisms became something of an obsession with him, as the gossip persisted it was up to him to explain or justify himself. Let us consider two instances which illustrate his solicitude on the part of friends, on the first occasion he attended a commemoration at the Hall of the Masonic Grand Orient in the Rue Cadet in Paris, to mark the tenth anniversary of the October Revolution, under the auspices of some Russian fellow travellers of the Bolsheviks. Apparently he went along to heckle, Yet there were some who argued that he had been invited by the Soviet embassy and was going to join the Communist Party. He found it necessary to rebut this rather cavalier interpretation of things through the columns of Diallo Truda. On the second occasion, he published an article on Soviet power, its present and its future, in the magazine Borba, the struggle run by the Ukrainian Bolshevik defector Grigory Besidovsky, provoking criticism from Arshinov and the Russian anarchists in Chicago. He found it necessary to clarify things by saying that he was big and ugly enough to know what he should or should not do and needed no wet nurse, I grew out of that decades ago and acted as one myself for many a long year towards others, Arshinov included. In addition, relations between these two cooled because Arshinov tended to personalize unduly for Markno's taste the debate on the platform which they had drafted together. All the more so, 
in that Kubanin and some Soviet authors, as well as friendly anarchists, had a tendency to depict both Arshinov and Volin as Markno spiritual mentors. In some cases this was an effort to play down the peasants' role in the movement by making them subordinate to workers or intellectuals, and in other cases the assumption was that Markno, being virtually illiterate could not possibly have thought up, much less drafted his numerous written works without the aid of a ghostwriter. This last assertion was formally refuted for us by Ida Met, who, between 1925 and 1927, served as the secretary typist of Markno and the Diello Truda group. According to her, Markno was very fussy about form, and for every occasion when he accepted suggestion and advice, there was another when he reserved the right to decide upon the merest comma in his writings. Later, Marie Goldsmith, an old Kropotkinist, served him in the same capacity before she committed suicide in 1933. So let us look at Markno's literary output during his first years in exile. Over the years 1926 to 1929, he published a whole series of articles and texts of major significance both historically and theoretically. If one also takes account of the writing of the three volumes of his memoirs, one might regard these years as highly prolific, although widely underestimated, or quite simply unknown, which is certainly unmerited. Markno advanced a number of specific details about the movement, he ironically and categorically denied that the Maknovskina may have flown the black pirate flag skull and crossbones, as some claimed to be able to make out in certain photographs of the Maknovskina. Regarding the charges of antisemitism, he supplied rebuttals several times, he also furnished details about the character and meaning of the Maknovist movement, etc. He especially did so in his essential answer to Kubanin, with its evocative title, the Maknovskina and its erstwhile allies, the Bolsheviks. His theoretical contributions to libertarian communism were not negligible either, articles on the state, the national question, revolutionary discipline, the revolution's defenses and revolutionary organization. Likewise, he subjected the Bolsheviks to robust criticism, exposing their contradictions and lies, in articles like The Notion of Equality and the Bolsheviks, How the Bolsheviks Lie, The Truth About the Anarchist Sailor Jelezniak, Open Letter to the Russian Communist Party and its Central Committee, On Bela Kuhn and the Second Alliance, In Memory of the Kronstadt Uprising, Great October in Ukraine, and The Peasantry and the Bolsheviks. He also issued appeals for solidarity with persecuted Russian anarchists in the USSR, on behalf of the anarchist Black Cross, and on behalf of the Kropotkin Museum in Moscow. Likewise, he monitored international political developments, offering his advice in Britain's world policy and the tasks of revolutionary toilers. All these articles appeared in Russian in the Review Dialo Truda, some were translated and also appeared in Le Libertaire. In short, as far as he was concerned, the fight went on, though the pen had replaced the sabre. As for the situation in France, he was obliged, having the sword of Damocles hanging over his head in the form of risk of deportation should he intervene in the slightest in internal politics, to stick to theoretical and organizational matters and to avoid appearances at public meetings and rallies. It is worth stressing this productive output for it took place in wretched circumstances, physical pain, growing psychological isolation and precarious financial circumstances. Passing through Paris, the Bulgarian anarchist Dr. Balef invited Markno to come and settle in Kasanlik in the Valley of Roses in southern Bulgaria. Markno declined, for Russian whites were solidly ensconced there, had official military units and were much to be feared. He did odd painting and decorating jobs, tried his hand at shoe mending along with Arshinov and a few other comrades making women's shoes, a trade very current among the Russian émigré colony in Paris until an industrialist revolutionized manufacturing techniques and rang the death knell of handmade production. Whereupon Markno found himself absolutely on his uppers, financially speaking. His wife subsidized the couple's needs as best she could, but she earned only a pittance working as a domestic cleaner and laundry worker in an establishment far outside Paris for there was the hostility of Russian émigré circles to be faced once they discovered who she was. Some French comrades, hearing of these material straits and Markno's crumbling health, issued an appeal in the April 6, 1929 edition of Le Libertaire for long-term solidarity on Markno's behalf in the form of a regular subscription that would afford the invalid, 
whom vicious tongues were by then describing as the living corpse, a small allowance. A committee was established to that end, and Nadord was appointed secretary. Regular statements of account appeared in the Libertaire. Thus, by June 20, 1929, 7,180 francs had been raised, a modest enough sum of 3,300 francs being paid out to Markno at the rate for 250 francs weekly, just enough for him to scrape by. The committee made the gross blunder of forking out 3,880 francs on postage and stationery merely to get some circulars out. Even so, the allowance was regular for over a year up until the 1930 Congress of the Anarchist Federation, when the majority was overturned as anti-platformists gained the upper hand over pro-platformists. Markno, well known as an ardent organizationist, sent the Congress an open letter that was scathing about these anti-platformists, whom he described as chaotic elements, in many countries, the movement is disorganized within and without and finds itself in a state of decrepitude. We ought to think on that and overcome these difficulties together. In its resolutions, Congress ought to rise above the childish babbling of those who are a drag upon our movement's development. Needless to say, this attitude did nothing to endear him to the new majority. From July 1930 they announced that Le Libertaire would no longer have anything to do with the subscription fund, any who so wished were invited to send their mic directly to Markno, whose address was given in the issues of the paper. After that, they carried statements of the accounts received in the interim and repeated their suggestion. That monies be sent directly to the individual concerned. In June 1931, a benefit event was organized for Markno, but organizational expenses and sundry others ensured that little money was raised. Thus, aside from some Russian, Bulgarian, Spanish and French anarchists who did not forget him, Markno was scarcely able to rely upon solidarity from the Parisians at Le Libertaire. However, in the absence of his being able to go back to the Ukraine to resume the campaign he had broken off in 1921, fresh hopes were raised, for some Spanish anarchists proposed that he assume the leadership of a guerrilla campaign in northern Spain as part of a revolutionary upheaval in 1931. So Markno was taking an interest in matters Spanish and wrote two articles on the subject. He was insistent about the necessity, quote, of helping toilers to establish organs of economic and social self-governance, free Soviets, as well as armed detachments for defense of the revolutionary social measures that they will of necessity have to impose, after having achieved consciousness and broken all the shackles of their servile condition. It is only thus and only through these methods of overall action that revolutionary toilers will be able to act in good time against attempted subversion of the revolution by some new exploitative system. By my reckoning, the FAI and CNT ought, for this purpose, to be able to call upon Minutemen groups in every village and town, and they should not be afraid to take in hand the strategical, organizational and theoretical direction of the toilers' movement. Obviously, when that time comes, they will have to avoid joining forces with political parties generally and with the Bolshevik communists in particular, for I assume that their Spanish counterparts are worthy imitators of their masters. They will follow in the footsteps of the Jesuit Lenin or even of Stalin, not hesitating to assert their monopoly over all the gains of the revolution, they will inevitably betray their allies and the very cause of revolution and turn into the worst of despots. The Russian example ought to spare us from arriving at that stage. May the Bolshevik communist blight not set foot on the revolutionary soil of Spain. End quote. This cautionary advice was followed up by an examination along similar lines of the history of the Spanish Revolution of 1931 and of the role played by the socialists of right and left and the anarchists in 1933. At around the same time Markno suffered a tremendous psychological blow at the end of 1931 when his comrade and friend for over twenty years, Pyotr Arshinov, went over to the Bolsheviks. This led to a stormy falling out between them. How was one to account for this unexpected U-turn by Arshinov who, up until a few months before, had been writing virulent and highly interesting articles against the Stalino-Bolshevik regime? The clarity, some might say rigidity, of the stances assumed by Arshinov in the organizational controversy had alienated the sympathies of many anarchists from him even though they had initially been attracted by the proposed overhaul of the underlying principles of libertarian communism, 
and he became the black sheep of the international anarchist movement. Some went so far as to suggest that his origins in 1904 as a member of the Bolshevik Party was one explanation for his unduly organizational thinking. For his part, prey to continual criticism for trespasses against the Holy Fathers of Anarchy, Arshinov had become increasingly intractable regarding his detractors, even to the extent of breaking radically with traditional anarchism and advocating a highly structured and unmistakably vanguardist anarchist party. Not that it was these options that had divided him from Markno, who was himself a fervent organizationist, it was, rather, a certain sectarianism which had led him to equate his anarchist adversaries with his statist or authoritarian enemies. What is more, Arshinov had experienced a host of personal troubles, in particular deportation from France and a dramatic bust-up with his wife who, wearying of émigré life, and homesick, wanted to go back to Russia along with their son. As Arshinov had formerly been on very friendly terms with Sergo Ordzonikids, they had shared the same cell twenty years before, the latter, who had since become a dose confederate of Stalin, had offered to sponsor Arshinov's return with no old scores to be settled. Thus, more than any organizational considerations, it was these personal ones that probably explained his sudden recognition of the Soviet authorities and his return to Moscow in 1933. There he was to work as a proofreader up until 1937 in which year he was executed on a charge of having sought to restore anarchism in Russia. Having fallen out with most of the US-based Russian anarchists who were supporters of Arshinov, Markno was left very isolated, demoralized, extremely ill and undernourished to live in deteriorating circumstances. Only some Bulgarian anarchists and a few Maknavists as hard up as himself kept in touch with him and helped him insofar as their slender means allowed although Markno often declined financial help, out of pride. He was not inactive, though, and continued to write articles for the Russian Libertarian Review, Probostani, published in the United States. In particular, he published an ABC of anarchism wherein he forcefully set out his beliefs and an essay on the paths of proletarian power in which he raised pertinent questions regarding the nature and content of Bolshevik power, its relationship with the ideas of Marx and Lenin and the proletariat, a part, primarily, urban, of which, he argued, had found its place in the sun under the new regime, to the detriment to the rest of its class and peasant masses. In this way he complemented the analysis of many anarchists who tend to think that the proletariat bears none of the responsibility for the evolution of the Russian Revolution, having allegedly been duped by the intellectual social caste, which by virtue of a whole succession of historical phenomena and alterations to the role of the state, supposedly sought in the course of this process to supplant the capitalist bourgeoisie by making use of the proletariat's struggle. He strenuously recommended them to painstakingly scrutinize the phases of the Russian Revolution, as well as the parts played by one and all in this evolution, and this with an eye to avoiding repetition of the mistakes made and to being in a position to combat Bolshevik communists effectively, while offering a dear and distinct libertarian alternative. The last piece of writing from his pen was an obituary notice on his old comrade Nikolai Rogdayev who died in Central Asia to where he had been banished by Moscow. Rogdayev had been anarchism's trailblazer in Ukraine and Russia at the turn of the century. He had helped set up lots of groups of militants and fighters and had fought on the barricades in Moscow himself in 1905, he had been a redoubtable debater, confounding his social revolutionary and social democrat adversaries so well as to attract many militants from their organizations over to the anarchist camp. He had also engaged in a lengthy polemic with Lenin in Switzerland and thereafter been on friendly terms with the Bolshevik leader. During the 1917 revolution, Rogdayev had settled in Samra and had been meaning to join the Maknovskina in the autumn of 1919, but Volyn's presence had changed his mind, for he could never forgive Volyn for having been an associate of Vladimir Burtsev, the Sherlock Holmes of the Russian revolutionaries' world who had unmasked the agent provocateur Yevno Azev, among others, nor for failing to lift a finger when he, Rogdayev, had been accused, groundlessly, of being an agent provocateur. In 1920 Lenin had summoned him to Moscow, urging him on one hand, to persuade Markno to subordinate himself to the Kremlin, and on the other to take up an important post, based on his knowledge of foreign languages, on the staff of the Red Army on the Western Front. 
Rogdayev had unequivocally declined both suggestions, which had promptly put him in difficulties with the Samrachika. These were later smoothed over, as he went on to hold an educational position in Tiffiz, kept in touch with Diello Truida and indeed, sent it some money. Markno was much affected by his death and at a meeting on January 21, 1934, read a lengthy report in memory of his friend, concluding with this pathetic farewell, quote, Very dear friend, comrade, and brother, sleep easy in the heavy slumber from which there is no waking. Your cause is our cause. It shall never perish. It will spring to life again in the generations to come who will take it up again and enrich it. It will motivate the open, healthy life of the struggle of toiling humanity. Friend, you will remain with us forever. May shame and damnation rebound upon those who have besmirched your name, who have slowly and cravenly clawed at your soul and your heart right to the end. End quote. In doing so, Markno never suspected that these very same words, right down to the curse on slanderers, might soon, very soon, be applied to himself. In fact, he was by now absolutely destitute, only after his death was his wife to send that obituary piece off to the Probosdani, and she was to explain that he had not been able to do so himself for want of the price of postage. Due to malnutrition, his tuberculosis gained ground, gnawing away at his lungs, to the extent that less than two months later, on March 16, 1934, he was hospitalized in the tuberculosis ward of the Tenon Clinic. Parisian libertarians bestirred themselves and reformed the Markno Committee with an eye to organizing vitally needed solidarity. In July, Markno was operated upon but too late to stop the downward spiral. He was placed in an oxygen tent and then, on the night of July 24-25, drifted into a sleep from which he never woke. In the early hours of July 25th, he was pronounced dead. He would have been 45 years of age in another three months. A gathering of some 500 people attended his cremation on July 28th at the Pelakis Cemetery where his ashes joined those of the communards of 1871. Numerous obituaries were carried in the libertarian press worldwide. For all the commemorative activities, one cannot help wondering about the faltering solidarity displayed by Paris's libertarians during his last days. We have mentioned, for instance, the worrying aspects of the accounts of the Markno Committee, a statement for the period from May 3 to August 31, 1934 records receipts of 4,131 francs in contributions from all over the world especially from some Russian and Italian anarchists in the United States, as well as from many French libertarians, among them Jean Grave. But when one turns to the expenditure column, one is dumbfounded to discover that only 123 francs had been paid over to Markno, another 100 to his wife and 300 for their daughter. Whereas his death mask cost 310 francs, the committee's correspondence costs came to 74 francs, and insertions in Le Libertaire 500 francs. In the second statement of accounts, covering the period from August 31, 1934 to September 30, 1935, contributions were still coming in, especially from Russian anarchists in the United States, as well as from the Jewish Club in Paris, making a total of 3,467 francs. Among the expenses was an advance of 1,800 francs made out to Voline for preparation of the outstanding volumes of Markno's memoirs, plus 650 francs for a bar relief of Markno, and sundry correspondence costs. In an effort to understand this and to discover more, we inquired among the surviving members of this famous committee and put the following questions to them, among others, in the financial statement from the Markno Committee, as it appeared in Le Libertaire after his death it appears that a significant sum of money was in hand, upwards of 4,000 francs, yet between May 1934 and his death on July 25, only 123 francs had been paid out to him. How is that to be explained? Did the committee pay out anything to him between 1931 and 1934? The committee was supposed to help Markno's wife and daughter. Did it do so? Among the four replies we received, only Nicholas. Fauchius is a complete response, but unfortunately, he was unable to offer any explanation of the committee's shortcomings, as he was not resident in Paris at the time in question. The other members of the committee either sidestepped the questions asked, 
or visibly ill at ease, declared they could no longer recall such ancient history to mind. So we have to take it that they found it easier to deal with a symbol as the obituary notices described Markno dead rather than alive. Nicholas Fauchia did tell us that there were rumors to the effect that Markno frequented the nearby Vincent's racetrack where, it seems he gambled what small change he had left out of whatever advances were made to him after he carried had paid the basic expenses of his loved ones. It was also said that he had taken to the drink, but that I could not confirm. Quite apart from the slanderous aspect of these rumors, those subscribers who had contributed their might had certainly not intended any surveillance to be maintained on whatever use Markno chose to make of it. The money was to have been quite simply passed on to him, leaving it to him to spend it as he saw fit, or at least that is our opinion. So we reckon these committee men bear a heavy responsibility, for it seems obvious to us that, had Markno had access to more money, he would not have gone to a premature death and might have been able to participate in the Spanish Libertarian Revolution of 1936, for which he had prepared himself, and who knows, might have had a certain influence there, or even died in action as did two Macnavists who wound up in the international group of the Deruti Column. As for the money paid out to Volein for preparing the remainder of Markno's memoirs, let us see what use was made of that. The first volume had already come out, as we have seen, in Markno's lifetime, in French in 1927, and in Russian in 1929. After that, the second and third volume were ready, having been typed and checked by Ida Met and Marie Goldsmith, and all that was missing was the cooperation of a publisher. Markno had himself announced as much in 1927 in a letter to the Russian-Ukrainian worker colony in the United States hoping that good translators could be found to see to a Ukrainian language edition. Meanwhile, he published a large portion of the second volume in 1932 in the US-based Russian libertarian newspaper, Rasviet, Dawn, under the title of Pages of Gloomfium the Russian Revolution. Shortly before his death, sensing the imminence of the end, he had entrusted all his papers, including the manuscripts of those two volumes, to his old friend Grisha Botanovsky known as Barta, whom he had known in Ukraine in 1907 and bumped into again as an emigre, asking Barta to make the best use of them. After his friend's death, Barta had sought out the doctor and libertarian activist Mark Pirro to seek his advice. He had then decided to hand back the manuscripts of the two. Unpublished volumes of memoirs to Markno's wife, Galina Kuzmenko, and to leave it to her to determine what was best. Galina passed them on to the aid committee, probably lest the monies collected be completely frittered away and the committee in turn commissioned Volein to prepare them for publication and contacted the U.S. based Russian libertarian organizations with a view to possible publication. Other manuscripts, documents, correspondence, handbills, and newspapers Barter kept in a small case which went missing during a wartime search by the Gestapo. Barter was an anarchist and a Jew and so have probably been lost forever. In 1936 and 1937, the second and third volumes of Markno's memoirs came zero UT, thanks to funds collected by Russian libertarians in the United States, under Volein's editorship and complete with forward and notes by Volein. But what could this editorship have amounted to? We have compared the extract published in 1932 in Rasriet and the version published under Volein's editorship, and, aside from the redeployed comma or the pruning of circumlocutions, we have found nothing extra in the Volein version. But what had Volein to say on the matter? In his foreword, Volein, much regrets that a personal dash with Nestor Markno had prevented him from drafting the first volume which had appeared during the author's lifetime, for he would have been able to polish up the format and avoided the disappointment of readers. He goes on to say that, shortly before Markno's death, their relations had improved and that he had intended to suggest to him that the remainder of his memoirs be drafted with his participation and that only Markno's death had prevented realization of this plan. This account of things is wholly false, for Kiro Radev told us that he had tried to effect a reconciliation between the pair and had informed Markno on his hospital bed that he had included Volein in his support committee whereupon the Ukrainian anarchist had retorted, you have betrayed me. Indeed, it was to misunderstand Markno to think that he would so easily forgive Volein's past trespasses. Yet Volein states in his foreword that he had done no more than touch up the literary form of the text. 
in which case his handiwork, proofreader's work, has nothing to do with what one understands by drafting, which would suggest that Markno did not know how to write. However, he justifies it by mentioning that Markno possessed only a rudimentary education and did not have much of a grasp of literary language, though this did not prevent him from having a very characteristic style, all his own. Somewhat embarrassed nonetheless by his contradictions, he chooses to move on to the content of Markno's memoirs, which he praises for their historical and documentary interest concerning the years 1917 and 1918. He does express reservations about Markno's critical considerations regarding the passivity of certain of the Russian anarchists of the day, as well as what he considers the overinflated evaluation of the revolutionary role of the Ukrainian peasantry and laments the fact that the memoirs stopped at the end of 1918, before the great blossoming of the Maknavist movement. Rollein promised a book that would reprint others of Markno's writings, collecting all of the articles of his that had appeared in the Russian libertarian press plus some unpublished manuscripts, probably the ones then in Barter's keeping. In 1945, shortly before his death, Volein was to forward all his papers and books to his closest friend Jacques Dubinsky who was to see to the publication in 1947. Of Volein's overview of the Russian Revolution, his book The Unknown Revolution. Those papers finished up later in the possession of Volein's children. We managed to get sight of a copy of them. The whole collection is made up of notes and drafts, no doubt it is this patchy condition that has thus far prevented their being published. Rollein reiterates his charges against Markno and, insofar as one can tell, the underlying cause of the rift between them can be traced to personality clashes and social tensions, Markno had never made the slightest move to strike up a more personal friendship with him and had supposedly displayed a blind trust in the peasantry and distrust of every other class in society a degree of contempt for intellectuals, even anarchist ones. In The Unknown Revolution, Volein has no hesitation in stating that Markno led in Paris an extremely dismal existence in material as well as in psychological terms. His life abroad was one long, lamentable agony against which he was powerless to contend. His friends helped him to bear the burden of these sad years of decline. We have seen how his exile was anything but unproductive and that only the very last years were very dismal, due primarily to the actions of certain of his friends. No question about it, Markno who had already sampled Bolshevik friendship could have taken as his own the dictum, just preserve me from my friends, and, as for my enemies, I will see to them myself. 28. Nestor Markno's Personality, Character Traits and Idiosyncrasies Thus far and to avoid our narratives becoming too nebulous, we have scarcely dwelt upon the personality and certain facets of the life and activities of Nestor Markno. We now return to these and are going to attempt, with the help of sundry testimony, to reconstruct his portrait, his qualities and shortcomings which on occasion may better explain certain successes or failures of the movement as a whole. According to the overlapping descriptions of people who met or associated with him in Paris, Markno was rather short standing about 1.65 meters tall, with black hair, blue-gray eyes, a high broad forehead and, by around 1927, he had a rather hefty look about him. This latter characteristic dated back to the years of the revolution, for ten years of imprisonment had turned the young heavyset lad, as he appears in a photograph from 1907, into a man, a young man, to be sure, but one rather gaunt in appearance. The open air, better food, and the exploits and tough encounters of the ensuing years endowed him with a more robust aspect. The earliest portrait of him at this time upon which we can call is that by the Ukrainian nationalist Magalevsky who met Markno in the spring of 1917. He describes him as a man small in stature, rather skinny wearing his hair long and with a small brown moustache, he records Markno strolling about town for nearly an hour, listening in on the conversations and observing the behaviour of all and sundry, without uttering a word himself. The anarchist Joseph Gottman, known as the emigrant, on account of his having lived in the United States for many a long year, saw Markno at roughly the same time as a man of slightly less than average height, powerfully built, with piercing steel grey eyes and a determined expression. Son of a Ukrainian peasant, in his veins flowed the blood of Zaporul Cossack ancestors renowned for their independent spirit and their fighting qualities. 
Although weakened by long incarceration, during which his lungs had been affected, Mark now amazed everyone with his vitality and energy. At the end of 1918 the insurgent Belash also saw him as, not quite as tall as the average, with a lively manner, snub nose, and long hair that falls to his neck and shoulders, giving him an adolescent air. Dressed in baggy pants over officer's jackboots, a dragoon's jacket with buttoned-up collar, a student cap upon his head, and a Mauser revolver slung at his shoulder. A few months later, Dybetz offered one of the most interesting portraits of him, quote, What was he like? Well, how can I put it? He was small of stature. He wore his hair long, tumbling down his back. In winter as in summer, the only head covering he would have any truck with was the paparka. He was perfectly expert in the handling of all manner of weapons. He was a dab hand with the rifle and an excellent saber man. Using the Mauser and the Nagan revolvers, he was a crack shot. He knew how to fire a cannon, which he required of all his entourage. As an anarchist, he had read the works of Kropotkin, Orguayani, and probably Bakunin. There, it would appear, his intellectual baggage stopped. There was no denying his uncommon innate gifts, but one could only take him to task for failing to develop them and having failed to grasp the responsibility that he bore. End quote. In short, Dybetz was carping at Markno for not having undergone metamorphosis, as he himself had, from libertarian into Bolshevik and maybe for not having pushed his intellectual baggage as far as the learned works of his new masters, that said, he did acknowledge some very fine qualities in the man. These had escaped the attention of one of his party colleagues, Brasnev, who met Markno in May 1919 and noticed the long hair hanging over his forehead, found his nose to be long and pointed and that he had the long face of a seminarian. Brasnev later acknowledged that he had been tempted to pull out his Mauser and put a bullet in the back of Markno's head while he was perusing a letter from headquarters. When Lev Kaminv came to Guliaipoli on May 7, 1919, one of his escorts drew this thumbnail sketch of Markno a thick-set fellow, fair-haired, clean-shaven, with piercing light blue eyes, forever gazing into the distance and rarely looking his interlocutor in the eye. He listened to what one had to say with his eyes lowered and head slightly tilted, with a curious expression, as if he was about to knife us all where we stood, and walk away. He wore a burka, Caucasian felt overcoat AS, and a paparka on his head, and a saber and revolver at his side. His staff commandant is a typical Zaporog. The author of this portrait added that it was as if he had been transported back among the Zaporogs of the 18th century. Some months later, in August 1919, in Pomoshnaya railway station when the 58th Red Army Division joined up with Markno, a Bolshevik by the name of S. Rosen had occasion to see him close at hand, he saw him as having blue eyes, being dressed like a hussar resembling a common soldier rather than the Ukrainian Batko which he was made out to be. Only his wicked grey eyes hinted at extraordinary strength of will and toughness. Markno delivered a fiery anti-Bolshevik speech, labelling Bolsheviks as usurpers and stranglers of the people's freedom and accusing them of fleeing like cowards before the whites, abandoning Ukraine to their mercy, whereas he pledged to smash Denikin into three short planks. Rosen stresses that Markno shouted rather than spoke. With the consummate zeal of the agitator, the conclusion of his speech had been drowned out by cheering from the crowd of soldiers. One Bolshevik made to reply to him, but he had not allowed him to speak, and proposed that a revolutionary committee be formed forthwith. At around the same time, an Italian diplomat travelling in the area was intercepted by some Machnavists, this was Pietro Coroni, he offers us this picturesque description of his adventure. First of all he was confronted with a tall, dark commander with a monumental set of moustaches and a still fresh scar running across his face. A Cossack cap sat lopsided on his head, his uniform was very vaguely reminiscent of the old Russian uniforms, two machine gun ammunition belts crisscrossed his chest, and lastly there was that broad leather belt with some grenades dangling from it. It transpired that this was the commander of Markno's Black Sotnia. Koroni was led before Markno in a kata. The Bakko was alone, seated in front of a crudely hewn table. The Italian diplomat depicts him as being short, with straight, chestnut brown hair hanging down to his narrow adolescent's shoulders. A black cloth jacket girded by the inevitable crossed machine gun belts, 
a revolver and a saber hung at his waist, on the table one could just make out his boots, gleaming. He found him to have small dark eyes with, from time to time, a maniacal stare and the occasional flash of cold curiosity, but, throughout, the expression of an indomitable and well-nigh superhuman determination. Coroni exchanged a few words with his host and was very struck by his voice, such a voice as I have never heard, in tone, very high though not shrill, and abruptly modulated, one sometimes almost felt as if one was listening to a cock crow. Probably an aficionado of the opera and under the influence of several glasses of vodka proffered by his host and which he did not dare decline for fear of offending Markno, the Italian remarked a long and strident burst of laughter from the backhoe who made an astonishing speech to him, unless, with the passage of time and his imperfect grasp of Russian, Coroni had picked up certain words and phrases wrongly. According to him, Markno had supposedly urged him to intercede with the Western allies to get them to support him, quote, I am the one whom the allies should be supporting. The whites. They no longer stand any chance, and will never get the Russian people under their yoke again. The reds. But if they win the day, you're going to have problems putting paid to them. I, on the other hand, reckon that factory life, city living cannot but make a man unhappy but in the countryside, once the big landlords have been done away with, everybody will be able to live content. Look, this is marvellous soil, we shall sell you our wheat and from you we will buy the industrial products we lack and we shall all be happy, a happy, free peasant people will never seek trouble with its neighbours. End quote. Markno assured him that every peasant in Russia was on his side and undertook, with the Allies' help, to rid the country of reds and whites alike. Although such words from Markno's lips seem unlikely, Quaroni's version is nonetheless interesting, for he reconstructs this much more likely essential message, it was a matter of doing away with landlords and government and of securing absolute freedom for the peasants. The old, old anarchist revolution, in short, the timeless dream of the Russian peasant, the revolution of Stenka Razin and Emilian Pugashev. The diplomats' short sojourn among the Maknavists ended with a madcap race in a Tachanka, that Civil War jeep. Koroni's recollection of the episode proved quite wistful, as he confessed, deep down, a pronounced sympathy for anarchy and recalled his interlocutor with a twinge of regret. One month later, shortly before the Battle of Paragonovka, there were some contacts between the Maknavists and Putlura's Ukrainian nationalists. One of the latter, a certain Viner, portrays Markno as a solidly built fellow, of average height, dressed in a blue shirt tied at the waist by a green belt. Another Petlerist tells of Markno's arrival at the Uman headquarters. On the eve of the scheduled rendezvous, some Maknavist emissaries had showed up to reconnoiter the place and posted themselves in positions where they might sound the alarm at the first sign of danger. The next morning on the stroke of 10 a.m., about twenty horsemen arrived on the gallop, with five Tachankis mounted with machine guns bringing up the rear, in the middle Tachanka was Markno, dressed in a long green Cossack greatcoat, other horsemen formed a rearguard. All of this cavalry lined up in two ranks facing the Petlerist headquarters, allowing the Tachankis to pass between them. Preceded and followed by two bodyguards brandishing revolvers, Markno dismounted and walked towards the building. Armed with two revolvers himself, he entered the staff room, briefly greeted the Petlerist commander who had risen to welcome him, then promptly sat down in an armchair in order to avoid a handshake from his host. There was little trust between the two sides, and the grigor of precedent must have been still in their minds, which accounts for the plethora of precautionary measures. In autumn 1919, during the occupation of Ekaterinoslav, Outman, an inhabitant of the city, caught sight of Markno and found him, small, slight, with a face almost womanly because of the long black hair that fell to his shoulders, he inspired dread, what with his staring, maniacal piercing eyes and the cruel crease at the corner of his mouth, taken together with a pallid, washed-out face. It was hard to put an age on him, perhaps twenty-five, maybe forty-five. No one could rest easy under his gaze, one nurse whom he questioned for a full hour. She was suspected of harboring white officers, later had a nervous breakdown, so much so that for weeks there were fears for her sanity. From what she said, the hardest thing to bear had been the end of the interrogation, when Markno became pleasant. 
We have another piece of testimony to temper this chilling picture. It comes from a young student at the city's mining institute, who had been delegated along with some other students to approach Markno to seek clarification of certain Machnavist impositions upon local intellectuals, one of whom was suspected of being a Denikinist spy and had been flogged. Having arrived with some trepidation, the student and his friends had quickly been reassured by Nestor who gave them a friendly welcome, standing up, smiling and shaking hands before inviting them to be seated, offering cigarettes and asking what he might do for them. The student took in the room they were in, roomy, well-lighted, with a huge table upon which two grenades, a colt, two field telephones with wires trailing off outside, plus a samovar had been placed. The backhoe was not at all like a father figure and the student wondered why that title had been awarded to him. Markno was wearing a tunic, held closed by strapping that passed over the shoulders. An insurgent acted as orderly and jotted down the decisions reached during the exchange. Markno listened attentively to the grievances of his visitors, occasionally interrupting them to seek further detail, and then told them of the problems he had in preventing abuses perpetrated by bandits professing to belong to the Machnavist movement, although he had already had a number of them hanged. He declared that certain acts were the handiwork of Bolshevik provocateurs who had everything to gain by the intelligentsia's turning away from the Machnavists, especially in the cases which they had mentioned, for the insurgents never used the lash on anyone. They either shot those proven guilty, or released those found innocent. His visitors noted that it pained him to see the insurgent movement thus blackened to the advantage of its enemies. He undertook to look into the matter personally, chatted amiably with the students and asked them if they did not want to throw in their lot with the anarchist movement, as their presence might bring a lot of improvements. Towards the end of 1920, the French libertarian Mauritius Van Damme spent some time in Ukraine and happened to come across an anarchist peasant whose name he discovered only later, Nestor Markno. These were the circumstances, against a romantic backdrop a dingy tavern in Odessa Mauritius spoke the password have you any sunflower seeds, and was escorted up a fire escape into a separate room, where he found a thick-set peasant, with rugged features, thirty to thirty-five years old, but prematurely wrinkled, stubborn forehead, deep-set eyes as clear as spring water, with a determined, forceful manner mitigated by the timeless nostalgic dreaminess of the Slav. A social revolutionary acted as interpreter. Markno told him that the Ukraine's peasants made the revolution to get rid of feudal lords who were grinding them down and exploiting them and will never agree to the return of the old regime, but they do not want to fall under the yoke of communist bureaucrats either, they want to be free. All peasants accept and like the Soviet system, but, they must, be, Soviets freed of government influence. The communist functionaries are parasites who aim to ape the Tsarist lordlings and oppress the peasant, the latter is quite prepared to work, but not in order to keep these idlers in food. He will defend his freedom against usurpers. The peasants want to live by their toil, not wear anybody's yoke nor oppress anyone. Mauritius fails to give the exact date of this encounter but places it after the breakdown of the Second Alliance and thus probably in 1921, when Markno was in the Odessa region. This testimony is precious for it appeared at the beginning of 1922 at a time when the Machnavist movement was not yet well known in France and, above all, for the first time in the West, it reproduced the whole text of the Second Alliance between the Machnavists and the Bolsheviks, which authenticates his gripping account beyond all doubt. The last reference we have unearthed to Markno's presence in Ukraine depicts him as, a 35-year-old man, with the ruddy cheeks of the consumptive, long hair falling to his shoulders, a physiognomy reminiscent of the sacristan of some parish in the back of beyond. Now one has to take into account the many wounds he had received, as well as the extremely exacting conditions of the fight against the Red Army, which is to say, a certain physical exhaustion further aggravated by his lengthy detention in Poland. In 1925, when Alexander Bookman finally made his acquaintance in Berlin, he was, taken aback by his appearance, the powerful leader of the insurgents had been reduced to a shadow of his former self. His face and body bore the scars of wounds and his shattered ankle had left him permanently infirm. However, his spirit and determination were intact and he expressed the desire to return to the land of his birth to resume the struggle for freedom and social justice. He found life in exile to be unbearable, 
feeling wrenched away from his roots, and he pined for his beloved Ukraine. Buckman several times heard him say that he had to get back over there, for we are needed. Nourished by his exploits, the legend surrounding him was further reinforced by the many feats, real or imagined, with which public gossip credited him. The most widespread gossip concerned his unexpected appearances in the most diverse disguises and appearances. In the early days and given his flowing locks and beardless face, the most commonly assumed disguise was as a woman. Wearing makeup and dressed as a peasant woman off he would go to survey enemy positions before hiding some inscription by way of registering his visit, just before disappearing. One day he did just this to check out the Bolsheviks' abuses in Guliapoli and left them this blunt warning. Came. Saw everything. Vengeance will be taken. Back home Arkno. Perhaps his companions employed the same procedure to ensure that he seemed to be everywhere at once and to undermine the enemy's morale. Another version has it that he arrived, in peasant garb, to sell some vegetables in a village market. Whereupon, the next day, notices pinned up on the fences announced that those who had purchased such and such a vegetable had been dealing with none other than Bakko Markno. It was also said that he had had some banknotes printed, normal on one side but bearing on the reverse this humorous inscription, hey, chum, stop worrying, the smart money is on Markno. A variation on this slogan stated that, ours are no worse than yours. Other things too attested to Markno's ability to be everywhere and nowhere. One day the commuter train between Alexandrovsk and Melitopol was attacked by a gang of armed men. They moved through the carriages, steaming the passengers, when they came to one passenger who had so far been sitting quietly in his seat, they were asked, who are you people, and replied Maknavists, whereupon the nameless passenger whipped out a revolver and gunned them down. About fifty other passengers mitted out the same treatment to the rest of the gang. Then the nameless passenger reveals his identity, Nesta Markno, and delivers a speech to the real passengers, setting out the insurgents' honest intent. Another time, a peasant begs a lone horseman to help him extricate his cart from the mud, this done, he thanks him and is about to move off when two more horsemen happen by and hail the lone horseman as Bakko Markno, whereupon the peasant dissolves in apologies for having put him to the trouble and thanks him all the more warmly. All of these deeds, real or imagined, spread by word of mouth and they earned Markno unparalleled popularity among the peasantry, a popularity that occasionally bordered on outright adoration. Alexander Bookman records how one day in Dubrivka he came upon an aged Mujik, a real patriarch, with a long white beard, who doffed his papaka at the very mention of Markno's name. A great and good man, he said, may God protect him. He passed this way two years ago, but I remember as if it were yesterday. Standing on a bench in the square, he spoke to us. We are uneducated folk and could never make head or tail of the Bolshevik speechifying whenever they addressed us. But Markno speaks our language, simple and direct, brethren, he told us, we have come to help you. We have driven out the landlords and their hirelings, and now we are free. Divide the land among you fairly and equitably, then work as comrades for the good of all. A holy man, the venerable peasant concluded with conviction, going on to bring up the prophecy of Pugashev, the great 18th century, rebel, I have only frightened you, but one day steel broom will come and it will sweep you all away, ye tyrants over the holy ground of this Russia of ours. Well, the broom has come and it is back home Arkno. The old peasant, though, had lost one of his sons in Shkuro's occupation of his village, but Markno, tipped off, had arrived in the middle of the night with a hundred men, and, with the help of local peasants, driven out Shkuro's 3,000 Cossacks. Such personal fearlessness, Markno always led from the front, created fierce competition among the other insurgents, none of whom wanted to be outdone. Hardly ever wounded during the first three years of the civil war, a legend of invincibility came to surround him. Arshinov who considered this a psychic anomaly relates that he would stroll around under the bullets and shrapnel as if these were raindrops. To this was added a sumfra that was always the same, even, indeed especially, in the most threatening circumstances as at Paragonovka or the Chiku instigated attempt on his life, as he was walking down the main street of Guliipoli, a killer, lying in wait around a corner, 
tossed two bombs at him. Fortunately, neither exploded. Without flinching, Markno drew his revolver, shot down the checkist, picked up the bombs and took them to the movement's headquarters, remarking that these Bolsheviks were sending him some decidedly queer presents. A strategist of genius, the word is not too strong, for this gift of his was universally acknowledged, Markno exploited the lie of the land to perfection, those steps stretching into the distance, virtually treeless and unforested but porrogated everywhere by deep ravines invisible at a distance. His familiarity with the region thus proved crucial. The tactical methods employed trickery, the element of surprise, the lightning raid, the sham retreat and extreme mobility made up for the insurgent's numerical and technical inferiority. It was he who invented the Tachanka with its machine gun mounting as transport for mounted infantry. Among his stratagems, the most celebrated, was wearing the disguise of the regular soldier, one by one he became an officer of the Vata, the White Cossacks, the Denikinist Army and then a Red Army NCO. We might also mention the use of marriage, or funeral processions for military purposes. Brookman quotes one instance of this sort, as related by a Bolshevik, Markno arranged for a wedding to be held in a Denikinist occupied village. Passing themselves off as happy revelers, the insurgents doled out generous vodka rations to the troops of the garrison. As the drinking binge reached its climax, Markno showed up at the head of a detachment. Taken by surprise and overpowered, the 1,000 Denikinists surrendered without a fight. The conscripts among them were sent home, the others being bound for the execution stake. Yet such strokes would have come to nothing had Markno not been permanently on the alert. In the beginnings of the movement in the autumn of 1918 he slept fully dressed on a table over a three-week period, ready for any eventuality. When it came to weapon maintenance, especially maintenance of machine guns, and the combat training of his partisans, he was extremely meticulous, almost obsessive. He explains himself in his reply to Cubanin concerning the allegedly gratuitous machine gun fire by his chief lieutenant, Semyon Koretnik, quote, Semyon Koretnik and all my other aides who succeeded to positions of responsibility adhered as if to a law to a precept which they inherited from myself, upon taking up an office of responsibility, never to rely upon anyone else in the proper running of combat units, especially prior to each operation, always to go and check it out yourself. This rule was above all applied to machine gun units which, during operations and marches, had to follow me at all times at the head of the entire army. In such instances it was Semyon Koretnik's duty to inspect these units, particularly in winter, when the slightest drop in temperature could freeze the machine guns. He checked it out because he knew me well, for it was my custom to ride well ahead of the army dash, and he knew that, in the event of an encounter with the enemy, I would not wait for the rest of the force to arrive but would attack immediately, lest the enemy have time to organize himself, even though this might cost us many losses at the opening of the engagement, before the enemy was overwhelmed by our attack. It was on such occasions that Semyon Koretnik would test the machine guns, usually by loosing off five or six rounds himself, in the presence of the gunners. End quote. These precautions explain the frequent successes of his surprise attacks and make absolute nonsense of Volein's allegations of alcoholism which were of course made once Markno was dead. Had he been alive he would have rebutted them and held them up to ridicule. It is in fact inconceivable that Markno or his close companions could have indulged in drunken binges, given the constant tension in which they lived, the slightest binging could have cost all their lives in an instant, for engagements erupted at the most unlikely hours of the day or night and so they had to be constantly on the alert. All servicemen know that much, and during his famous raid, for instance, the Don Cossack General Mamontov, who was extremely temperate himself and who also led his men from the front, came upon 1,000 barrels of alcohol in Frolov. He promptly ordered them smashed, in which the tearful Cossacks obliged him. We do not know whether their tears were due to the alcoholic vapors or to their regrets. Mamontov was perfectly well aware that, had he not done so, then within the hour all his men would have become corpses. Markno did the same thing with the alcohol of the Berdyansk distillery on one of the occasions when he seized the port the barrels were emptied onto the snow, when they might have been used to banish the chill. An important question arises concerning the impact of Batko Markno's charisma upon the movement as a whole. 
In the minds of many, Mark Noe is regarded as a chief to whom all the insurgents were subordinate. As we have seen, the supreme authority of the movement was vested in the General Congress of Peasants and Insurgents of the region, the leadership appointed between two congresses, the Military Revolutionary Soviet, had merely executive powers. The essential decisions of the movement were always made after a general assembly of the insurgents, however, certain tactical and strategic decisions of a military character fell exclusively to Markno and the members of his staff thus, here, Bako Markno meant a leader of men in military matters and military matters only. This notion was wholly in tune with the traditional usage among the Maknavists' ancestors, the Zaporog Cossacks. In this instance, the role of Bako, equivalent then to the title of Ataman Koshevoy, had not initially had such charismatic connotations. As we may judge from a description given by Gogol, one Kurdiaga is duly elected, in his absence, as Ataman Koshevoy. A dozen Cossacks go off to fetch him and tell him, quote, Come along. You've been elected Koshevoy. For pity's sake, my lords, he replies, I am unworthy of such an honor. How could I be Koshevoy? I lack the wisdom necessary to hold such high office. Is there really no one worthier in the whole army? It is as you have been told, the Cossacks bellow. Two of them grab him under the arms and despite his efforts to resist by bracing his legs, he is at last hauled off into the middle of the square to an accompaniment of prods, heavy claps on the back and admonishments, don't buy so shy, damn it. Accept the honor, you cur, since it has been offered to you. Whereupon the crowd is asked if it is indeed willing to have Kadiaga as its koshevoy. When it replies in the affirmative, the symbolic mace is offered to the newly elected one. In accordance with ancient custom, he declines it twice before accepting. Four old Cossacks then step forward from the assembly, and place a handful of earth atop Kurdiaga's head, and smear his face, he remains impassive, and, thanks the Cossacks for the honor they have done him. End quote. One can readily understand how, in these conditions, the title of Bako implied a limited command although he could influence certain other decisions through the power of his word or arguments. The example of the Grigoriv affair illustrates this point, after the initial contact with the Ataman, Markno and the members of his staff withdrew to consider their options. A first vote indicated that four favoured an alliance, but seven were against that but for the immediate execution of this pogromist. At this point, Markno piped up and declared that, whatever the cost, we must enter into an alliance with Grigoriv, for we do not know as yet what support he has and we can always shoot him later. We have to redeem those who follow him, the ones who are innocent victims and we must at all costs absorb them into our units. A second poll demonstrated the impact this argument had made, now, nine favoured an alliance and two abstained. When the time came to make the decision, which had such tragic implications for the destinies of the movement, whether to ally yet again with the Red Army, Markno had been dilatory, had he set his face against it, there can be no doubt but that events would not have taken such a dismal turn. The likelihood is that he was unwilling to oppose the vast majority of the insurgents who favoured such a pact. On the other hand in the case of Fedor Glaushenko, commissioned by the Chika to assassinate him, he was unable to resist his comrade's decision to have him executed in spite of the condemned man's repentance. If Mark no Dunter and made use of the title Bakko, this was because he appreciated that it was a rallying point for the peasantry as a whole who looked to him. Otherwise, as a convinced anarchist, he had no truck with the honors bestowed by any authorities, he contemptuously repudiated the decorations and ranks awarded. And the substantial salaries they implied, by both the Red Army and the Whites. Let us add for the record that under Rangel, certain white politicians had been willing to confer upon him the title of the first Count of Gugliopoli, but there is no telling whether he was aware of this curious plan. All of these shenanigans did not prevent his enemies from placing a considerable price on his head when the time came, in an effort to rid themselves of this symbol of people's self-rule. Thus his responsibilities did not turn his head for as one of his obituaries had it, he, did not know how to act out a part his preeminence being natural, the result merely of an exceptional strength of will. And this strength was derived from his intense faith in anarchy. At the outset of the insurgent movement in 1918, 
He had dreamed of a life in which there was neither slavery, nor fossid, nor infamy, nor despised divinities, nor chains, where love and living space will not be for sale, where there would only be men's truth and nothing else. As an emigre Markno had to summon up all his strength of will just to face the adversities and the slings and arrows of exile in strange lands and often hostile surroundings. France lived up to her reputation as a land of asylum, although he was informed at the Paris prefecture of police that it was on account of him that the Allied intervention in Russia had failed, but that this was not being held against him and that he was being granted a residence permit. In this light, it is all the more to his credit that he was able to engage in such intense memorialist and intellectual pursuits in the years 1925 to 1929, complementing on paper the fighting that he had led on the ground. Here let it be noted that his style, while not as literary as Volin might have wished, was quite vivid. In his writing he simultaneously described what was done and what he felt, and in some places this did not preclude a degree of pathos and undue prolixity, however, he always brings out the underlying and implicit meaning of his standpoints, sometimes with great lyricism. In his dealings with other libertarians, it was not his intention to capitalize upon his prestige and he was always like a brother. Kiro Radeff has told us how Markno's personal magnetism worked with French workers and others who, knowing nothing about the man, aside from his name, Nesta, would chat very warmly with him. He had remained humble among the humble, true to his class. Some libertarian militants from Amargues, a small town in the Guard Department, at the time it was France's most anarchist town in terms of numbers and the intensity of the libertarian activities engaged in, met him in 1929, during the short trip that he had made to deliver his daughter Lucy there to holiday with some friends. Comrades Chotand, known just as Chocho, and N, have described to us a Markno who was anything but intimidating, with his cloth cap, steady glance, strong handshake, an open, friendly manner. Honed by the misrepresentations, controversies, and squabbles of the years 1927 to 1929, his character soured somewhat, his diffidence increased and he no longer let anything pass without a snappy reply, becoming less approachable. What truth was there in the innuendo about his having been a habitue of the Vincent's racetrack and his fondness for the demon drink? Kiro Radeff has confirmed that Markno was wont to go along to watch the horses race, not so much to have a flutter on the outcome as to relive certain feelings at the sight of the mounts a quite normal thing in a horseman. As for overindulgence in wine or spirits, Bulgarian comrades who were intimate with him right to the end Kiro Radeff, Erevan and Nikola Chorbadjiev have categorically denied to us that he had any such weakness. Not once did they ever see him drunk or drinking heavily, indeed, they claim that his health was such that it would not allow him to drink much. Ida Met has something to say on this point also, quote. Was Markno the drunkard as which Volein describes him? I think not. During three years in Paris, I never saw him drunk, and I saw him very often at that time. I had occasion to accompany him as interpreter to meals organized in his honor by some foreign anarchists. One glass, and he became intoxicated, his eyes would sparkle and he became voluble, but I never saw him really drunk. They tell me that in the last years of his life he went hungry, let himself go and maybe at that point he took to the drink, that seems to have been a possibility. But generally speaking it took only a few drops of alcohol to intoxicate his ailing and weakened body. Being Ataman, he must have drunk as much as any Ukrainian peasant in his everyday life. End quote. For our part, we have not been able to uncover any first-hand evidence of Markno's possible drunkenness, nothing to endorse the US academic Paul Average's categorical assertion that Markno found only in alcohol the means of escape from this strange world into which he had been thrown. Markno had paid a high toll to the revolution in both personal and family terms. His aged mother had been manhandled and driven from her humble abode, three of his brothers had been, respectively, killed by the Austro-Germans, the Whites, and the Reds. He had split up with his first companion, Nastia, over a misunderstanding, at the time of his odyssey across Russia, she had given birth to a stillborn child and then, in the belief that Nesta was dead, she had set up home with another comrade. For a time he had another sweetheart, Tina, a telephonist in Dubrivka and then, 
From the start of 1919 he had had a consistent relationship with the woman who was to become his life's companion, Galina Kuzmenko, a Guliapoli school teacher. She was a highly active participant in the insurgent movement, as adroit in the handling of a rifle as of a machine gun, and for a time she had been involved in the intelligence branch. It was undoubtedly her commitment to the cause which had brought her and Markno together. And she had paid dearly for it. Her father who naively believed that the whites and the reds are men too, had been shot by the latter in August 1919 simply for being Markno's father-in-law. Here let us make it clear that the couple never married, contrary to some assertions which have them marrying in church. Galina candidly admitted this in an article on the death of her father which appeared after Markno's death. She described herself as a Maknavist, not an anarchist, we are told by Nikola Chorbadjif who describes her as a tall, beautiful woman, erect, candid, likable, smiling, very dignified and a good mother. In 1921 along with Nesta she had come within an ace of death when the village where they were staying was ringed by the Red Army which knew of their presence and had searched every home with a fine tooth comb. Standing behind a door, with revolver at the ready, Nesta and she had awaited discovery, intent upon selling their lives dear. Fortunately, the troops had not been curious enough to look behind the door of the room they were searching. May Picaray also describes Galena as, very devoted, calm and sensible, attached to Nesta and likable, on the other hand, little Lucy who must have been almost three years old in 1925, struck May as a little imp, what with her climbing and jumping off the table. According to certain rumours, the couple had their ups and downs but there too we have not been able to discover anything specific, Nikola Chorbadjif, who had been their neighbour, denied as much to us and pointed out instead that they got along famously. However, Ida met level serious charges against Galina, she describes her as a Ukrainian nationalist, credits her with an overbearing attitude towards her companion and even accuses her of having tried to murder him in his sleep in 1924 in Poland following an affair she had had with a Petlierist officer. As evidence of this murder bid, she cites the broad scar that Markno displayed on his cheek. We pointed out to her that it was common knowledge that the scar was the result of a bullet which had struck him in the back of the head, exiting via the cheek, to which she retorted that she had only heard tell of this. Ida Met also accused Galina of having stolen her companion's private diary and of having destroyed it in concert with Volein, whose companion she allegedly became, because of scathing remarks it contained about them. Here again Ida Met was unable to provide detail, and had retreated behind a hearsay defence. Such allegations therefore must be taken with a large pinch of salt. Nikola Chorbadjiv did confirm to us that Galina was on friendly terms with Volein after Nesta's death but that there was nothing to suggest more intimate relations, their dealings must have had to do with the preparation of Markno's manuscripts and memoirs. What is not open to debate, is Galina's loyalty to the memory of her comrade, as her article in Ukrainian in Probozdenai, refuting the calumnies of Ukrainian nationalists, bears witness. Also she had been jailed in a Warsaw prison for 13 months, she could not have wound up there merely for being Markno's companion, she must have been engaged in tremendous joint activity with Nesta whose secretary and confidant she had always been. It strikes us that her part in the movement was much more important and remarkable than it seems, for instance, it was she who took on the delicate and dangerous mission of contacting the Russian-American anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Brookman who were at that stage well disposed towards Lenin, in the summer of 1920. She briefed them on the real nature of the Maknavist movement, neither Goldman nor Brookman concealed the strong impression she had made on them. Emma mentioned the risk she had run in coming to see them, Galina replied that she had, faced danger so often that she no longer gave it a thought. The pair spent the whole night in conversation, Emma noted her dot comma, ravishing face and Brookman speaks of her as a young woman of remarkable beauty. She questioned Emma Goldman about women abroad, especially in America, what were they doing? Were they truly independent and acknowledged? How did relations between the sexes stand? And birth control? Emma was impressed by this urgent thirst for knowledge and sensed her enthusiasm quicken in response to Galena's. It seems that for the visiting couple, Brookman and Goldman, this encounter was a watershed, hitherto, they had been starry-eyed about the Lenin regime. 
A meeting with Markno was planned by means of a stratagem. Maknavists would seize the train carrying Goldman and Brookman, thereby saving appearances in Moscow's eyes and then they could have a more detailed briefing on the Maknovskina. But circumstances prevented realization of the plan. In exile, Markno had patiently striven to separate his companion Galina from his activities, even claiming in one article that his wife was not politically minded, this in the probable aim of not compromising her in the eyes of the French police and his Russian enemies. He may even have urged her, before dying, to go home and carry out a mission there among his surviving comrades. Some argue in favor of this, first there is mention of the existence of three caches of arms and valuables somewhere in Ukraine, the whereabouts known only to these two, then we have been able to establish that, during the war, Galina and her daughter, Lucy Markno, did set out for Berlin before trying to reach Ukraine. According to Ida Met, both allegedly perished in an air raid, but Kiro Radev told us that he spotted Galina on a Paris bus after the war, though he was not sure enough to approach her. There is no question but that Galina remained loyal to the struggle waged in 1919 to 1921 and that she tried to carry it on by whatever means she had at her disposal. Let us move on now to the vices and various shortcomings ascribed to Markno's personality and begin with his old comrade Piotr Arshinov who, in his history of the Maknavist movement first lists many obvious qualities before coming to his main fault, Markno's alleged ignorance of matters historical and political, and his lack of adequate grounding in theory. Given the part that Markno played in it, these shortcomings would have had a serious impact on the whole movement. Arshinov also mentions a complete lack of education and a degree of nonchalance, especially in the autumn of 1919 when the Bolsheviks reinvaded Ukraine. He cites no other examples or specific case to back up his remarks, from which we must deduce that he took Markno to task for not having taken sufficient precautions against Moscow and not having really opposed that second compact with the Red Army. It might have been interesting had he let us in on his own position, for it would appear that he was part of the movement at this point. In any case, as we have seen, Markno, acting alone, never at any time arrived at any decision binding upon the movement as a whole, in which case, Arshinov's reproach applies equally to the other insurgents. Note that at the time, Bolshevism was a new phenomenon and that few were conversant with Lenin's career as a militant, his double talk and his Jacobin Blanquist views. Many another revolutionary, Bolsheviks included, let themselves be taken in. Even though they were university graduates or had taken lengthy party courses and this was true also and not least of the anarchists. Kropotkin himself had entertained illusions about the Leninist regime. Also, we do not share Arshinov's opinion of Markno's education and his political and historical knowledge. He was not as bereft of these as all that as we have had occasion to note. Consequently, this failing does not stand up, unless Arshinov was willing to say more about it and focus attention, say, on the treatment mitted out to the White's plenipotentiaries hardly in keeping with the usual conventions or take Markno to task for having abdicated his responsibilities in June 1919 by deferring to Trotsky, or even for having underestimated the Ukrainian nationalist factor. That would be at once too much and not enough, so we shall stick to the single example that Arshinov does cite. Volein repeats the fault pointed out by Arshinov and tax on certain reproaches of his moral qualities and moral duties, in which Markno and his comrades were deficient, he looks upon this as the movement's dark side. He has heard tell that certain commanders, Kurilenko is mentioned most often, were morally better equipped than Markno to lead and steer the movement as a whole. Unfortunately, Volein did not know Kurilenko and could not offer any personal opinion of him which somewhat brings his hearsay testimony into question. On the other hand, he puts Markno's carelessness down to alcohol abuse, his greatest failing. Curiously, this failing showed itself morally. In Markno, the inebriated state showed itself primarily in the moral domain. Physically, he was not unsteady on his feet. But under the influence of alcohol, he became perverse, overexcitable, unfair, intractable and violent. Let us leave it up to Volein to determine the difference between a moral and a physical state of intoxication and just deplore the fact that he waited until Markno was dead before ventilating this charge, which we think unlikely for the reasons we noted earlier. 
while I'm targets another great fault in Markno and many of his closest associates, their attitude towards women. Allegedly, they forced certain women to participate in sorts of orgies. This very grave charge is categorically rebutted by Ida Met, Markno had told her, that he could have had any woman he chose in his glory days, but that in reality he did not have the spare time to devote to a personal life. He told me this by way of refuting the legend of orgies that had allegedly been organized by and for him. Wallein in his book rehearses the same claptrap. In reality, Markno was celibate, or rather chaste. As for his relations with women, I would have said that there was in him a combination of a sort of peasant simplicity and a respect for womankind that was typical of turn-of-the-century Russian revolutionary circles. Let us add that Isaac Tepper, an abat anarchist who spent some months as a participant in the movement, cites in his study the case of the Maknavist commander Puzinov who had raped a nurse and been brought before an insurgent tribunal. Markno had allegedly been insistent that he should be shot and it was only on a majority vote that he was merely relieved of his command and placed in the front lines, where he was killed shortly afterwards. Let us not forget, either, the presence of Galina Kuzmenko or other insurgents who would never have stood for such an attitude toward themselves or other women. Wallein also speaks of personal caprices, or dictatorial antics, arbitrariness, absurd outbursts and brainstorms, as well as of a sort of military clique or cabal surrounding Markno. Here again he fails to mention many hard facts and these charges seem above all to have been prompted by personal rancor. For what reason did Volein seek to besmirch the memory of his co-religionist? To be sure he had been a participant in the insurgent movement only for four months and his opinion was valued for only that space of time, and one might discern in this personal enmity the antagonism between talker and door, in short between the gossip and the activist. For her part, Ida Met certifies that not only did Markno have no liking for Volein, but had no respect for him, regarding him as a worthless, characterless individual. Which probably accounts for Volein's attitude. Ida Met speaks of the failings that she was able to discern in the emigre Markno, emigration being the only time she had any dealings with him. In particular she stresses his extreme incredulity and diffidence, even towards his closest friends who wished him well. She reckoned that his attitude was a pathological consequence of Nestor's military activities. She also found him to be a cantankerous character, and detected a measure of hostility towards intellectuals, towards whom he allegedly felt a degree of envy. According to her, he had also been jealous of the careers of Voroshilov and Bodieni. It would appear that she had some difficulty in translating into good French, this resentment on Markno's part towards these individuals and intellectuals whom he could see right through, ever since his days in the Butaki prison. Magalevsky, quoted earlier, tells us that in Gulyai Poly in 1917, he heard Markno tell the peasants, after sitting through the speechifying of local notables and bigwigs, do not believe what these intellectuals tell you, they are the enemies of ordinary folk. On the other hand, we saw him in Ekaterinoslav lamenting the inadequate numbers of intellectuals in the movement. In his ABC of the Revolutionary Anarchist, he notes that, out of every ten intellectuals who move towards the oppressed toilers, nine will seek to pull the wall over their eyes, but the tenth will be their friend and will help them to avoid deception by the others, which in our view is a good general estimate. Thus he did not wholly embrace the critical theses expounded with regard to intellectuals by the Russian Paul Machesky whom he was to encounter on his trip to Moscow in the spring of 1918. In trying to defend Markno's memory against Volein's charges, Ida Met also revealed her own confusion on certain points. Indeed, among some assertions that seem well-founded, some evaluations appear very shallow, quote. Was Markno an honest man seeking the good of the people, or was he a maverick who chanced to fall from the heavens? My reckoning is that his social goodwill was sincere and above question. He was an innately gifted politician and threw himself into stratagems which were often out of proportion with his limited political knowledge. However, I believe that he was perfectly at home in the role of popular avenger. As for knowing what he and his class wanted and hoped for, that was indeed the Maknavist movement's Achilles' heel, but it was a weakness shared by the whole of peasant Russia of whatever persuasion. They wanted freedom and land, but how were they to use these two things? 
that was more difficult to determine. End quote. Such incomprehension of the nature and goals of the Machnavists is the Achilles heel of Ida Met herself, a young Lithuanian Jew and city dweller, a newcomer to revolutionary circles, unfamiliar with the INS and outs of the clashes in Ukraine. Let us just mention the rather bizarre assessment of Louis Dorlet, alias Samuel Virgin, author, in Le Libertaire, of a eulogistic obituary piece on Markno, he wrote us that he had seen, Markno two or three times. He was a bore that believed in holding nothing back. And ourselves, what might we criticize in Markno or take him to task for? For a start, there was his serious underestimation of the Ukrainian national factor, as he later acknowledged in exile. His ignorance of the Ukrainian language and culture served him ill, although the rather Russified southern Ukraine had been more receptive to the general concerns of Russia. For instance, he made the mistake of initiating a fight against the Ukrainian nationalists without properly dissociating himself from Muscovite imperialism. A modus vivendi with the Petli Eurists could have enabled Machnavists to devote themselves better to the fight against the white and red invaders. As a result, a more discriminatory evaluation of the danger posed by the different enemy forces, and he patently underestimated the Bolsheviks in this context, might have wrought a complete change in the course of events. Yet these shortcomings cannot be imputed to Markno alone, for anarchist doctrine too had neglected the national factor and the hegemonic ambitions of the Jacobin Leninists. That leaves his excessively severe treatment of certain marauders or perpetrators of antisocial acts, he systematically had them hanged or shot. Aside from this trait, it appears to us that he acted for the best, in conjunction with the insurgent masses and the precepts of libertarian communism. Thus, Koval, a Russian anarchist who had been an active participant in the 1917 revolution, reckons that men such as Markno are very rare and appear only once a century. One obituary saw him as the incarnation of the struggle against all tyrannies and four, the transformation of our servile world into a free society without masters or slaves. Lipatkin, author of another obituary notice predicts that when the Russian people overthrow the Bolsheviks' dictatorship, they will remember with pride and love their most courageous and most authentic combatants, among whom Nestor Markno will be well to the fore. 29. The Machnavists. Most observers, eyewitnesses and historians of the civil war in Ukraine are agreed in acknowledging the representative nature of the Machnavist movement as far as the peasant population, and especially its poorest stratum, are concerned. There is in existence a rather telling breakdown of the Machnovskinist social composition. In figures quoted by Kubinin, relating to insurgents who allegedly applied in April 1921 to take advantage of the Bolshevik authorities. Amnesty, in fact, they were probably taken prisoner and forced, under threat of execution, to go over formally to the regime, we find that, of 265 Machnavist insurgents, 117 had no land at all either because they had been farm laborious before the revolution or because they had been workers, or because the Reds had confiscated their land. 91 insurgents worked a plot of less than 4 hectares an area regarded as the minimum necessary to support a household and only 57 owned larger tracts. Such evidence invalidates the description Kulak has applied to the movement by Trotsky and the official authorities and instead backs up Markno's claims about the poor peasant profile of the movement. These rural proletarians, we might say slaves bound to the soil, were descendants of the peasants reduced to serfs by Catherine II and cheated after the abolition of serfdom in 1862, when they had been forced to buy back the land which they had always worked. In addition, they had been joined by a number of workers who had been driven out of the towns by penury, chaos and arbitrary policing organized by the Leninists. In organizational terms, the insurgent army relied upon a network of local detachments which, according to the numbers of their fighters and the extent of their activities, became regiments bearing the name of their places of origin. Kubinin, for instance, talks about the 6th Ekaterinoslav Regiment. Thus, these units were homogeneous, which made it hard to plant troublesome or suspect elements in them. Volunteer service was the very essence of the movement. Although it and captured Machnavists the worst of treatment, not for them the extenuating grounds of compulsory mobilization. It goes without saying that, as volunteers, insurgents received no pay, 
Although the Red Army, during the lifespans of the two alliances, had sought to place them on a payroll. Consequently their entire upkeep was dependent upon the voluntary contributions of the local populace. Furthermore, most of the insurgents were not mobilized on a permanent basis, they had to go home to perform the requisite farm labors, provided of course that circumstances on the front allowed and that they had the agreement of their military leadership. This status as peasant soldiers defending their land and their liberty is reminiscent of that of their Zaporog peasant forebears, and the similarity carried over into the partisan warfare tactics that wrought such havoc among their opponents. Thus, Kubanin stresses the extreme mobility of the Machnavist cavalry, covering an average of 60 to 100 kilometers a day, whereas regular cavalry covered only 40, and, on very rare occasions, 60 kilometers. Such a pace was possible only with the support of the population and the painstaking organization of fresh mounts at certain agreed staging posts. Outriders, having swapped their tired mounts for fresh horses and resting up, would drop back into the rear guard. This switchover came into play in engagements, Kubanin describes its devastating results, quote. Whenever red troops brought severe pressure to bear on the Machnavist army, the latter often beat a hasty retreat, striving to vanish from the enemy's field of vision, then promptly attacking his rear having taken care to leave one unit up ahead to serve as bait for the Reds. It was through such swift, forceful, unexpected onslaughts that the Reds often found themselves beaten. Just when a Red unit thought that it had defeated the Machnavists and went to cap its success by giving chase, it often found itself in fact under attack from the rear. If that approach failed, the Machnavists, under constant pressure from the enemy, used to split their units into different groups, scattering in every direction, thereby completely disorienting the enemy. Sometimes these groups would split themselves up into regiments, regiments into sotnias and so on down to quite tiny tactical units. By 1921 the whole of Ukraine teamed with such Machnavist detachments sometimes corning together into a single force sometimes scattering themselves throughout the countryside again and, burying their weapons, reverting into peaceable villages. End quote. These were typically Cossack tactics and the Machnavists may be deemed nothing short of anarchy's Cossacks, so reminiscent were their methods of the methods of their ancestors. Kubanin takes the line that this had more to do with peasant cunning, both because he knew nothing or wished to know nothing of similarities with the Zaporogs, and because he confounded such fighting methods with those of the peasantry generally. Not that the insurgents scorned the latter, however, the partisan Osipt Sebri supplies us with one rather striking example. In 1918 some peasants from the Jmarinka region, of western Ukraine, were in the habit of going out into the fields, hiding their rifles and machine guns among their wheat, a passing patrol or small unit of Austro-Germans or Varta would suddenly find itself attacked and wiped out by the peasants who, in order to shift suspicion, wasted no time in alerting the relevant command to a detachment of origins unknown having been responsible for the raid. The whole tactics of the Machnavist detachments on campaign were based on extreme mobility, itself down to the quality of the mounts often the horses of German settlers, which were renowned for their sturdiness and to the courage of the individual fighter. Yefimov a Red Army military expert charged with combating the Makhnovskina, quite rightly stresses the differences between the Red Army trooper and the Makhnovist insurgent. In the case of the former, the common soldier finds his idiosyncrasies and qualities leveled out by absorption into the generality which led to one of two extremes in engagements, either an infectious enthusiasm if the situation was favorable, or a general despondency and mass surrender by every unit in the event of misfortune. The Machnavist's performance, though, was something else again, by reason of his experience of partisan warfare or of the social conditions of his existence, the Machnavist is possessed of highly developed personal qualities, he feels wholly independent, everywhere. Even in combat, his favorite order of cavalry attack is the lava which affords every combatant maximum autonomy. His personal qualities as a fighting man ensure that he does not lose his head in the most dangerous moments nor does he have to await specific instructions, he knows what he has to do, there is no need for him to be called to order and under constant supervision. That writer also points out that a fair number of insurgents had seen service in the Russo-German war and had emerged from it with solid, experience of weapons and of coming under fire. 
We may add that the common effort against all the invaders and enemies of every hue was a strong bond connecting the insurgents, they called one another Bratishkis, little brothers. Abetted in this way by social motives and its taste for independence, this ragamuffin army, sourcing its weapons wholly from the enemy, was able to pull off remarkable feats in defeating modern well-equipped whole armies of Germans, Austro-Hungarians, Ukrainian nationalists, white Cossacks, and to keep the Red Army at bay for a long time. Another important feature of the Maknavist movement was the youthfulness of the insurgents, most of whom were less than 25 years of age. On this point, Cuban in quotes an interesting statistic, regarding the 5th Ekaterinoslav Regiment towards the end of 1919, of 253 insurgents, 72 were aged 20 or less, 126 were aged between 21 and 25, 51 between 26 and 30, and only four of them were over 30 years of age. So there was a certain osmosis between the experienced fighters and the youngest volunteers. The older adults and adolescents did play their part in the movement, however, either by keeping it continually briefed on the enemy deployment or by hiding the detachment's arms and munitions, thereby representing a novel sort of rearguard. Nor were young girls and women idle, several thousands of them acted as couriers or intelligence agents or looked after the supply and medical services. When Ekaterinoslav was occupied in 1919, Gutman, whom we have already mentioned, was curious to find some young Amazons, dressed in black, entering the town along with the bulk of the Maknavist troops, he described them as intellectual anarchists. Broadly speaking, Maknavist units contained few women, it was only in 1919 when the units retreated as the whites advanced, that many women joined their convoys either accompanying relatives or companions, or to escape violation by the oncoming Cossacks. Here, let us point out that the Russian Civil War, like all civil wars generally, was hellish for most women, a matter on which most historians are discreet to the point of silence. As far as the whites were concerned, women were part of the booty, especially if they happened to be Jewish or related to insurgents and here the presumption was generally enough and were systematically raped. Where the Reds were concerned, they were generally spared this fate, but it depended on the unit commanders and whom they were forced to billet. Elsewhere in the country or in Russia, women were obliged to give themselves simply to get past Czechist checkpoints, or to secure passage on a train, or to obtain a morsel of food. In view of this situation, there was a terrible upsurge in venereal diseases and rampant demoralization among the female population. The wife or sweetheart of any well-known insurgent was especially targeted. Galina Kuzmenko tells how the wife of Nestor's oldest brother, Sava Markno, was tortured cruelly and at some length by white officers in June 1919. They beat her, stabbed her with their bayonets, cut off one of her breasts and only then did they shoot her. Czechists too tormented one insurgent's wife and, in the end, shot her down with her infant in her arms, Markno ordered Kirilenko to hunt down and punish these criminals, which he did, personally, shortly afterwards. Another thing the insurgents had in common with the Zaporov Cossacks was the unalterable principle that various command positions were elective. In its mobilization call on April 10, 1919, the Third Guliaipoli Congress issued a reminder about the need to elect both regimental and other unit commanders at all levels, it recommended that competent persons be appointed, preferably ones conversant with military tactics due to their service in the Russo-German War. All units had to assemble in a pre-agreed location, line up in columns and proceed with elections in strict conformity with regulations. Both Yefimov and Kubanin stress the presence of former Tsarist army NCOs among the Maknavist commanders, these had, borne all the brunt of the imperialist war, Kubanin notes that they had, furnished Bodieni to the Red Army and a whole series of talented commanders to Markno. According to him, the, Maknavist's subtle and supple tactics required commanders in, whom their detachments could have boundless confidence, commanders who were daring, wily and, experienced, as the facts demonstrated their commanders to be. He stresses that each detachment was a close-knit family, each commander dependent on it insofar as he had been elected by and was answerable to it. However, if need be, the staff could punish commanders by reducing them to the ranks of their unit, by the same token, ranking insurgents were stripped of their mounts and their weapons according to Cuban in most of the commanders were both anarchists and peasants. 
former Tsarist officers whom the Bolsheviks turned into military experts were despised, regarded as useless and, as representatives of the hated order of the Pomieskis and Bourgeois, ruthlessly exterminated. Again according to Kubinin, the supreme body of the insurgent army was its military revolutionary Soviet, elected at a general assembly of all insurgents. Neither the overall command of the army nor Markno himself truly ran the movement, they merely reflected the aspirations of the mass, acting as its ideological and technical agents. Yefimov is of much the same opinion, the detachments as a rule had every confidence in their elected commanders who, for the most part, were highly courageous men displaying great determination, instigators of military operations, as well as of military and civilian strategies, in concert with the military revolutionary Soviet. This latter, and Markno himself never reached any decision without consideration of the advice or position of the detachments. No decision was ever taken by just one individual. All military matters were debated in common. Usually the military revolutionary Soviet sat in the presence of the army's higher commanders. At every stage of the process, the Maknavist detachment remained the driving force behind the whole movement. The highest positions of responsibility, chief of staff, cavalry commander, commander of the special detachment and of each of the three army corps, were subject to rotation and were filled on a rota basis by the most capable and renowned of the insurgents. This stipulation regarding the collective thinking of the Maknavists, as even official Soviet sources are forced to concede, is of the utmost importance, for certain outside observers, sometimes even anarchists, such as Volein, as we saw earlier, have misrepresented this elective hierarchy as a military camarilla and a dictatorial role played by Markno. Among the most prominent Maknavist commanders, let us first of all turn to Semyon Koretnik, a comrade of Markno's from the earliest days. A highly impoverished peasant, Koretnik had worked as an ostler before the war, during it he became an ensign and the military experience thus acquired was extremely useful to him in the struggle that he waged from the summer of 1918 on. Tall, burly, wearing a small moustache and always dressed in a leather jacket, he might be regarded as the number two strategist of the movement, which owed many of its successes to him. At the time of his execution, he was captured, through treachery, by Bolsheviks who were as afraid of him as they were of Markno, he must have been about 30 years of age. Another of the movement's leading figures, Fedor Schuss, enjoyed among the insurgents a prestige almost equal to Markno's. He too was a poor peasant, the Bolsheviks labeled him a lumpen proletarian from Bolshevik Hylovka, Dubrivka. Having been a sailor during the war, he had become, in 1918, one of the most active members of the anarchist Black Guard of Guliaipoli, before fighting against the Austro-German invaders with some success. Dybets offers a highly colored portrait of him, albeit one bereft of all sympathy for he had had a lot of trouble escaping Schuss after his exploits as a Bolshevik political commissar, quote. He was a tall, strapping figure of a fellow with long black hair. His costume was eccentric, feather in his cap, velvet jacket, boots with spurs and saber by his side. During Markno's banquets, he stayed silent and as motionless as a statue. He honestly thought that he would be immortalized in popular legends and ballads. Once he showed me some verses from some Ukrainian poet eulogizing one of the exploits of Bakoshus when he had, unaided, rendered ten police whores to combat. End quote. According to Dybets, he was a kickboxing and wrestling champion, even had some expertise in jiu-jitsu and could strangle someone with a sudden grip. Point sixteen, tremendously courageous, he was, turn and turn about, a cavalry commander, commander of the cavalry brigade of the 3rd Maknavist Army Corps and a member of the staff. According to the young Ekaterinoslav student mentioned earlier, Schuss had a tendency to race off on frenzied raids which were not always justified and he had to be closely watched. Here he is described as we see him in the photographs available to us, quote, dressed in a hussar's tunic, with sailor's cap, bearing the ship's name, St. John of the Golden Tongue encrusted in gold letters, with a Caucasian dagger and a colt thrust into his belt and two grenades at his side. End quote. In the rather similar account of another witness in 1919, the gold-lettered inscription on the band of his sailor's cap read Free Russia. Oddly, his horse was bedecked with ribbons, flowers, and pearl bracelets at its feet. 
According to A. Nikolaev who must have had it from a reliable source, Shus was also fancy-free and took a very close interest in the prettier insurgent women. Pyotr Petrenko Platonov, another native of Dubrivka was one of the most courageous insurgent commanders, an ensign during the war. He commanded an insurgent front at the end of 1918, acted as Dubenko's chief of staff for a period of two months, in May June 1919, and then was for a long time in charge of the main Makhnovist detachment in 1921. Vasily Kurilenko was another of the movement's stalwarts. Tall, fair-haired and mustachioed he was about 28 years old in 1919, powerfully built, a born horseman of tremendous daring. He was a cobbler from Novospasovka and had been an anarchist since 1910. Dybet speaks very favorably of him, although he appears to have been oblivious of his very active work among the insurgents in that he boasts about the man's gifts as a soldier and leader of men but credits him with sympathies for the Reds which he certainly could not have entertained, given the fate reserved for residents of his hometown by the Reds, as described to us by dissident general Grigorenko. Victor Belash, a 26-year-old worker from the same area was an exceptionally talented military organizer. It was he who planned many of the operations and who was for a long time the insurgent army's chief of staff and its last commander, before capture by the Red Army. While in prison he wrote extensive memoirs, three sizable exercise books were filled, of which we have had only a very brief extract published in the Ukrainian Communist Party's historical review Letterpis Historiae, according to Kubanin, he also wrote a treatise on the civil war. In this way he fought to the last with his pen, before being shot in 1923. We might, point out that, to take revenge on the partisans, the Austrians shot his father, grandfather, and cousin, before setting their home on fire. Viktor Popov held positions of great responsibility in the movement, being the last secretary of the insurgents' military revolutionary Soviet and undeniably deserves to be rescued from oblivion. A black sea sailor aged about 25 in 1919, he was a member of the left social revolutionaries and directed his party's revolt against the Bolsheviks in Moscow in July 1918. The rising failed, just largely on account of the mercy shown to arrested Bolsheviks and Czechists, Jerzynski among them and of the rebels dithering over an attack upon the building containing Lenin and his party's central committee. In the forlorn hope that they might carry the day by moral pressure alone, they shrank from shedding the blood of their brethren. A fatal error, for Bolsheviks had no such hesitation or scruples. In 1919, Viktor Popov fought against Denikinist troops alongside a detachment of his fellow party members in Ukraine, before going over to the Makhnovists in April 1919. According to Tepper, whose version is accepted by Kubanin, Popov allegedly had pledged his undying hatred of the Bolshevik communists and had set himself a target of 300 of them to be killed at his own hands only two-thirds of which figure he achieved. If this is true, it would appear astonishing that he should have been the one who went with Kurilenko to negotiate the second alliance with the Red Army, and even more startling that he should have remained several weeks in Kharkov in the lion's den, before being arrested and shot by the Chika through Moscow's treachery. Kubanin overstates his case by describing him as the most ferocious opponent of any compact with the Bolsheviks. Although a bitter enemy of the Leninists, whom he could not forgive for having betrayed the revolutionary aspirations of the 1917 revolution, he must nonetheless have believed in their bona fides at the time of the second compact with the Makhnovists and was content, as many another revolutionary was, to fight them with the written and spoken word. Tepper mentions meetings organized in Kharkov in October-November 1920, and refers to articles in the Makhnovist voice in which Popov gave the Bolsheviks a dressing down. There is little material available to us on the other commanders and military leaders of the Makhnovist insurgent movement. However let us mention some figures more deserving than such heroes of the revolution as the Bolsheviks have turned into mummies, Alexander Kalashnikov, worker's son, NCO during the war. Secretary in 1917 of the Guliapoli Libertarian Communist Group. He was behind the 58th Division's defection to the anti Bolshevik cause at Pomoshnaya in August 1919. Pyotr Gavrilenko, whose crucial role in the defeat of Rangel we have already stressed, Milhailov Pavlenko, son of peasants from Central Russia, a Petrograd anarchist who arrived to join the movement at the beginning of 1919 and organized and led its engineer and sapper units. 
Vasily Danilov, a poor peasant from Guliaipoli and Faria, he was in charge of keeping the artillery supplied right from the outset, Alexei Mochenko, another poor Guliaipoli peasant, an anarchist. Since 1907 and a good propagandist, Bondarets, cavalry commander, Garkusha, commander of a special detachment of insurgents, Tykenko, in charge of provisions, Berima, in charge of mines, and the successive commanders of the movement's main detachment. Vdovichenko, Brova, Zabudko, Thomas Kosin, who also commanded the famous machine gunner regiment, Tumak, the movement's treasurer, Krat, head of the economic section, Batko Pravda, probably an alias, an odd figure, an anarchist railway man who lost his legs in an accident severed by a train, looked after transport and was very active. Although Belash has it that he was overfond of the drink and had little taste for collective discipline, Grigory Vasilevsky, a poor peasant from Dulyaipoli closely associated with Markno for whom he acted as deputy on several occasions and served for a time as chief of staff, Klein, a poor German peasant, Dermensi, a daring commander of Georgian extraction, Taranovsky. A member of Guliaipoli's Jewish community, was the movement's last chief of staff, the brothers Ivan and Alexander Lepichenko, active participants in the fight against the Austro-Germans from spring 1918 on, Alexei Chubenko, engine driver, adjutant to Markno and later in charge of the sappers, Seregin, a workman, in charge of supplies for the army. All of these revolutionaries, thrown up by the masses, as best they could to combat all enemies of popular autonomy unfortunately have this in common, they all perished at Bolshevik hands, either in battle or after having been captured by treachery. Others, such as Grigory Markno, who was the insurgent army's chief of staff for a while, or Isidore Petia Laiuti, a painter and decorator, or Boris Veritelnikov, a Guliaipoli foundry worker, who later worked at the famous Putilov plant in Petrograd a very active propagandist and likewise chief of staff for a time, met their deaths in the fight against the whites. Lev Zinkovskizadov, commander of the special detachment, as well as Shak Domachenko, a worker and sometime chief of staff, accompanied Markno into Romania and thence to Poland, after which we lose track of them. One female figure in particular is deserving of attention, Marysia Nikiforova. A working woman, born in Alexandrovsk, she was sentenced to death for terrorist acts in 1905, the sentence being commuted to imprisonment for life. Removed to Siberia, she escaped in 1910, spent some time in Japan, the USA and Western Europe and then went back to Alexandrovsk in 1917, there to set up a Black Guard of Ukraine in conjunction with the Odessa detachments, and detachments in Ekaterinoslav, Elisavetgrad and elsewhere. These Black Guard units harried Ukraine's bourgeoisie and big landlords. In 1919, Marysia Nikiforova joined the Maknavist movement, regarded by Moscow as too much of a wildcat, she was sentenced to a ban on office holding for one year, later cut to six months upon Kamin's intervention at the time of his visit to Markno, as we have seen. More sedentary tasks she found dissatisfying and so she took a hand in the fight against the Denikinists a short time later. Some claim that she was hanged by Slashev in Simpropol in the autumn of 1919, but in the autumn of 1921 we find a certain Marysia heading a detachment fighting against the Reds, though we cannot say for sure that they are the same person. An ardent libertarian, she is sometimes depicted as dressing entirely in black and galloping on a white horse at the head of 1,500 fanatical horsemen. We might also reveal the presence of a Frenchman, a certain Roger, referred to simply as the Frenchman by Tepper and by Marcel Body. This Roger, it would seem, had guts and was a hard man who had had some brushes with the French courts and had deserted from the French Expeditionary Corps in Russia. He had spent several months with the Maknavist movement and could not stop singing Markno's praises, so much so that Volein wanted to introduce him to Lenin so that he could repeat his favorable comments about the Ukrainian insurgents. By the end of spring 1919, Roger was in the Bolshevik camp and was foisted upon Podvoisky, the Ukrainian commissar for war, at Marcel Body's recommendation, as leader of a detachment of Belgian armored cars which had been lying idle since the armistice, and he took part in bitter fighting against the whites. Subsequently, he dabbled in shadier business, in the cheek as hire or manipulated by them, before vanishing into the maw of the system, 
and was never able to go home to France, because, as Marcel Body has it, he knew too much. In a civilian capacity, a number of teachers took part in the Machnavist movement and in its social and economic organizational ventures. Some of them paid dearly for this, Galina Kuzmenko quotes the case of the brothers Yefim and Daniel Maratsenko, as well as Daniel's wife all three teachers in Pest Shanibrod, the town where Galina was born, who were shot by the Reds in the summer of 1919 on account of their Machnavist beliefs. Another teacher, Cherna Nizny, from the Pavlograd region, was returned as chairman of the Military Revolutionary Soviet by the Second Gulyaipoli Regional Congress. After the collapse of the front in June 1919, he was outlawed and wanted by both Reds and Whites. He appears to have played a part of prime significance in defining the movement's objectives. A medical team was established with the help of doctors and nurses and at the time of the occupation of Ekaterinoslav there was an attempt to train male and female nurses to render first aid. Again we might mention the existence of Ballad of the Machnavists written by a Russian anarchist by the name of Ivan Kartashev and modelled on the lyrics and music of the celebrated old Ballad of Stenka Razin. So, there are several elements which help to identify the social and military character of the Machnavist insurgent movement, the fact that it was representative of the rural proletariat, to which most of its members belonged, its self-organization and direct democracy strongly reminiscent of Zaporog libertarian traditions, and the determination to take up arms and fight to the death in defense of its social gains. But what was its relationship with anarchism as preached at the time and what might its possible contributions to libertarian communist theory and practice have been? This is what we are now going to look at. 30. The Machnavist Movement and Anarchism during the years 1917 to 1918 the whole of the eastern Ukraine, fertile ground for the emergence of just such a movement on historical and social grounds, had been troubled by a strong libertarian current. Anatol Gorlik, the then secretary of the Ekaterinoslav-based anarchist bureau for the Donets Basin, offers us an impressive picture of this overpowering activity. Hundreds of anarchist militants were at work inside various labor organizations and enjoyed much popularity among the masses, in Ekaterinoslav, the secretaries of the trade unions of the metal workers, bakers, shoemakers, garment makers, woodworkers, millers, and even more were anarchists. They also had a considerable foothold in the city's factory and workshop committees. So much so that in October 1917, when the Bolshevik coup d'etat was carried out, an 80,000-strong demonstration was organized, headed by the city's anarchist federation and the libertarian labor militants from the main local plant, the Bryansk plant where Markno had also worked in 1907, the crowd marched behind unfurled black flags. This surge of enthusiasm from the workers was unbounded for several weeks, until the Bolsheviks' freedom-stifling activities began to have their noxious effect, quote. At the time of a general regional conference, Many delegates from the factory and workshop committees sought out the anarchists to ask them to help the workers to take the whole of production in hand. For three days and three nights ordinary workers sat to consider the issue. The Bolsheviks needed all of their influence, denial of the necessary funding, raw materials, supplies, transportation, etc., to bring the Ekaterinoslav workers to heal and secure recognition for the authority of statist bureaucrats. The same thing was repeated in other large cities such as Kharkov, Odessa, Kiev, Mariupol, Rostov, Petrograd, Moscow, and Irkutsk. The masses were permeated with anarchist propaganda, through discussions, meetings, and debates. So great and so imperious were the thirst for reading and the itch to understand what was going on, that in many villages, in the summertime, at the end of a hard day's work, the peasants would come together and spend hours at a time listening to books read aloud to them. In the province of Kiev, I happened to see some anarchist newspapers circulate through three districts, so well thumbed that the print was now barely legible, but the young peasants read them from cover to cover nonetheless. In the Ukrainian countryside, I came upon certain peasants who had read the whole of the anarchist literature in Russian, from Sterner to Tucker, and had a grasp of theory as good as, if not better than professional politicians. End quote. In the year 1918 alone, 
Gorlick was in ongoing correspondence with no less than 1,400 villages in the region. He reckoned that, had anarchists wanted to recruit for an anarchist party in the Donetsk Basin, they could have counted on members by the hundreds of thousands. Yet he stresses a huge dark cloud hanging over such promise, the absence of many anarchist militants, especially the ones who had returned from exile abroad and who were looked up to as the anarchist intelligentsia. For one thing they nearly all settled in the big cities and in the capitals of the paper revolution, as Markno had it, Petrograd and Moscow, and then again and more especially they actively collaborated with the Bolsheviks even to the extent of joining so-called Soviet institutions or indeed the Bolshevik party itself, rather than helping to create a broadly based specifically libertarian front, quote. The lying big talk of Lenin and other Bolshevik social democrats turned the heads of many anarchists, especially those who were intellectuals, though continuing to be critical of the centralizing Bolsheviks, the latter espoused slogans like in Russian the social revolution has begun, the difference between Bolsheviks and anarchists is as thin as a cigarette paper. Onto anti-state socialism, onto anarchism, through the dictatorship of the proletariat. The intellectual leading lights were not conversant with the masses' state of mind. Only distant echoes from this movement reached their ears, and then mostly in a distorted form. As for them, instead of urging on the toiling masses, instead of adding to their strength and their aspirations, instead of making the necessary analyses and supplying clearly libertarian solutions, instead of building upon their libertarian consciousness, a consciousness stirring but neither solidly formed nor crystallized, instead of assisting the theoretical instruction of dynamic young militants, instead of helping to expand the libertarian movement's activities, they devoted themselves to either playing down the inevitable threat of a Bolshevik party dictatorship, or thoroughly immersing themselves in syndicalism or even peddling anarcho-Bolshevism. But nowhere did there sound a great summons to the creation of a specifically libertarian front. Had that been done, there would have been a lot fewer casualties and the results of libertarian endeavors would have been better. In any event, the anarchists would not have found themselves under the heel of Bolsheviks, and worker and peasant organizations of libertarian outlook might have been created. But only the libertarian rank and file, more revolutionary than the anarchist leaders, were at work among the masses. Thus, instead of making a theoretical and practical contribution to the problems of founding the country economically upon an anti-statist base, instead of being among the masses to carry on with libertarian endeavor and to answer the worried questioning from the worker and peasant masses regarding the chances of a new for of social relations and of the practices that such implied, many anarchists, especially the anarchist intelligentsia, resolutely defended the Bolsheviks tactic, regarding their presence in power as inevitable, end quote. This paradoxical evolution on the part of anarchist intellectuals and militants of proven metal was in every particular matched by that of their contemporaries in every other revolutionary organization and party Mensheviks, left SRs, center SRs, and right SRs, Bundists, Jewish social democrats, within the context of a socio-economic and historico-political phenomenon that we have analyzed elsewhere. Gorlick speaks of abdication and desertion by the bulk of the intellectual anarchists and contrasts this with the obscure but dogged endeavors of the libertarian rank and file, for all its generally inadequate theoretical equipment. In part, we find this dichotomy again in the Machnavist movement, the intellectuals placed it under the microscope to verify it was truly of the libertarian persuasion, while the rank and file unstintingly got involved in it, especially during the struggle against Denikin, when the insurgents were fighting on the same side as the Bolsheviks. In April 1919, Arshinov arrived in Gulyaipoli along with other anarchists come from Moscow, he promptly breathed life into the Machnavists' cultural section and took charge of publication of their mouthpiece, The Road to Freedom. The following month 36 members of the Ivanovo-Voznesensk anarchist group, Ivanovo-Voznesensk being an important center of the textile industry in Russia lying east of Moscow, joined the movement, with two well-known militants at their head, Chernyakov and Makiv. Dozens of other Ukrainian and Russian militants also showed up, including some members of the Ukrainian Anarchist Confederation, the Nabat, Toxin. Among these were several émigrés returned from England and the United States upon learning of the revolution, Joseph Gottman, Asa Kowalski, and Aaron Baron, Polevoy. 
June 1919, when Moscow broke off the alliance with the insurgents, was a turning point. Two of the more active militants, Berbiga and Mikhailov Pavlenko, the latter a Petrograd anarchist who had come to put his engineering skills at the disposal of the Maknavists, were seized along with several dozen insurgents and shot by Voroshilov and the Militopol Chika, on Trotsky's orders. Jacob Glaxon, Kasimir Kovalevich, Kramer and other libertarians in the Maknavist movement or from Ukraine pledged themselves to avenge the murder of their comrades. First of all they traveled to Kharkov, intending to execute Rakovsky, Piatikov and other Ukrainian Bolshevik leaders, before deciding to strike in Moscow against the very head of the system. They settled in the capital and surreptitiously organized themselves, contacting some left SRs and maximalists who were equally keen to avenge party colleagues whom the Leninists had shot. They carried out a number of expropriations against state banks in order to fund their schemes. They aimed to dynamite the Chika headquarters in Moscow, followed by the Kremlin. The explosives were ready when a golden opportunity presented itself. A regional assembly was scheduled to meet on September 25, 1919 at the Moscow Committee's headquarters in Leontiev Lane and the main Bolshevik leaders would be present. Lenin himself was due to attend. One of the terrorists, the left Essa Chirpaninov was quite conversant. With the place and on his instructions Pyotr Sobolev threw a high explosive bomb just as the meeting was getting underway but before Lenin had shown up. Twelve Bolsheviks, including the secretary of the Moscow Committee, Zagursky, were killed and another 28 wounded, including Bukharin, Pokrovsky, Stiklov, Yaroslavsky, Shlyapnikov, Olminsky, etc. A short time later the attack was claimed by a pan-Russian insurgent committee, in the name of the Third Social Revolution, it stipulated that it had avenged the Maknavists shot on June 17 and that the immediate task before it was to wipe the regime of the commissarocracy and Chakers off the face of the earth, and establish thereafter a pan-Russian and free federation of unions of the toilers and oppressed masses. The clandestine anarchists published two issues of a newspaper, Anarchy, and several handbills such as No Time to Lose, The Truth About the Maknovskina and Where is the Way Out. There they framed a rabid criticism of the Leninist regime, quote, You are in power in Russia, but what has changed? The factories and the land are still not in the toilers' hands but in that of the boss state. Wage slavery, the fundamental evil of the bourgeois order, is still in existence, as a result, hunger, cold and unemployment are inevitable. On account of the need to put up with everything for the sake of a better future, and to defend that which is already won, a huge bureaucratic machine has been set up, the right to strike abolished, and freedoms of speech, assembly and the press have been stamped out. It is our belief that you, personally and subjectively, may have the best of intentions, but objectively and by nature you are representatives of the class of bureaucrats and functionaries, of a band of unproductive intellectuals. End quote. Obviously such actions and declarations were of a sort to discomfort those anarchist personalities who had been flirting with the Bolshevik regime. And so certain indiscretions followed. Two months later, Kovalevich and Sobolev were surprised by some Czechists. They used revolvers and grenades to defend themselves before blowing themselves up with dynamite. Six other members of their organization, also pinned down in a house, blew themselves up as well. Eight others were taken into custody by the Chika who extracted confessions before shooting them. The panicked authorities were startled to uncover tentacles of these clandestine anarchists even in the ranks of the Red Army and the Communist Party itself. At the same time, the Nabat threw its whole weight solidly behind the Maknavist movement, depicting it as the executive arm of the Third Social Revolution. The Nabat was a force to be reckoned within Ukraine. It had its headquarters in Ekaterinoslav, in the same building and on the same landing, as the Bolsheviks. Unfortunately the fight against the Whites had absorbed nearly all of its membership, a fair number of whom never made it back from the fields of battle. Several militants of some repute nonetheless joined up with the Maknavists but, in most cases, for no more than a few days. Markno later referred to this intermittent presence by writing that the Insurgent peasant masses liked and trusted those whom they saw in their ranks not just to spread the glad tidings there but also brandishing a rifle, as capable as anybody else of fighting and suffering on the cause's behalf. 
Thus he deplored the fact that many urban anarchists had often vanished just as suddenly as they had appeared, and from this he concluded that when all was said and done, the impact of these tourists could not have been weaker, and that all the theoretical and organizational work had been left up to the poor peasants, anarchists from Guliapoli and district, among them every one of the commanders and post holders named in the last chapter. Thus it was they who carried the whole burden of the movement. Dybets corroborates this evaluation by stating that Volin, though chairman of the military revolutionary Soviet at this time, had no real influence over Markno who paid more heed to the lowliest commander of the tiniest band of insurgents, not to mention his staff, at whose beck and he was at all times and whose opinion alone counted in his eyes. Even so, we should specify that, in the context of the time, the military situation was the only one necessitating consultation, for one thing, and then again Markno was very careful not to meddle in civilian issues which were left to the military revolutionary Soviet. To be sure, neither the Free Soviets nor the insurgent army, with all that this implies, hierarchy, albeit elective, command, discipline, fighting and execution of enemies, were consonant with the anarchist teaching peddled hitherto, although Bakunin would probably not have disowned these methods of struggle. Following publication of Arshinov's book, several anarchist commentators were quick to seize upon those controversial or contradictory points. What line did they take? The first to open the debate was Mark Mrachny, a one-time Nabat member deported from Russia in 1922 who had spent only a day or two among the Maknavists. In July 1923 in Workers' Road, the Berlin published mouthpiece of the Russian anarcho-syndicalists, he lashed into the Maknovskina, loosing off a few arrows at it. He claimed that Bakko Markno's role and that of his movement had been overrated by certain anarchists to the detriment of the role of the working class which stood accused of reformist and moderate tendencies. This, he argued, was an absurd heretical view, the revolution could not but be a workers' revolution and the handiwork of the workers themselves, especially in respect of the building of a new, rational economy. Mrachny then wanders off into biblical quotations to demonstrate that manual and intellectual workers should expect salvation of none but themselves, and that there would be no Caesars, nor tribunes, nor Bacco. However anarchist, this libertarian enunciation of the obvious goes on, coming along to help out the international, and no, insurgent army, even should it be made up of folk like Bakunin and Kropotkin. In a review of Arshinov's book in the same issue of the paper, Mrachny emerges from such abstract considerations to express the view that Arshinov would have done better to report what he had seen and experienced firsthand, rather than writing a complete history of the movement, he singles out the attacks on intellectuals and labels the Maknavist movement military anarchism whose impact upon the Russian workers' movement would ultimately have been damaging. He then asserts that, the Maknovskina, so mighty and victorious against the white reaction, weakened, melted away and decomposed whenever it had to deal with the Red Reaction, when it sought to direct its blows against the Communist Party's dictatorship. He criticizes the execution of Glushenko, the repentant Czechist, and of the white emissaries, then wonders in what way the insurgents' counter-espionage differed from that of the Chica or the white counterpart. Likewise he stigmatizes the dictatorial role of the Bakko, the anarchist authorities of the Maknavists, and records the privileged status of cavalry in the Maknavist army. All in all, the Maknavist movement for all its verbiage strikes him closer to the left Essars than to the anarchists. With free Soviets the transitional period was being granted citizen status and, he concludes paradoxically, 100% anarchist is not achievable immediately, especially not by some dark cavalry raid. In March 1924, Viet Kudeli in a lengthy review of Arshinov's book, takes the opposite line to Mrachny, if the Bolsheviks and Italian fascists emerged victorious from their civil wars, this was only because they had annihilated their adversaries' armed forces, so anarchism will only be able to defeat the state if it in turn annihilates all statist armed forces. No trade union can accomplish this and all threats of general strikes and other bombast will in any case be nothing more than a cardboard sabre. Only an army of partisans will be able to encompass destruction of the state. Kudeli goes on at length about this military aspect in order to acknowledge the Maknavist movement's important contribution, and he expresses the hope that some participant in the movement will manage to write a military history of the Maknovskina. On the other hand, 
he is on Rachni's side regarding free Soviets, reckoning that the left SRs there had imposed their notion of an informal state with diffused powers. Furthermore, he reckons that the supreme organ of the insurgents, their general congress, is only a pale imitation of the constituent assembly. In his view the insurgents' theoretical draft declaration is in fact a draft of the establishment of a Maknavist state founded upon decentralization and diffusion of power, these free Soviets. He too speaks of an anarchist power and wonders if anarchist society has any need of general congresses to pronounce upon anything at all. It has as its sole constitution only the unfettered initiative of individuals and groups, it is set up only through the creative endeavors of the masses, groups, and individuals and not through the legislative action of congresses, even should these be non-party. Finally, he welcomes only the military side of the movement, this being quintessentially Bakuninist and repudiates the civilian side which is stained with left SR statism, leading on to anarchist authorities. E. Z. Dolanin Moravsky also published an anarchist critique of Arshinov, taking the notion of free Soviets violently to task. Indeed, he detected the birth of an army of parasitical bureaucrats through these agencies, which by his reckoning indubitably represent a sort of state, decidedly more appropriate to the more honest of the Bolshevik Marxists than to anarchists. Arshinov's reproach to the Russian anarchists, that they did not adequately participate in or support the Maknavist movement, he turns around. Anarchism cannot rely upon bayonets, it can only be the product of mankind's spiritual cultivation, he goes on, whilst not denying the interest of insurrections or of the Maknovskina which may be necessary but are not sufficient for the creation of a new human culture. By contrast, he raves indignantly against executions of unarmed folk, Pornieskis, white, envoys, that repentant Czechist, an insurgent charged with having put up an antisemitic poster, and, even Ataman Grigorov, for, he asserts, it is not with the bullet that people are to be educated or re-educated. In this regard, he considers Maknavists no better than the Bolsheviks. Let us straight away offer a corrective to this objection of the angelic variety, whereas violence is not an end in itself, it seems nonetheless more pardonable in the oppressed than in the oppressor, and in the case of the Maknavist movement, the distinction between former and latter is instantaneously discernible and so we can know what is afoot, without wondering if perhaps the other cheek should not have been turned to the blows from the Austro-Germans, Ukrainian chauvinists of the Varta, Bolsheviks, Denikinists, and other aggressors against the laboring populace. Dolanin's piece closes on a crucial question, how could the Maknavists have concluded a second alliance with the Bolsheviks, when lots of Russian anarchists had seen through these and distanced themselves from them? He regrets that the insurgents had come to their senses too late and had at last begun to sweep all the Bolshevik criminals and bandits from the face of the earth. And he cites this tardiness as a probable cause of the movement's failure. Naturally these criticisms and objections drew replies from Arshinov and from Markno himself. Arshinov was to devote two lengthy articles to an item-by-item -item rebuttal of the points raised. For a start, he explained how it had been necessary to publish a documented history of the movement, the available information was too partial and too inadequate for a complete picture of the Maknovskina to be formed. He was amazed that the criticisms, which of course were no more than was to be expected of enemies should be coming from Russian anarcho-syndicalists, Mrachny in particular, an ex-member of the Nabat now advocating a transitional economy and political stage for the revolution. He brought up Mrachny's contradictory statements about 100% instantaneous anarchism, about the transitional stage in the shape of free Soviets and his use of the term military anarchism. And he reframed the most important point, quote, The insurgent army was indeed set up by the peasants and workers themselves to defend their territory and rights against the many enemy forces aspiring to enslave them. The, Maknovskina has denied all statism and aspired to the building of a free society on the basis of the social independence, solidarity and self-direction of the toilers. End quote. Claiming that most of the left SRs and maximalists, swept along by the libertarian current, became anarchists and that their influence upon the movement and party or faction had consequently been nil, only ignorance of the movement could explain such allegations.
The argument to the effect that the Maknavist movement had been lame in its opposition to the Bolsheviks was taking up the Bolsheviks' contentions about the insurgents being broken up by the Red Army. But this contention did not hold water, because if, unlike the white and foreign reactionary armies, the Communist Party's Red Army had managed unaided to defeat the Maknovskina, proletarian history would judge it all more harshly. Arshinov also took exception to Mrach's claim about the decomposition of the movement. Up until the very last day of its existence, the movement fought with rare heroism for the basic notion of social revolution, and it was essentially for that very reason that the Bolsheviks had treacherously turned on it. How come the Maknovskina had been defeated by Bolshevism? One might come up with many reasons as valid for anarchism's defeat as for those of the other socialist tendencies in the Russian Revolution. He singled out one of these, the dichotomy introduced between the military activity and the constructive social practice of the movement, which did not allow all organizational forces to express themselves. Another not inconsiderable factor had been, quote, the demagogic fashion in which the Bolsheviks presented themselves in the face of the white counter-revolution, substituting the notion of Soviet power for the idea of the social independence and self-direction of the toilers, which afforded them the chance to engage in boundless exploitation of the ideas of the social revolution and command the trust of several strata of toilers. End quote. The Maknavist insurgent army's counter-espionage intelligence service had been a purely military agency. Its tasks were, quote, a, not to allow agents or enemy armies to infiltrate Maknavist ranks, b, to be fully conversant with the enemy's deployments and military plans, c, to maintain ongoing liaison between the isolated detachments of the insurgent army. In times of military operations, its members participated in engagements alongside other insurgents. End quote. When towns were occupied, the job of the service had been to expose the hidden enemies on the ground, another purely military function, nothing to do with the police activities of the Chika or Denikin's political counterespionage. As for the execution of white envoys, there might be a divergence of opinions about that, but Mrachny would have been better advised at the time to join in the movement rather than hold back, only to ventilate his accusations now, and as for the dictatorial role of Bakko Markno. His role was that of military leader as commander of the army. However he was but one part of the whole and as subject as any other insurgent to decisions of the military revolutionary Soviet. Outside of the army, Comrade Markno only enjoyed a well-deserved popularity, nothing more. And cavalry had enjoyed no advantages over infantry. Certain infantry regiments such as the 13th, 3rd Crimean and 1st Ekaterinoslav regiments were regarded as among the bravest and most popular insurgent army units. He makes an interesting point about the use of the word political to refer to the self-direction of the toilers, as mentioned in the fourth point, never activated, of the compact agreed with the Red Army in October 1920. Arshinov explains that the insurgents had used this adjective quite deliberately in that the Bolsheviks accorded a secondary and junior significance to the expression social self-direction in comparison with the political functions of the state. Also, the only discussion possible on the meaning of transitional stage consisted of asking whether a full-blooded anarchist society was to be expected overnight or merely its groundwork and if one was not just simply mixing it up with the outset of the construction of that society. And Arshinov closed his first reply by ascribing Rachny's different views to the influence of Bolshevik hearsay. In a further reply to critics, he readily acknowledges that the alliance reached between the Maknavists and Bolsheviks was a compromise, a purely military compromise to be sure but a compromise for all that. He excuses point three of the agreement, relating to election of delegates to the Fifth Congress of Soviets of Ukraine, as a precaution on the insurgents' part against a surprise attack from the Bolsheviks. In any case, the military alliance agreed could not be compared, as E. Z. Dolanin had compared it, to the theoretical surrender and collaboration of some anarchists with the Leninists. Apropos of executions, Arshinov readily conceded the harshness and cruelty of such acts, however, account had to be taken of the fact that they had occurred in the context of military confrontations and that the toiler population had itself been subject to bestial treatment at the hands of its enemies. Pomieskis, police, Czechists, and that it was also often the populace itself who singled them out and reported their crimes. 
He also deplored the execution of the author of an anti-Semitic poster and of the Bolsheviks accused of attempting the life of Markno, Polonsky and others, but pointed out that the military context and resultant tensions accounted for these moves which were but incidents, regrettable ones, certainly, rather than anything systematic. Nor does he deny the existence of orders, commands, and discipline in the insurgent army things introduced at the instigation of the mass of insurgents themselves, measures which might be distasteful, but then again circumstances and the struggle against regular, well-organized, disciplined armies necessitated certain things. Then Arshinov turns to Kudeli's remarks. He is delighted to find Kudeli recognizing the need for a partisan army to defeat the armed apparatus of the state. Then he recalls that the movement had circulated and in fact, implemented the idea of anti-authoritarian toilers communes as well as the notion of free Soviets, albeit, not quite as, quote, legislative institutions, but as a sort of platform gathering together the toilers on the basis of their vital needs. Their assigned goal was to carry out the wishes already expressed and formulated by the toiling masses. Let us be dear on this, the peasants and workers of any village or township have a whole series of issues and common tasks to be resolved, provisions, self-defense, liaison between countryside and town, and many others. It behoves them to come to some agreement among themselves on all these matters and then to take decisions as a result, if these are to be put into effect, they need strength. In the minds of the Machnovists, that strength we embodied in the free Soviet of the toilers. End quote. Arshinov points out that such agencies already existed inside the anarchist movement in the form of Soviets, federations, secretariats, or executive committees. So he is astonished that Kudeli should regard as anti-anarchist this means of collectively resolving practical tasks and issues, and that he should also reject congresses as supreme bodies. Arshinov thinks that Kudeli and Dolanin must have considered these free Soviets as agencies empowered, not to execute but to delegate and decide, with delegates imposing their wishes upon the rank and file and not the other way around. So where are they to stand come the social revolution and what will then be their role? All these arguments are in fact superficial and infantile. The Machnavist movement, Arshinov concludes, was open to all anarchists and it was up to them to air their disagreement with this or that feature, provided they clearly set out their reasoning and came up with another solution. Anarchism is not some bookish sect that might deign to take an interest from its Olympian heights in the social struggle of the toilers, quite the contrary, that struggle is its natural element. Pertinent or not, these criticisms, objections and reservations deserve to be known so that the free spirit of debate that prevailed among Russian libertarians may be demonstrated. On the other hand, another Nabat member, Lewandowski who emigrated to the West, voiced graver accusations of a slanderous sort, according to him among the Machnovists, as among the Bolsheviks, a chica existed, there were shootings, mobilization. There was Markno's dictatorship and his staffs and freedom existed only if one did not engage in propaganda against them. In particular he was critical of the execution of the Bolshevik Polonsky and reckoned that, sooner or later, Markno and the anarchists would have found themselves at daggers drawn. Hugo Fedeli interviewed Markno about Lewandowski's accusations, quote. To be sure, Nestor Markno conceded, the Machnavist insurgent movement had many enemies even among the anarchists, especially now that it no longer exists. What do you expect? When we were strong and when the movement was in the ascendant on account of its size and importance, but chiefly because it had resources, well of course there was no shortage of friends or of those who, whilst not entirely favorable, sent out signals of friendship to us. End quote. Concerning Lewandowski, Markno specifies that he had spent two days with the insurgents in October 1920, putting to them a grandiose scheme for an anarchist university in Kharkov, for which he sought the modest donation of 10 million rubles. At the time, Markno, being wounded in the leg and able to get around only on crutches, was unable to leave Guliaipoli, so he was able to attend a meeting of the town Soviet, called especially to examine this request for a subsidy and he spoke right after Lewandowski, quote, We occupy a region nearly 200 kilometers deep by 300 kilometers broad. We have with us millions of peasants but scarcely any schools. 
We are short of people willing or able to help these masses to better themselves educationally, yet you arrive here from the towns where education is already readily available. You, who could be helping us greatly in this task, come to see us only in order to ask for money towards the establishment of a new university in Kharkov. But why there? Because it is a focal point, you will say to me. Well, no, we have no wish to go on repeating the centralist mistake made by comrades whose chief preoccupation has been to set up headquarters for their organizations in Moscow. They're all there, the Anarchist Federation, Golos Truda, etc. Yes, let your university be set up, but here among peasants in dire need of education. End quote. This line of argument struck a real chill into Lewandowski's enthusiasm and he promptly left, without having been granted the money he sought. It was this that undoubtedly led him to proclaim to any who would listen that, the Maknavist movement had done a lot of harm to the anarchist movement. Markno adds that this was not the only case, others showed up looking for subsidies and they included Abraham Gordon who had, however, gone over to the Bolsheviks, every time that their requests were denied, these petitioners, became fresh enemies of the movement. In this way we get a better grasp of the roots of the resentment shown by Lewandowski and of certain other critics whose attitude was undoubtedly, it is worth saying, less than disinterested. Although this debate may have been of great interest in establishing the nature and content of the Maknovskina, one thing should be made clear. At no time had Markno and his closest colleagues described the movement they led as exclusively anarchist, and that despite their being staunch libertarian communists long since put to the test. This was probably the basic reason why they shrank from calling the insurgent army anarchist, rather than Maknovist. Indeed, as far as they were concerned, it was a motley mass movement inside which all supporters of social revolution could coexist. The left Esser presence Veritelnikov, Popov, although these later became anarchists, the Bolshevik element, one of whom, Novitsky, was even elected onto the Military Revolutionary Soviet in October 1919, and the non-party revolutionaries, Kosin, Ozerov, testified to this plurality of tendencies. The movement's theoretical draft declaration, drawn up by Markno and his libertarian, communist comrades, was founded on the notion of free Soviets as on the autonomous collective and, military voice of the toilers as a whole, and not only a single class, or any single party with an appetite for hegemony which was how the Leninists for instance thought of it. In their view the system of free Soviets was only a transitional stage essential for the weaving of the social and economic ties leading on to a federation of libertarian communes, with the state thus finding itself consigned to the Museum of Irksome Antiquities. Nonetheless, in a later article, Markno specifies that the draft, as the name indicates, was to have been debated and possibly adopted by a general congress of the insurgents but the military situation had prevented this. He asserts that it was not a question of the constitution of a Maknavist state. It was the hurried handiwork of the Guliaipoli libertarian communist group. As the insurgents were at loggerheads over the phrasing of certain points, they capitalized upon Volein's presence in late August 1919 to ask him to look over the draft of the text. He worked on it for a month and made do with polishing the literary style, from which Markno concluded that the points at issue had apparently not scandalized Volein and that as a result, the draft was not at odds with anarchism, especially not the Bakuninist conception of the transitional period, which would not be a diffusion of power but rather the elimination of the class state and economic inequalities. A little later, Volein corroborated Markno's version by specifying that he took Lyaskenko's place as chairman of the Military Revolutionary Soviet for a two-month period only at Markno's suggestion, since he had not inserted anything of his own into the draft declaration in accordance with the express wishes of the insurgents but had made do with rephrasing certain formulations and polishing the literary style. He had not at all tried to anarchize the draft, which he regarded as an accurate expression of the thinking of the Maknavist insurgent movement. Bolshevik commentators for their part saw nothing very new in this text as compared with the precepts of Bakunin or Kropotkin. Yefimov gives this interesting description of the Maknavist practice of free Soviets, quote, These organs of power were very primitive. There was no central organ of government, 
There was only the military revolutionary Soviet which was at once a sort of parliament and central military agency dealing with both military and civil matters. This agency had a wide range of functions, but in performing these, it presented itself only a steering body and had no rights of its own, all power being vested in the local organs. Everything boiled down to each village and each district directing itself with complete independence. Nevertheless, the structure of this illusory power was along Soviet lines. There were executive committees, Soviets of deputies, where elected individuals would come together and grapple with various, though not fundamental issues. End quote. A curious admission. In their actions the insurgents implemented their anti-authoritarian preferences, realizing their age-old aspirations. Arshinov spells out the three ideas underlying this approach. A. The right of the toilers to complete freedom of initiative. B. The right to their economic and social self-direction and C. The antistatist principle in social construction. For him, the Maknovskina showed itself to be an anarchist mass movement of toilers, not fully formed nor quite crystallized, but striving towards the anarchist ideal and treading a libertarian path. Arshinov draws a distinction between this coherent behavior and the theoretical abdication and passivity of many intellectual anarchists, whose absence was sorely felt in the movement. Here he agrees with Anatol Gorlick's criticism and adds that, in his opinion, there are two essential reasons underlying this default. A measure of theoretical confusion, and the chronic disorganization of anarchist militants. Markno also accepted this analysis, for it goes without saying that anarchy was not, to him, some cherished utopia of the intellectuals who, while waiting the advent of the age of happiness, smugly occupy their cozy little niches in the existing system of alienation, but rather a practical and immediate social ideal. In exile this attitude led the two friends to devise a draft organization platform for the anarchist movement, wherein they were to pick up and expand upon the 1919 draft declaration and then draw the lessons of the Maknovskina experience, of the Russian Revolution and of the anarchist movement's failure during that period. Be that as it may, by virtue of its peculiarities, the Maknovist movement occupied a separate place in both the doctrine and practice of libertarian communism historically, making its own original and essential contribution. It only remains for us to look into the critical presentation of the notion of free Soviets as an anarchist power, some sort of anti-authoritarian authority, which is to say one restricted to a purely executive and non-decision-making role, as Yefimov diagrammatically represents it. In which case the term no longer carries the negative import of arbitrary authority or state power, the emanation of some clique or class, Rather it comes to stand for the will and free choice of the community of toilers as a whole, in the ability of each to make decisions and act in harmony with all the others. Taken in that sense, the Maknovists' military revolutionary Soviet was indeed an organ of power. In principle executive power but, given the circumstances, very often decision-making power as well. Likewise, the aspiration of this whole revolutionary era could be encapsulated by the slogan of all power to the free Soviets. Let us note that there is here a semantic taboo for many anarchists, which has sometimes condemned them to impotence and a shirking of responsibilities, if not in fact many a time to tag along behind actual state power. By way of corroboration for our argument, let us cite the extraordinary situation that faced the Nabat anarchists meeting in Kharkov in October 1920. A delegation from several Red Army units from Moscow and elsewhere sought them out to propose to them that they take power. The delegation itself undertook to arrest Lenin and the Communist Paris Central Committee. Volein and his colleagues blandly explained to them that anarchists did not seek power, and that the masses had to act for themselves and they amiably refused the offer. Anatol Gorlick also tells of this incident and adds his personal comment that had the anarchists so desired, they could have taken power in Ukraine, so high was their revolutionary standing in the eyes of the red soldiers and toilers. Plenty of scope there for meditations upon the different interpretations of the word power. 31. Apropos the charges of banditry and antisemitism. The Maknovskina, as a social movement so subversive of the established order and aspiring, in the name of anarchy, to do away with all state power and ensure that the toilers ran their own lives, 
could hardly be opposed by its enemies in precisely those terms. It had at all costs to be brought somehow into disrepute and shown in the most ignominious light. Hence the charges repeatedly mooted against it, of banditry, looting and thuggery, not forgetting the allegation of antisemitism. Since the credibility of the charges is largely dependent on the standing of the accusers, let us have a look at whom we are dealing with here. That the Austro-Germans should have regarded the insurgents as so many bandits, since they were irregulars is only to be expected of regular troops. On the other hand, it was hard for them to bandy about adjectives such as thieves or looters, when their own exploits in that regard were nothing to be proud of. Nor were the whites of such immaculate whiteness in this respect, such was the extent, and more, to which their warlords had ransacked the occupied territories. As for the Reds, they were equally unqualified to pronounce such judgments, having milked the whole of Ukraine dry by formally instituting plunder by the state. Although the true bandits do not appear to have been those so labelled, the facts turn the charges back against the accusers, let us nonetheless look into the Machnavists' conduct vis-a-vis -vis the populace. In order to do this, let us look to the Soviet sources of the day which can scarcely be suspected of covering up, according to Yefimov, the Machnavists' basic precept, take nothing from the peasants was strictly adhered to. Only on the initiative of the detachment commander could it be breached. Another commentator, Lebeds, took the line that, Markno and the military revolutionary Soviet strove to preserve the army's popular insurgent saintliness, insurgents were shot for looting, and it was forbidden to seize goods, seize flour from mills or change horses in the absence of the peasants, they exchanged several of their weary horses for one fresh mount. In his directives, Markno issued reminders that insurgents had to be friendly and considerate towards the local population. Lebed's records that in return, locals would resupply the insurgents, tend their wounded and keep them briefed on Red Army movements. Kubanin is even more categorical, after a scrupulous examination of the Machnavist archives, he asserts that the command took all necessary measures to avert acts of looting or banditry, especially in 1918 and 1919, which is, to say during the time when they were not fighting the Red Army. Search and seizure warrants were issued only by the military revolutionary Soviet, the staff and the movement supply corps, otherwise, the detachment commander was answerable for the conduct of its members. Kubanin was forced to note that during the lengthy occupation of Ekaterinoslav at the end of 1919 there was none of the mass looting like under the Whites and Markno's execution on the spot of some marauders made a great impression upon the city's population. In so doing, Kubanin was formally rebutting the curious claim of his party colleague, Christian Rakovsky, to the effect that, it was the rule among the Machnavist army to loot for two days per month. But of course the Machnavists turned those two days into an entire month a rebuttal very very rare, even for those days. The allegation is less queer if one knows that, on the basis of reports from Czechists and political commissars, Rakovsky had written an awful pamphlet on the situation in the Ukrainian countryside, seated all the while in his plush office as the puppet president of the Soviet Ukraine. Kubanin goes on to say that goods seized by the Machnavist army were distributed by the local inhabitants and the movement supply corps. And what did these goods consist of? The property of the big landlords, the urban bourgeoisie, and the depots of the whites and reds, derived from systematic plundering of the laboring population. It is, consequently, noticeable that none of the charges of banditry aired by this one or that stands up to a serious examination of the facts. In spite of all that, how are they to be explained? Perhaps in terms of the age-old fear that the rural bourgeoisie and squire Archie felt of the dark, nameless peasant mass, these yokels whose wrathful vengeance they rightly feared. On the other side of the coin, one might speak of the peasant millenarism, of the hatred for towns as unhealthy places where the holders of power, the central administrations, the exploiters, and their lackeys were ensconced. A picture that has to be refined somewhat, in that the Ukrainian countryside was strewn with large towns of 10,000 to 20,000 inhabitants, Gulyapoli for one, and hardly fitted in with Marxists' traditional notions of the peasantry. Here peasants did not live a life turned in upon itself, on the contrary, they were bound by close ties, through countless yearly fairs and the incessant trade in various produce. Something else needs explaining, too, 
hanging the label bandits on individuals, fighting for their autonomy and attitude quintessentially mystifying to anyone fond of power over his neighbor ensures that they can be unceremoniously written off, summary execution of prisoners and suspects, breach of compacts agreed to, reneging upon one's word of honor, the statist schemers shrank from nothing. So it was primarily a political argument, essential in order to dismiss one's adversary and deny him right of reply. The charge of antisemitism is part and parcel of the same mentality. But here too let us look to the facts. The Magnavist movement embraced without distinction representatives of the various ethnic communities of the region under its influence, to wit, a vast majority of Ukrainian peasants, nearly 90% of the movement, Arshinov claims, the 6-8% of peasants of Russian origin, followed by members of the dozen Jewish and Greek farming communities of the region and in lesser numbers, Georgians, Armenians, Bulgars, Serbs, Montenegrins, and Germans. This circumstance alone would be enough to account for the absence of chauvinist nationalistic feelings from the movement. Later, during the fight against the Red Army, some deserters, like many Don Cossacks, went over to the insurgents. Kubanin mentions the figure of 17 Jewish farming colonies in the Alexandrovsk and Marupol districts, the heartlands of the Maknovskina, and writes that there the Jewish peasant was a brother as far as peasants of other extractions were concerned, having had the same relationship as these with the Pomeshik. We should specify that national identity is mentioned here only to illustrate our point, for we have yet to discover how the insurgents described themselves. For instance, Nestor Markno did not describe himself as a Ukrainian but merely as an anarchist, his beliefs were dismissive of all national differences. He did not even speak Ukrainian only in exile did he learn it and expressed himself in Russian, that being the most widespread tongue in the Tsarist Empire. Then again, ever since his days, as a teenage militant, he had had fellow believers and fellow activists of Jewish origin, in fact in 1905. Jews accounted for the overwhelming majority of Russian and Ukrainian anarchists, and he had never had any problems with them. When he returned to Moscow at the end of June 1918, he had been saved from certain death by his friend Moshe Kogan, himself a native of Gulyaipoli and future president of the local Soviet in 1919. Later Markno had been ruthless with any display of antisemitism in the movement's sphere of influence. When bully boy tactics were employed in 1919 against some Ukrainian and Jewish peasants by persons professing to be his followers, he had issued an appeal to all peasants, raising violent objections to such conduct and even threatening suicide if his name was again to be used to cover such ignominious acts. And the population had been mightily impressed by this declaration. Following a provocation by Denikinist agents, when several members of a Jewish settlement had been massacred by insurgents, Markno had insisted upon the shooting of the culprits, rather than their being sent up to the front line as a joint bolshevik maknavist commission of inquiry had determined. He then had rifles and ammunition issued to the region's Jewish farming settlements, this at a time when there was a dire shortage of weapons among the frontline fighters, which brought him criticism from Ukrainian insurgents and peasants. In reply he had taken it upon himself to set up, with Jewish fighters exclusively, an artillery battery and support squad made up of veterans of the Russo-German war under the command of Abraham Schneider. This unit heroically defended the approaches to Gulyaipoli against Shkuro's Cossacks and was wiped out only after it had cut down a number of the assailants. Moreover, there were 200 Jewish infantry in one of the Gulyaipoli regiments and a great number of others scattered through the various Maknavist units. Several commanders, including Taranovsky, the movement's last chief of staff, and Lev Zinkovsky, commander of Markno's personal escort at the time of his passage into Romania, were Jews. Three out of the five members of the movement's cultural section Helen Keller, Yasha Sukovalsky, and Joseph Gottman, known also as the emigre, the last two were later murdered by the Chika, were of similar origins. Isaac Tepper, editor of the Maknavist Voice in Kharkov in October 1920, and other leading Nabat members, such as Mrachny, Gorlick, Aaron Baron, and Volein, were also of Jewish origin. There is thus no avoiding a simple common-sense realization, had the Maknavist movement or Markno had any antisemitic tendencies, not one of these insurgents and anarchists of Jewish origin would have tolerated or countenanced them and would instantly have dissociated themselves from the movement.
let us recall. Also the main reason why Ataman Grigorov was executed, for having ordered pogroms. Also these pogroms occurred in those Ukrainian provinces of high Jewish population, which is to say in the western parts, there were none in the Tavrida or in Ekaterinoslav province. In his book, Volyne quotes the conclusions of Cherikova, a specialist investigator of persecutions and pogroms against the Jews in Ukraine, quote, Markno's attitude is not to be compared to that of the other armies which operated in Russia during the happenings of 1917 to 1921. On two points I can offer you absolutely formal assurances, one, it cannot be gainsaid, that of all these armies, Red Army included, it was Markno's army which behaved best towards the civilian population generally and the Jewish population in particular. I have plenty of irrefutable testimony to that. Compared with the rest, the proportion of justified complaints against the Maknavist army is insignificant. 2. Let us not speak of pogroms supposedly organized or encouraged by Markno himself. That is calumny or error. Nothing of the sort occurred. End quote. Cherikova specifies that on every occasion when some pogrom or some outrage was imputed to Maknavists, he was able to verify that on that date none of their detachments could have been in the place concerned. A Jewish committee set up in Berlin in the 1920s with the participation of both left and right social revolutionaries, and members of the Bund, the Jewish Social Democratic Labour Party, Mensheviks, Aronson, and anarchists came to similar conclusions regarding such accusations leveled against the Maknavists, on the other hand it did manage to authenticate pogroms carried out by Red Army and White Army units. Even more interesting, these same charges of antisemitism were rebutted by Soviet authors during the 1920s, even though they were on the lookout for the slightest grounds on which to discredit the movement. Lebed states that the, quote, Maknavist command and military revolutionary Soviet had declared war on antisemitism, unlike other Atamans who sometimes played on political positions by openly using the watchword of get the communists and Jews. Markno and his staff, in their proclamations, stressed the unacceptable nature of antisemitism and combated signs of it through extreme repressive measures. End quote. And Tepper writes that Markno was as far removed from nationalism as from the antisemitism ascribed to him by many, in his view, if there was antisemitism, it was when the Maknavist army amalgamated with some units under Petlierist influence or simply common criminals seizing upon any excuse to indulge in looting. Antonov Ovsinko goes one better, there was no basis for accusing Markno of personally supporting antisemitic tendencies. Quite the contrary, he did all in his power to combat pogroms. To back tip what he says, he reproduces a lengthy appeal drafted by Markno and Veritelnikov denouncing all acts of banditry and antisemitism perpetrated in the insurgent's name and proposing to punish the perpetrators as promptly and severely as possible. Cubanin is equally dear. In 1918 and 1919, the behavior of the Maknavist army towards the Jews displayed not the slightest hint of antisemitism and this is as true of the mass as of the leadership. He stresses the presence of many Jews among the Maknavist command during those years and reaffirms that Markno was not personally antisemitic, according to him, it was only when the Maknavists were fighting the Red Army after 1920 that they joined up with some Petlierist detachments and adopted more nationalistic attitudes denouncing Muscovite aggressors and calling for the liberation of Ukraine from the Russian yoke, but without quite turning antisemitic. The most recent of the monographs published on the Maknovskina inside the USSR, Simonov's monograph, is even more definite, it registers no inkling of Ukrainian chauvinism in the movement and argues that the so very widespread belief about the Maknovskina's antisemitic character does not square with the facts. Semenov takes up the arguments of his predecessors, noting the presence of lots of Jews among the movement's leadership and the complete absence of antisemitic statements. Markno himself returned to these lingering misrepresentations several times in articles, written while the movement was still extant, for the road to freedom, and also while an emigre in Paris. Among his fellow exiles were many anarchists of Jewish origin, David Polyakov, Ida Met, Waletsky, Ranko, and Grisha Botanovsky to whom he entrusted his archives before dying. All of the evidence that we have been able to amass from people who knew him in Paris bear witness to his having been a stranger to anti-Jewish prejudices which strikes us as setting the seal upon the matter. 
So why this persistent rumor of Macnavist antisemitism when the Marist inquiry bursts that particular bubble? Several explanations are possible. On the one hand, the conduct of the Jewish armed company of Gugliopoli when the Austro-Germans invaded, their treachery must have left an anger among the region's population, in spite of the efforts of Markno and his anarchist colleagues. Then, again among the Ukrainian bourgeoisie degraded by the insurgents, there was also a large number of Jews, as well as among the Czechists and Bolshevik officials executed in 1920 and 1921 and so these could have been put down as casualties of popular vendetta against their co-religionists as a whole. Finally, many maverick gallows birds were ravaging the country, and it suited them to cover up their misdeeds by invoking the Maknavist movement which enjoyed the best brand image among the Ukrainian populace. Be that as it may, as far as their political adversaries were concerned, the argument was a weighty one enabling them to cheaply dismiss the professed aims of the movement, only to acknowledge later on, once their defeat had been finalized, as indeed the Bolsheviks did, that such charges had had no substance to them. 32. Historiography and Mythomania Throughout this book we have relied upon primary sources and references, to wit, the accounts and reports of protagonists in and eyewitnesses to the events described and we have also relied upon archive materials borrowed from official Soviet publications. In regard to the latter, we have been able, with only a few exceptions relating to minor details, to consult virtually every text in print. Obviously, and for all the concrete particulars that have emerged from them, we must have reservations about their use in that we cannot have direct access to the archives from which they are extracted. Among the documentation which might have rendered certain portions of our study more exhaustive, we might cite the complete collections of the three Macnavist press organs which we have only glimpsed through a few random issues accessible here in the West. The memoirs, or confessions of Victor Belash and Alexei Chubenko, Macnavist leaders captured by the Red Army and induced to confess, might also have proven useful to us, for only the odd snippet quoted by Kubanin has been accessible. Likewise, Arshinov drafted his history of the Maknavist movement surreptitiously in Russia and the first four more or less complete drafts of it were lost following Chika raids, along with the movement's fundamental documentation, personal notes from Markno, biographical notes on the most active insurgents, a complete collection of the road to freedom, comprising 43 issues, so far as we can tell, and sundry other precious papers. In all logic, all these items should be stored in the Chika or Red Army archives, Lebeds for instance refers to issues of the road to freedom in various formats and printed on different colored newsprint. Also the archives of the Romanian and Polish political police may hold the papers seized from Markno, one might say the same of the little case full of papers left in, the possession of Grisha Botanowski and seized by the Gestapo in Paris during the Second World War. Perhaps someday all these materials may make it possible to complete the picture of the Maknavist movement's deeds and feats, provided they have not been lost forever in the convolutions of police bureaucracies or fallen victim to the passage of time, and the deterioration of paper, and the destruction inherent in warfare. We think it opportune to rehearse, briefly, the chronology of the available printed sources. Credit where credit is due. So we shall begin with the view of the winners, the Leninists, for whom history is their private preserve enabling them to control the present through the past and to justify all the human sacrifices carried out in order to build their hegemonic power. The earliest studies, at once political and military, were addressed to the party and army cadres at a time when the anti macnavist campaign was still raging, the necessity of this mini-civil war had to be explained and the insurgents, goals and fighting methods reported. Thus it was hardly surprising that they should have been published in reviews intended for internal use, reviews of small circulation and that, at first sight, they should display a startling objectivity, except of course where the defeats and losses sustained by the Red Army are concerned, these being issues on which the greatest discretion was observed. This objectivity can be explained, it was necessary so that the military and political cadres might draw useful lessons from it. Oddly enough, all later Soviet monographs refrain from citing them, doubtless regarding them as unduly favorable to the Maknavists. 
The most remarkable of these pieces is undeniably Yefimov's, from which we have borrowed time and again, for it has the advantage of offering an overall analysis of the fight against Markno during 1920. The other articles focus on specific clashes and these take care not to go into too much detail on the insurgent's performance. The chief military leader to whom it fell to wage the campaign against the Maknavists, Eidmann, took it upon himself to expand politically upon the reprehensible aspects of the Ukrainian banditry in several pamphlets and articles. Another eminent Red Army strategist, the one-time Tsarist Colonel Karkarin, drew the lesson from this fight against banditry by stigmatizing it as a specific social disease and calling for the beefing up of the police apparatus in order to stifle it. The first general official study of the Maknovskina was written in September 1921 and appeared above the signature of D. Lebeds, this was appraisals and lessons of three years of Anarcho Maknovskina. The author sets out his intention of making a study of this movement's petty bourgeois and kulak banditry, though he sets out idiosyncrasies of a revolutionary and popular nature, setting it apart from other instances of banditry, petlierist, or independent socialist, or populist or anarchist, or bourgeois and seigneurial counter-revolutionary, not forgetting the Cossack Volnitsa. This fruit salad acquires a curious flavor when Lebeds lumps together the Ukrainian bedniaki, poor peasants, and the Russian serednyakis, medium peasants. And this only to deduce that the serednyakis, Markno's supporters, were the equivalent of the Russian kulaks and espoused the anarchist ideology as the one best suited to their fight against the Soviet authorities. Markno, an enthusiastic practitioner of anarchist doctrine, thereby becomes the tool of the kulaks. The contortions of this argument then lead the author to say that the first alliance with Markno simply could not have held up because his principles of freedom, electivity of command and his partisan warfare methods were having an erosive effect upon the Red Army by detaching the least conscious groups, especially the sailors who went over to him. In passing, Volein is awarded the title of Markno's spiritual master, then Lebed states that the insurgents' fourth congress, banned by Trotsky, had meant to sever the Maknovist region from the remainder of Ukraine by instituting the Libertarian Republic of Maknovia. Further on, he corrects his aim just a touch, the Maknovist army was not made up solely of kulaks, authentically poor peasants also belonged to it and the insurgents were frequently joined by entire groups of cones, the poor peasantry committees set up by the Leninists. Let us pick out this interesting definition of the insurgents' ideals, a refounding of society in such a way that everyone has an equal opportunity to enjoy life and its benefits, organization of social relationships in such a way that no group is dependent upon any other, no individual upon any other, so that every trace of power is banished from human relationships. Whereas he formally rebuts the charges of an alliance between the dot Maknavists and the Whites, Lebeds reckons that as a catchphrase libertarian commune failed to take account of the workers and peasants' lack of preparedness for that phase of society. He ties in the dictatorship of the workers with the expansion of productive forces and stresses the need for a central worker carrot peasant state apparatus that is well organized if the economy is to be successfully repaired. A telling remark. Lebeds is worried about the Maknavists' petty bourgeois humors infiltrating the workers' districts, into the workshops and factories, among the weary and backward worker masses. He notes at this point that the sailor rebels of Kronstadt had taken up the Maknavists' catch cries of free Soviets and the Third Social Revolution, which had attracted some Communist Party members, especially younger ones, over to their revolt. Kronstadt's proclamations had even been reprinted by the anarcho maknavists who made no bones about their sympathies with that insurrection. Finally, to justify three successive alliances with the maknavists, who, let it be said in passing, acknowledge only two, Lebeds reckons that this was due to the proletarian party's underlying attitude towards the petite bourgeoisie. We may reach an understanding with it, and pass accords, but in the final analysis we have to master it. Thus he could see no sin in armed struggle waged against the insurgents, for this was merely a question of tactics. This convoluted reasoning avoids neither confusion nor the most blatant contradictions, and it is startlingly revealing of the regime's dilemma, unable as it was to explain its struggle against Maknavist banditry, even so, it was to be the same old story with all subsequent policy statements, 
to which the occasional minor variations were to be added. But his book is no less precious for all that, it contains substantial extracts from the Machnavist press and invaluable factual material drawn from sources to which we could not otherwise gain access. Three years later the account of Isaac Tepegordeyev, a one-time Nabat member who had probably been asked by the Chika to make honorable amends, saw the light of day. In fact, in the guise of taking Markno to task, Tepe indulged himself in an outright tirade against his former organization. His thesis is quite bizarre, that the Nabat guided the Maknovskina by remote control in order to seize an autonomous territory where it might indulge in a social experiment in anarchism. Tepe even goes so far as to depict Aaron Baron, his ex-comrade, as the dictator of the Maknovist movement during a good part of 1920. Not that this hinders him from peppering his account with numerous scathing remarks about Maknovist kulaks and other recantations inspired by his Czechist supervisor of studies. His pamphlet boasts but one positive point, it supplies details of certain Maknovists, and, above all it reprints, for the first time in total, the text of the agreement concluded in October 1920 between the Maknovists and the Red Army. In 1926 we may note Anasev's curious forward to I. Kalinin's book, Kalinin was a white ex-reporter, on Russia's Vendi, the Cossacks of the Don and Cuban. Anasev takes exception to Kalinin's depiction of Markno as a mere bandit who allegedly recruited solely on the basis of sharing plundered goods. In his view, such an assessment of the Maknovskina could only be acknowledged as tenable for the second quarter of 1921 in that it would be a mistake not to discern behind Markno's banditry a general peasant uprising against the dictatorship of the big landowners and generals. This clarification gives pause for thought, on the one hand, it is out of place in the foreword, and, on the other, one needs to read Kalinin's book from cover to cover to find that he only has a few lines about Markno anyway. The following year, in a monograph on the Denikinskina, Deakin acknowledges that the Maknavists were a real nightmare for the whites, but at the same time he asserts that anarchy was the flag that shrouded the aspirations of kulaks. Also in 1927, a real monograph appeared on the Maknovskina above the signature of Kubanin and under the sponsorship of Pokrovsky, the then boss of official historiography. Kubanin has scientific pretensions and seeks as a Marxist to comprehend the only attempt this century to achieve libertarian communism. He painstakingly examines the movement's social and economic characteristics, the Bolsheviks' agrarian policy in Ukraine and the various phases of the Maknovskina. However, his approach is most convincing when he notes that the centers of the movement matched those rebel districts most active in 1905 against the Pomieskis, before going on to try to explain it away in terms of the importance of bit production. Remarkably, he cites virtually none of the earlier official studies as references, implicitly dismissing them as worthless. His reasoning is transparent, allegedly, the Maknavist movement was made up for the most part of Serednyakis who were supposedly led, in the period of the struggle, against white counter-revolution by Bedniakis and workers, and later, in the days of the fight against the Soviet authorities, by Kulaks. His conclusion is less simplistic, the Maknovskina was on the right lines in 1918 and 1919 when it fought foreign occupation and the white backlash, but once it opposed Moscow, it became inherently counter-revolutionary. The entire history of the Maknovskina rests upon the dithering of the southern steppe Serednyak between reaction and revolution. In spite of such reductionism, his work is extremely useful in the absence of other sources with regard to various aspects of the Maknovist movement in terms both of the plentiful quotations, the statistical evidence and the usage, for the first time, of the archives of the Chika and Red Army, as well as for certain admissions about the mistakes of Leninist agrarian policy and the approach of the Bolshevik party state, of which we shall give a sample. Let us open with this gem, in criticizing Soviet power, Maknovists stated that in Soviet Russia there was no freedom of speech, no press freedom, etc., which the Bolsheviks were supposed to have promised. These petty bourgeois revolutionaries failed to grasp that if we enforce the dictatorship of the proletariat, we are consequently the foes of democratic freedoms. When and where have the Bolsheviks ever talked about liberty, equality and fraternity under the dictatorship of the proletariat? 
Had Leninists dared issue such a statement in 1917, we are prepared to wager that they would have quickly vanished into historical oblivion. But now, ten year on, they could casually fly their true colors. Kubanin then recalls that the SAF causes had been organized along the lines of nationalized industry, i.e., the produce was to be placed at the complete disposition of the state, which caused dissatisfaction in the petit bourgeois producer who had taken the slogan factory to the worker, land to the peasant in a petit bourgeois, syndicalist sense, as meaning all of the land and the factories would come directly under the disposition of the producer who worked on that land and in those factories. He goes on to note that many anti-Soviet, or more precisely, anti-proletarian, Seredniak peasant movements were mobilized in the name of Soviet power. Finally in a note, he draws a parallel between one of the Maknavist tactics individual terror and that employed by the Kulaks in 1927, thereby acknowledging the peasantry's ongoing anti-Bolshevik struggle. In order to condemn these Maknavist methods, Kubanin conveniently uncovers in Eidman's archives a personal diary kept by Markno's wife, one Genko, killed in the spring of 1921 a diary that portrays the actions of the insurgents in an unfavorable light. In vain was Markno to deny any connection with this alleged wife and to rebut with ease the deeds and dates set out in this canard, all for nothing, to this day this diary remains the clinching argument of Soviet historians and their foreign acolytes, like Aragon, in denouncing the misdeeds of the Maknavists. In 1928 on the occasion of a second edition of Gerasimenko's account, Batko Markno, we are awarded with a preface and critical notes by P. E. Skegelev previously known as an expert on the Decembrists, Pushkin and Lermontov, which is to say on the 19th century, and also as one of the founders of the Museum of the Revolution in Leningrad. He opens by quoting the orthodox views of Yakovlev and Trotsky on the Maknovskina, before going on to mention Kurilenko, Koretnik, and Ivan Lepichenko and Viktor Belash, as if they were still alive and, working peaceably in Ukraine. Too often, he says, published materials and memoirs on this period are of dubious quality, when not neglectful of those which could be of primary importance. Then he describes Gerasimenko as naive for having stated that Markno had prevented Denikin's seizure of Moscow, which was the first time this assessment was made public in writing in the USSR. All in all, Skegelev's forward sticks to their official line, but the notes less so. He derides the accounts of Boris Pilniak and of the young French writer Joseph Kessel whose novel is, Complete Fabrication. The main novelty in this publication consists of the reprint in full, as an appendix, of directives and telegrams Markno sent to Moscow regarding Grigoriev and his resignation from his position as Red Army Divisional Commander, as well as of his long letter to Arshinov concerning the final moments in 1921 of the anti-Bolshevik struggle. These documents, lifted from Arshinov's work, are brought to the attention of the Soviet public for the very first time. Skegelev himself underlines this and has no hesitation in speaking about the colorful language of Markno's letter, reminiscent in his eyes, of the finest passages of Babel's short stories on the Civil War. We may wonder what led this venerable historian, who died three years later, to take such a close interest in Markno. Doubtless it was some barely disguised sympathy. 1928 also saw the appearance of the monograph by Rudnev, a sort of popularized version of the Cuban in work, in that it contains neither notes nor references. The author tells the whole story of the movement in a much more coherent fashion than Cuban in. He is openly hostile to the Maknovskina, a cover for the Kulak movement but nonetheless concedes that it played a crucial role against Rangel in 1920 notes Markno's efforts to abide loyally by the agreement concluded with the Bolsheviks and points out that some red units and their commanders crossed over to the Maknavists during 1921, an allegation tantamount to sacrilege at the time. Let us take note of his conclusions, Soviet power and the laboring peasantry were at loggerheads. The former called for the land to be taken into the hands of the state, the latter wanted it handed over in its entirety to the local community which was supposed to know better than anybody else how it should be shared out. Thus this analysis registers fairly faithfully the antagonism between the respective outlooks of the insurgents and the Bolshevik party state. In 1930, at the time of the dekulakization which was proceeding apace, the Ukrainian Communist Party's History Review, Letterpis Historiae, 
Carried Erda's analysis of the political program of the Anarcho Maknovskina, which in itself had nothing new to contribute, simply borrowing from all previous official studies. Not until 1937, when the Stalinists clashed in Spain with Spanish anarchists, did the topic recover any immediacy. M. Yaroslavsky published a survey of anarchism in Russia, translated into several languages, repeating the most hackneyed charges against the Maknovists, nonetheless leaving a way out for well-meaning Spanish anarchists for, he said, the Maknovist movement had not always been hostile to the revolution from its outset and throughout its existence. There were times when it helped the revolution. A direct reference to the two alliances agreed with the Bolsheviks. Not that that meant that Leninists could countenance free Soviets, which provoked Yaroslavsky to anger. The very notion of a Soviet without any power is one of the most damaging concoctions to emanate from Mensheviks and White Guards. It is a light which gives no heat, a cold exclamation question mark fire, senile impotence, an empty, noxious phrase. It is true that the Stalin years registered a lively enrichment of the language of abuse and the author was not one to be outdone by official speeches anathematizing the lewd vipers and other monsters in the higher of the international reaction. With Yaroslavsky, one finds more social nuances than in Lebeds or Kubinin. The Maknovists' hatred for the poor peasants was the hatred of Kulaks for the poor peasants and workers. Intoxicated, he even speaks of the Maknovian state of Guliaipoli, of a Kulak police state with its spies, executioners, prisons, irresponsible despotic commanders, its army, and of the destruction of all press, freedom, all political liberty. It appears here Yaroslavsky is extrapolating and crediting to the Maknovist movement specific features of his own party. Only those anarcho syndicalists who went over to the Bolsheviks are spared in his view, for they took a tiny step forward towards a proper understanding of the revolution its course, and its tasks. Very obviously, this was pointing out to the anarcho syndicalists of the Spanish CNT the road they too should go down. Echoing the ravings of this unsavory individual, the great Soviet encyclopedia, in its first edition in 1938 carried an entry devoted to the Maknovskina, movement of kulaks, anarchists, and white guards, carried out anti-Jewish pogroms, savage looting and murders of communists. Beginning around the same time was a succession of Moscow trials which captured the attention of worldwide public opinion, which was intrigued more by these intestinal struggles than by the fate of the millions of peasant victims of Stalinist collectivization in the foregoing years, an international panel of figures on the left was set up to look into the origins of score settling, straight away it came to seek an explanation from Trotsky, who had been banished from the Holy of Holy some years before, of his own conduct towards the Kronstadt sailors and Markno. The one-time carnot of the Bolsheviks deigned to answer thus, quote, Markno was a blend of fanatic and adventurer. But he became the focus of the tendencies that provoked the Kronstadt uprising. Generally, cavalry is the most reactionary category of troops. The man on horseback holds the man on foot in contempt. Markno's anarchist ideals, negation of the state, contempt for central authority, could not have been better matched to the mentality of this kulak cavalry. Let me add that in Markno the hatred felt for the urban worker was complemented by a pugnacious antisemitism. End quote. A while later he was at it again, declaring peremptorily that only a man with an empty mind could see in Markno's bands or in the Kronstadt insurrection a struggle between the abstract principles of anarchism and state socialism. Trotsky kept faith with himself as he had been during his offensive against the Maknovists in June 1919, in this way he demonstrated his inability to grasp the way that the Russian Revolution had degenerated from its beginnings. Failing to question at all his own contribution to this dismal evolution, indeed the very opposite, he continued to stake his claim to the Bolshevik inheritance seized by his twin Stalin, by using precisely the same arguments and anathemas. It was only a short time before he himself fell victim to methods he had so adroitly used against the revolutionary insurgents that he was to revise part of his incisive judgment of Markno, who had good intentions but acted damned badly. The hubris that had earned Trotsky so many enemies in his own party was still casting him in the starring role of the man who knew how to act well or badly. For nearly twenty years after that date, a leaden silence hung over the Maknovskina 
this was the heyday of the regime's hacks writing to order. Didn't they go to the lengths of rewriting the whole history of the Civil War just to uncover the hitherto well-hidden feats of that little father of the people's Joseph Vissarionovich Dugashvili, alias Stalin? For instance the book by one A.V. Likovat on the crushing of the national counter-revolution in Ukraine in 1917-1922 has not a single word to say in its 651 pages about Markno. Rehearsing such memories could well have put ideas into the heads of mischief-makers, a sort that were thick on the ground in the vast jail that the USSR had become. In 1962, in a Ukrainian encyclopedia the Maknavist movement was still being lumped willingly with the Kulaks, social revolutionaries, anarchists, and petliurists, the free Soviets became Soviets without communists and so on and so on. Not until 1964 and the after-effects of the Khrushchev thaw did a study of some interest appear, within the framework of the Minna Civil War it deals with military and political aspects of the fight against the Maknavists. With a print run of only 2,140 copies, Trifonov's work was meant for students of history, secondary school and university teachers, as well as party carders. As the Minna Civil War had been completely neglected during the period of the Stalin cult, the stress was henceforth to be on the activity of the Soviet government, with Lenin at its head, and of the local party organs, Red Army Chika, Militia, and Special Counterinsurgency Corps. Trifonov takes the precaution of reporting that the campaign waged against the dictatorship of the proletariat by Kulaks, led by the petit bourgeois parties of the social revolutionaries, Mensheviks, anarchists, and all the rest, was inspired and organized by international imperialism. This ritual incantation is still relevant, for the old, old ploy of ascribing the roots of difficulties at home to the handiwork of foreign foes excuses even the worst repressions. In spite of this, the book furnishes details galore, especially about military operations, all drawn from archives. But what makes it really interesting is its critical handling of all previous monographs on the Maknavist movement. Out of all the contradictory sources, only Arshinov's book is quoted, the writer, who is described as the personal tutor and mentor of the archbandit Markno, cannot, says Trifonov, disguise a zoological hatred of communism, his book can be dismissed on account of its anti-communist venom. As for Lebeds, he is taken to task for uncritical use of sources, probably his substantial quotations from the Maknavist press, as well as for having described the Maknovskina as a petit bourgeois spirit of revolt. Tepetu is accused of having raised doubts about Markno and even for having tried to rehabilitate him. Kubanin is alleged to have allowed gross methodological errors regarding definition of the social nature and political complexion of Ukrainian banditry to slip through. Trifonov puts him straight, Markno and his entourage represented the interests of the wealthiest village kulaks from 1918 on. Furthermore, Kubaninis alleged not to have been critical enough of the memoirs of arrested Maknavists and to have quoted too extensively from Arshinov, without the requisite authentication. Only Yaroslavsky is spared and with good reason, their loyalties are the same, with Trifonov's Stalinism merely dispensing with Stalin. Finally in 1968 a substantial article by Simonov appeared. Trifonov's black and white judgments are toned down a bit, Markno supposedly enjoyed for a time the support of a comparatively broad stratum of the peasantry. This is why the struggle against him was so protracted, wearying and bloody. Simonov proposes to expose the absence of positive social ideals from the movement, a goal readily achieved in that from his sources, all of them familiar, he heeds only the most negative aspects likely to bolster his thesis. To conclude our review of the historiography, let us mention Konev's monograph on anarchism where the author rails against the Western bourgeois counterfeiters of history who dare make revolutionaries of anarchists and Maknavists and take Bolsheviks to task for having eradicated them. The regression since the 1920s is self-evident, compared with such liturgical peons to the role of Lenin and the party, the studies by Yefimov, Antonov-Ovsinko and, to a lesser extent, Lebeds and Kubanin could pass for paragons of objectivity. Whereas these authors were not afraid to reprint Maknavist texts extensively and hint at certain weaknesses and shortcomings in the Leninist regime, post-Stalinist hagiographers do not shrink from denying all voice to opponents of their Manichaean contentions. In the West, 
historians were for a long time content to examine only the views of the victors, ignoring the Minna Civil War of the years 1920 to 1924 virtually entirely. Over the past few years there has been a clear turnaround on this count, and some studies have been marked by a resurgence of interest in this period. In English, several works are deserving of attention, including the monographs on Markno by Michael Pallage, an American of Ukrainian extraction, and by Michael Malley, a Scottish historian. Their common intention has been, so to speak, to rehabilitate in academic circles Markno and the Ukrainian insurgent movement which he led, a very laudable object to be sure, but one that we hold to be secondary, the most important being to make the experience of the Ukrainian libertarian communists known to a wider public and to extract from it lessons of use to the contemporary revolutionary project. Dealt with in broad outline, the actions and feats of the Maknavists, as well as the complex, of military operations connected with this remain isolated from the context of the Russian Revolution overall. Here again we come upon the classic drawbacks of academic research, which is generally content coldly to catalogue events without venturing any thoroughgoing analysis, nor, above all, describing their phases with all the detail that one might hope for. On the methodological side, certain basic sources such as Yefimov are omitted or inadequately used, whereas other more dubious ones are utilised and are the source of scattered inexactitude. In spite of everything one should rejoice at publication of these excellent studies which are correctives to the mediocre Anglo-Saxon university literature tackling the subject. In French, since the 1920s, only Arshinov's book and the first volume of Markno's memoirs were available. 1947 saw the appearance of Volein's posthumous work La Révolution in Connu. Volein had promised a great work on Markno and the Maknovskina, but this falls far short of that, maybe on account of the war or other circumstances. Let us quote, from memory, the criticism that Ida Met made of it at the time of its publication, quote. Far from disclosing fresh facts, the author reprints whole pages lifted from the history of the Maknavist movement written by Arshinov in 1921. On the other hand, he quotes not one word from the private memoirs of Nestor Markno despite being in possession of the original which he discovered under the pillow of Markno's hospital deathbed. To be sure there are points of interest in his description of the Maknovskina, but their historical value is undermined by the absence of footnotes, the turgid hectoring and a measure of distasteful self-obsession. To conclude, the author, his objectivity and impartiality overflowing, launches into descriptions of the negative personal aspects of Marknos, and this inelegant, impartiality is singularly reminiscent of personal, posthumous vengeance. End quote. Legitimate criticism, for we can discern long paraphrases of all quotations from Arshinov and from Markno, Volein's few rudimentary anecdotes were not such as to justify his moral judgments on Markno and his comrades, judgments out of place after such reasoning. In 1970 the first volume of Markno's memoirs was republished thanks to the writer Daniel Guerin. In a short preface Guerin reviews the characteristics of the movement and laments a certain relative weakness, due to the dearth of libertarian intellectuals in its ranks, although at least intermittently it was helped by outsiders. Guerin takes the opportunity to look forward to a brilliant psychological profile of Markno by an English author, Malcolm Menzies. This profile duly appeared in 1972, in a translation from the English manuscript, and leaves our hunger unassuaged, for the author utterly ignorant of his subject makes do with rehashing some autobiographical writings of Markno, available in French at that, as well as a few items of gossip, collected who knows, where, since he quotes no sources and peppers the whole with psychological considerations more revealing of his own turmoil than of Markno's. Having acted as godfather to this own goal, Guerin does not stop there, in an anthology of anarchist texts that could not have been bettered, he describes the Maknavist movement as a gigantic jackery accompanied by a guerrilla war spearheaded by an avenger, a sort of Robin Hood, a relatively uneducated peasant, a guerrilla war foreshadowing the revolutionary war of the Chinese, Cubans, Algerians, and of heroic Vietnam. Undaunted by unnatural comparisons, Guerin adds that Trotsky should be respected. Having been a great revolutionary, and that the sins accumulated by the Bolshevik authorities between 1918 and 1921, the culmination of which would be Kronstadt, and Markno, 
Take nothing away from the conviction and genius of the authors of the October Revolution. With his contradictory evaluation, Guerin discloses his difficulties in reconciling the irreconcilable, his Lenina Trotskyist sympathies, his neophyte zeal for peddling the curious amalgam dubbed libertarian Marxism, and the anarchism of the Machnovists. In 1975 Wolodymyr Holota, apparently of Ukrainian extraction, submitted a PhD thesis at Strasbourg University on the Ukrainian Machnovist movement and at the end of an unimaginative compilation of slim references in French and a few others in Russian and Ukrainian, arrived at an ambiguous conclusion, close to Guerin's thesis. It was on the basis of these French sources that Yves Ternon, a urologist and amateur historian, published a small book on Markno in 1981. Let us skip the inaccuracies, confusions, and unwarranted inclusions, to take note of the author's medico-historical diagnosis, Markno was the indicator, the intermediary between a people and its entry into history, the diastatic factor which accelerated the reaction and acted only where the wherewithal for action was to hand. Some may perhaps advance as an extenuation these authors' sympathies for Markno. That argument carries little weight, in view of the very personality of the Ukrainian libertarian who had little taste for indulgence and would assuredly not have appreciated the means employed by such lame defenders in putting themselves forward. Despite the notorious weaknesses and shortcomings of the genre, one can account for their appearance by the dearth of works on Mark no deserving of the name, it must be obvious that they would have never seen the light of day had French institutional historians tackled the subject seriously as their Anglo-Saxon counterparts Palage and Malay have done. Thus Roger Portal, who teaches Russian history at the Sorbonne, has no hesitation in a small volume issued in 1970 in talking about the Maknovskina as a movement of anarchist inspiration, grouping under Markno's command, very diverse political and social elements and allying itself successively with the Bolsheviks and then with the White Armies, which, complicated the situation even further. The movement was liquidated in 1921, the Red Army absorbed part of its troops. And should this uncomplicated sawbone character, wish to apply for the imprimatur of the Kremlin, we should point out to him that even Soviet historians, have moved on from this. Such handling of Markno and of the Russian Revolution in general deserves some clarification of what a methodology really suited to the subject should be like. For a start, let us stress the condition sine qua non, a perfect knowledge of Russian ought to be a prerequisite, for only in that tongue are all sources accessible. Yet that is a necessary condition but not a sufficient one, for there is no shortage of students of Russian in France, other qualities are equally desirable, if not crucial the ability to tackle rigorously but open-mindedly the differing points of view of all parties concerned. Thus, such work implies a complete independence of mind, namely no dependency on any thesis supervisor nor on any Mandarin, and no concern to please displease the established authorities or some possible clientele. As we can see, this rules out dilettantes greedy for acclaim and academics preoccupied with furtherance of careers. Let us also consider the intense effort required to authenticate the accuracy and appropriateness of sources, the need to make things as accessible to the reader as possible in short, the accomplishment of a thankless and wearying task from which many recoil. Yet something very important is at stake, millions of men fought and died for their beliefs, others carry on their fight. That alone is what matters and not the self-esteem nor notoriety of any side. Contrary to the Leninists' zealot axiom only the truth is revolutionary, we know what this one-way truth amounts to let us adapt the adage and say that only the quest for the truth is revolutionary. As we see it, only with this attitude can can a fruitful approach be made to the events of the years 1917 to 1921 among others. To wind up this bibliographical tour we now must look at an area where the elementary rules we have just catalogued do not apply, novelistic literature. Without dwelling too long upon it, let us quote a few snippets from these over. Vetlugin, a white Russian refugee in Paris, performed the opening honours with a pamphlet published in 1920. A chapter of this is given over to the night over Ukraine, in fact to Markno who is depicted in the most caricaturish light. The author puts these words into his mouth, Free Russia needs neither posts nor telegraphs. Our ancestors wrote no letters and sent no telegrams and were none the worse for that. 
According to Vetligin, Markner only took his political bearings every autumn. Helen Isvolsky, daughter of the former Tsarist ambassador to France, follows Vedugin's example. She credits Markno with the first exploit of having murdered an aristocratic marshal who was imprudent enough to arrive to look into some shady affairs. Markno had been dispatched to Siberia, from where he escaped several times. He is feared and adored like a god. And there is more of the same to follow. Z. Arbatov published what purports to be a life of Markno, he describes him as being small of stature, arms stretching to the knees, face marked by smallpox, dark brown eyes, reminiscent of an owl blinded by a sudden light. The author claims to be the son of the household in which Markno allegedly set up his headquarters at the time of the occupation of Ekaterinoslav, according to Arbatov the Maknovists had supposedly and systematically sabred down in the street all who wore furs or good overcoats, amusing themselves by cutting off heads with one stroke and by other actions that need not be mentioned, for they undoubtedly testify to Arbatov's deranged mind. Gerasimenko, of whom we have already spoken, depicts Markno in similar colors. At age 11 he had allegedly been a shoelace seller in Marupol and distinguished himself by wayward behavior which had earned him a thrashing from his superior, who supposedly admitted to having smashed 40 rods on the back and head of young Nesta in three months, to no effect, for Nesta had allegedly taken his revenge by cutting the buttons off his clothes. We have seen the use to which these sources were put by Joseph Kessel, however, he does not stand alone. Boris Pilnyak produced a novel along similar lines. Both of them have been flayed by the Soviet historian Skegelev as we have seen. For the record let us note that Bogritsky, Mayakovsky and Damian Bedny all conceived atrocious poetry on Markno. The proletarian Count Alexei Tolstoy, no relation to the illustrious author of that name, an inveterate ex-monarchist who became Stalin's sycophant, mentions Markno and the insurgents in a novel, with equally unsavory imagination. Closer to our own day, Postovsky, the quote-unquote liberal Stalinist of the 1950s offers us an excellent example of novelistic invention, one scene takes place in the railway station in Pomoshnaya where two trainloads of Maknavists speed past the narrator, who nonetheless has time to store a mountain of details in his memory, such as the tattoos of a broken-nosed sailor. I did not have time to take in the details of this masterpiece. All I can remember is a hodgepodge of female legs, hearts, daggers and serpents. The author obviously has problems matching the time to his fertile imaginings. He sees Markno in a black felt cap and unbuttoned blouse, his expression signified laziness, smug serenity, languor. A moistened fringe fell over his furrowing brow. His eyes, the mischievous yet empty eyes of a polecat or a paranoiac, glinted with a hothead's fury. Lazily, Markno raised his revolver and without a glance at anybody, without taking aim, just fired. Why? Go ask him. Can anyone guess what goes on inside the head of a rampaging monster? What is going on inside the head of this Postovsky? No doubt serious mental storms in that he seeks to depict a scene that lasted for only a few seconds over six full pages of the most minute detail. Yet he is not the king of this particular castle. A British science fiction writer, Barrington Bailey, presents us with one Castor Krakno, leader of the death to life, anarchist movement. His French publisher, fearing that the illusion might not be too obvious, takes the trouble to resolve the equation Krakno equals Markno which instantly categorizes the setting and the intentions behind Bailey's novel. In his stellar kingdom, rent by civil war, Krakno emerges to mount a spirited celebration of anarchist nihilism and death to life. Finally, a study on the Cossacks blithely states that Markno was a stockler built blonde, dressed entirely in black, real name of Fukubida, a Jew converted at a very early age to anarchist beliefs. What can one say about all this literary garbage which certain of the aforementioned apprentice macnologists have no hesitation in utilizing as the basis for their delirious imaginings? To literary experts we shall leave the task of diagnosing the pathological roots of the inspirations of those scribblers whose compulsive myth-peddling and vulgarity are equaled by their incompetence. And let us add a personal note. During a 1960s screening in Moscow of the film adaptation of Vishnevsky's play The Optimistic Tragedy, one scene shows Markno carried on palanquins and holding a parasol, this sight, 
designed to provoke hilarity, was greeted by the hundreds of spectators by a stony silence, evidence that no one is taken in by the officially approved travesty. 33. Summing up and lessons Through the militant and revolutionary activities of Nestor Markno and his comrades we have been able to trace the process initiated in the Russian Empire by the tremors of 1905 continuing through the convulsions of 1917 and concluding with the torment of the years that followed. Hindsight has made our vista even wider. These events were only harbingers of a more thoroughgoing cataclysm which was to cast its shadow over the whole century. Viewed in this light, what happened in Ukraine takes on a tremendous significance. Let us take note of the curious repetition of history which turned the region under Maknavist influence, the steps of the southern Ukraine, into the main battleground of this process, just as it had been in the days of the great historical upheavals which followed the Asiatic invasions from the beginnings of the Christian era right up to the waning of the Middle Ages. Let us note too that the decisive military clashes of the Russian Civil War set Cossacks of various persuasions at one another's throats, white Cossacks, red Cossacks, yellow and blue, Ukrainian nationalist, Cossacks, and black Cossacks, Maknavist Zaporogs. Let us now look at the results and the lessons to be drawn. This upheaval, intended to make an end of all alienation and violent oppression, led a people which had but recently emerged only a few decades earlier from feudal serfdom, into an enslavement to the state without parallel and precedent in history. The cost in human terms was of catastrophic proportions, by our reckoning, Nearly one and a half million people lost their lives during these ghastly years in the Maknavist region and nearly twenty times as many in the whole of Russian territory in the course of armed struggle, repressions, famines, and epidemics, plus the huge losses inflicted by the Russo-German War. Dulyipoli, capital of Maknovia saw its population fall from 25,000 of 1917 to 12,027 by 1926. The Maknavist movement had lost 90% of its active participants, which is to, say 300,000 men, according to an estimate of March 1920. One image of this devastation, since the construction at the beginning of the 1930s by American engineers and slave laborers from the Gulag of the Dnieprestroy Dam near Alexandrovsk, the Maknavist region has seen its topography altered and the waterfalls and rapids on the Dnieper, features symbolic of the Zaporogs, have been submerged by flood waters. We have managed to pick up the trails of several Maknavists who got out to France, Karlamov, Mazer, and Zarenko settled in the Paris area near to Markno's home. Bolshakov and Soldatenko served with the Deruti column during the Spanish Revolution and fell at Villa Mayor near Zaragoza in 1937. David Polyakov, after refusing to wear the Yellow Star during the German occupation, was deported to and never returned from the Nazi camps, and it seems that two other Maknavists may have emigrated to Canada after 1945. The fate of other, less glorious protagonists proves equally tragic. Mimayevsky, the embezzling white general who commanded the army of white volunteers in 1919 only to be replaced in 1920 died of a heart attack on the very day that Rangel's defeated troops evacuated the peninsula. Baron General Rangel also died in 1929 in Brussels in mysterious circumstances. General Pokrovsky the hangman was killed in Bulgaria in 1923 by his own Cossacks. Slashev, criticized by his own in Constantinople, defected to the Reds, taught at the Higher Military Academy of the Red Army and died in Moscow in 1929 assassinated by someone who claimed to be the brother of one of his victims in the Crimea. During the Second World War, Krasnov and Shkuro formed Cossack units in the service of the Germans, but the Germans grew suspicious of them and avoided deploying them against the Red Army. In 1945 the British handed them over to Stalin, he had them hanged in Moscow's Red Square in 1947, with eleven other Cossack generals as traitors to the nation. Only Denikin died in bed, that same year, in the United States. As for the Red Generals, who distinguished themselves in the fight against the Maknavists, and had been burdened with medals and certitudes, they in turn fell headlong into the trap. Nestorovich who had commanded the Special Flying Corps in December 1920 against Markno, never recovered from this sinister assignment, while on a mission abroad, 
he abruptly gave up all activity and found a job as a factory worker. The GPU did not quite see it like that, Nestorovich was too knowledgeable about too many compromising matters. One of his former friends invited him to dinner and poisoned him. His corpse was photographed and the negative sent to Moscow as proof of his execution. Kotovsky who had been involved in Yakia's retreat and the hunting down of the Maknavists in January 1921 was killed in 1925 in unexplained circumstances by one of his associates, probably on GPU instructions. His excessive popularity in the army incurred the displeasure of Stalin who was concerned to eliminate all potential Bolshevik Bonaparte's. Franz, the commander-in-chief of the campaign against Markno in 1921, replaced Trotsky as commissar for war. He died on October 31, 1925, during a routine stomach operation. A haphazard accident can be ruled out, it had been on express orders from Stalin and the Central Committee that he had made up his mind to undergo the operation. According to one of his adjutants, he had had a premonition of its fatal outcome. Officially, he succumbed to an overdose of an aesthetic. The celebrated Red Generals Yakir, Eidman, Yuborovich, Primakov, Kork and Tukhachevsky were shot on July 11, 1937 after the gravest accusations. Levinson, S.S. Kaminv, Karkarin, Rakovsky, Kara Khan, Dibenko and Yakovlev, Epstein, who signed the agreement with Markno, disappeared when their turn came victims of the perverse operation of the mechanism which they themselves had set in motion. Probably none of them had sufficiently pondered St. Just's famous phrase, a revolution that stops halfway is digging its own grave. Only Voroshilov and Budyeni proved spineless enough to weather every storm, they passed away peaceably in their beds. Thus, sooner or later the victors shared the fate of the vanquished and they too were gobbled up by the cannibalistic revolution. Very few of them had realized that it was not enough to give the worm-eaten edifice of the Russian Empire a coat of red paint to change its nature. The enshrined system of exaggerated state centralization, the despicable nature of the methods used, the dictatorship of the leaders and the passive obedience of the masses could only have exacerbated, not the class struggle, but the competition for placements and in that game, no one could be sure that he would not be out blackguarded. But that is not all. The historical responsibilities must be determined with precision, Arshinov denounces the noxious role of Bolshevism which, snuffed out revolutionary initiative and the autonomous activity of the masses, thereby eradicating the greatest revolutionary opportunities that the workers had ever had in history. He reckons, however, that Bolshevism did not bear sole responsibility for the failure of the Russian Revolution. It has merely acted out what was devised decades ago by socialist science. Its every move was inspired by the general theory of scientific socialism. In Arshinov's view, the working class worldwide had to hold socialism as a whole responsible for the deplorable situation foisted upon the Russian peasants and workers. From which he deduced of course that the proletariat has no socialist friends, these being in reality enemies aspiring only to seize the product of their labor, and that they should count on nobody but themselves. Nesta Markno arrived at the same conclusion and recalls that it is by destroying the state once and for all, the state of which socialists are the stalwart supporters, that the toilers will at last be able to build the society of their dreams, quote. The final and utter liquidation of the state can only take place when the approach of the toilless struggle is as libertarian as possible, when they themselves will work out the structures for their social action. These structures must take the form of organs of social and economic self-direction, the reform of free, anti-authoritarian, Soviets. The revolutionary toilers and their vanguard, the anarchists, must analyze the nature and structure of these Soviets avid stipulate their revolutionary functions in advance. It is upon that that the positive evolution and development of anarchist ideas among those who will shift for themselves in liquidating the state in order to build the free society, is dependent. End quote. In this regard, the exemplary struggles and achievements spearheaded by Markno and the Ukrainian insurgents offer comfort to all who, some fine day, may seek return to these roots of the Russian and Ukrainian revolutions and this time see things through to their natural conclusion in a genuinely humane society. Alexander Skurda, 1982
documents from the Machnavists. To complement our study, we reprint in full the most telling statements of principle issued by the Machnavist movement. Document number one is lifted from the review Ruskaya MYSL, Russian Thought, Books 1 and 2, published in Sofia by Piotr Struve. The document contains the essential passages from the pamphlet, 32 pages in 8, published by the Gulyai Polinabat Anarchist Group in 1919 and previously inaccessible in the West. Document number 2 consists of the Machnavists' draft declaration, their political charter based on a Bulgarian edition published in Sofia in 1921, 37 pages in 32, a copy of which exists at the International Institute for Social History in Amsterdam. Lengthy quotations, in Russian, appeared in Kubanin's theses on free Soviets and Kolesnikov's The Worker Question, so we have retranslated it from the Russian and Bulgarian with Matin Zemliek's kind assistance in the case of the Bulgarian. Document number three is taken from the same Bulgarian publication Sofia. Documents numbers four to nine, originals of which are in the possession of the ISH in Amsterdam, were published in Russian in the Institute's journal, International Review of Social History Volume 13, Part 2, 1968, with a forward by I. J. Van Rossum, pp 246-268. Document number 10 was published in the Review Volner, The Wave, Detroit, number 24, December 1921. Document number 11, a reconstruction of Kemenizny's speech, has been borrowed from A. Nikolaev's First Among Equals, op. sit pp 44-46. Document number 1. A minute on the February 2, 1919 Second Regional Congress in Guliaipoli, attended by 2245 delegates from 350 districts, Soviets, unions, and frontline units. Comrade Markno declines the proposal that he chair the Congress, citing military development on the front and is elected honorary chairman of the Congress. The delegation which journeyed to Kharkov to make contact with the Bolshevik Provisional Government of Ukraine makes its report. Comrade Lavrov relates his conversation with the deputies, the delegation had not been received by ministers or commissars the spokesman reports that a response was forthcoming on the attitude of the provisional government of Ukraine to Bakko Markno, as yet there has been no formal agreement, though one is anticipated and the provisional government nurtures no hostile intent towards Markno and looks forward to doing all it can to help him in the struggle against the counter-revolution. During the ensuing debate, Comrade Chernanizny, delegate from the Novapavlovsk district, points out, the report informs us of the recent formation in Ukraine of a Bolshevik communist government, which is making ready to monopolize the Soviets. He went on to say, while you peasants, workers, and insurgents were containing the pressure from all the counter-revolutionary forces, that government, ensconced in Moscow and then in Kursk, waited for Ukraine's workers and peasants to liberate the territory from the enemy. Now that the enemy is beat, the government arrives among us calling itself Bolshevik and seeking to foist its party dictatorship upon us. Is that to be tolerated? We are non-party insurgents who have revolted against all our oppressors and we will not countenance fresh enslavement, no matter what party it may emanate from. Another delegate, the peasant Serafimov, declares, already a new danger looms before us, the danger of one party, the Bolsheviks, who are already forging new status chains destined for us. The Bolshevik government does its best to convince us that it serves the interests of workers and peasants and that it brings emancipation to toilers. But why then does it aspire to rule over us from above, from its ministerial offices? From our Russian brethren we know what sort of revolution Bolsheviks make. We know that up there the people are not free, and that the whim of the party, Bolshevik chaos and the violence of the commissarocracy rule the roost. Should this party attempt to bring such freedoms here to us in Ukraine, we must then announce loudly that we need no such savior or master, that we have no need of dictatorships, that we can arrange our new life for ourselves. Comrade Bosno, an anarchist insurgent, declares, no matter what the cost, we must set up. Soviets that are beyond all pressure from whatever parties. Only toilless Soviets, non-partisan, and freely elected are capable of affording us new freedoms and rescuing the toiling people from slavery and oppression. Long live freely elected anti-authoritarian Soviets. 
The Bolshevik communist Karpenko interrupts, but his speech is continually heckled. When he declares, the dictatorship of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie must be introduced, one voice retorts, at the moment all we see is the Bolsheviks dictatorship over the anarchists and left SRs. Another voice heckles, why do they send us commissarocrats? Those we can live without. But if we must have commissars, we can always appoint some from our own ranks. In a speech on the current situation, Chairman Veritelnikov offers the following important news. In 1905 when the atmosphere was so oppressive, an anarchist group was organized here in Guliaipoli. Its existence was soon made known when comrade Alexander Semenyuta, whose name was familiar to few people up to that point, died in action against the police. Comrade Markno was arrested and sent with many other revolutionaries for penal servitude, where he served ten full years. After the overthrow of the autocracy, Markno returned to Guliaipoli. When the revolutionary movement here took on a serious character, I was in Sebastopol. This joyous news brought me home to the town of my birth, where a harrowing scene awaited me, the Austro-German occupation AS. Events then moved at a dizzying pace. The Batko set off with one detachment, others spread out in the directions of Taganrog, Rostov, Tsaritsyn, etc. Comrade Markno delivers a purely revolutionary address of unmistakably anarchist tone and directed at the Bolsheviks. For openers, Markno stated that the people, starving and bereft of everything, bled white after the fratricidal war, refused to fight on the front. But in place of the bloody Tsar, a new criminal had ensconced himself on the throne, in the shape of the provisional government. At that point anarchists mounted intense propaganda and fought with every means at their disposal against the provisional government's adventure. Everywhere, in factories, workshops and barracks, anarchists explained that the fratricidal war at the front had to be prosecuted further, which led, in Petrograd, to their being arrested at their headquarters at Denovo House and to the shooting of certain of their number. Noting that anarchists and Bolsheviks had been united then by the persecution they suffered, Markno declares, once power had fallen into the hands of the toiling people in the shape of freely elected Soviets, things proceeded, apace. These free Soviets did not long survive. The Bolshevik party extended its monopoly over them and set about purging the revolutionary Soviets and persecuting anarchists, those who, only the day before, had been hunted and persecuted with them now refused to acknowledge their fellow strugglers. Until today when we witness the Bolsheviks' brute force and oppressive violence against toiling people who can stand no more. In conclusion, Comrade Markno declares that if the Bolsheviks are coming to help their comrades he will tell them, welcome, dear brothers, but if they come to bring Ukraine under their sway, we shall tell them, hands off. Other speakers, Kosonsky, Chuniak, spoke to the same motion. Kosonsky declares, no party has any right to arrogate state power to itself. Chuniak stipulates that, all who denounce the activities of the commissars and chakers have themselves sampled them to their cost, and have been under their yoke. Many decent revolutionaries who knew jail, imprisonment and penal servitude during Tsarism, are now once again filling Russia's prisons. He insists that the necessary steps be taken to set up economic Soviets, non-party political and anti-authoritarian on the basis of elective principles allowing for recall of representatives failing to act upon the wishes of their mandatories. We want all vital issues resolved on the spot and not according to the decrees, f some power on high, we want, all workers and peasants to determine their destinies for themselves, with delegates having merely to implement the wishes of the toilers. Comrade Kostin, left SR, speaks of peasant uprisings against the Bolsheviks, these are not the actions of individuals, rather, the peasants of many districts, marching out with their wives, children, and aged parents to face the bullets of the Lets and Chinese in that they can see no other option. These are all your brothers, the same poor peasants every bit as oppressed as you are here in Ukraine. Why do they revolt against the Bolsheviks to the cry of all power to the Soviets? Down with the commissarocrat because the policy of those currently in power in Russia exclamation question mark pushes them to it. For instance, the Bolsheviks have invented supply detachments. They arm workers and send them into the countryside to wrest wheat from the peasants by force, giving them nothing in return. 
They carry off the last reserves of wheat, often bought by the peasants themselves and they carry off the last jugful of milk, the last item of clothing, the last pair of boots, they take everything. They organize general plunder, which has become the rule. That in a few words is what Bolshevik policy is all about. Comrade Baron, anarchist, also speaks out against the Bolsheviks. We have what is called the Soviet government, which describes itself as a worker peasant government but which not one of us has elected. It is a government of usurpers that capitalizes on our weakness, the absence of close cohesion from our ranks wields its usurper power over us, makes deals with foreign imperialism and again slips a noose around the necks of toiling people. The Bolsheviks, who were revolutionaries before the October coup d'etat, now shoot genuine revolutionaries whose only crime is to think differently from them. Baron concludes his speech with these words, Insurgent comrades. Your task now consists of creating everywhere, in every single village, anti-authoritarian and freely elected Soviets which will meet all your needs, and of building your economic life and defending your real interests without interference from any commissars representing the narrow interests of one party and subjecting you from above to their party's yoke. There is no way to complete emancipation from the yoke of capitalism and of all power, no way to social revolution except through economic, anti-authoritarian, free Soviets, through an authentic regime of toilless Soviets. Long live the free anti-authoritarian people which builds its life, without any political authorities and tutors at all. Batko Markno endorses the resolution moved by the anarchists' union, the left SRs, the insurgents and the Congress Presidium. It is carried by 150 votes to 29 against, with 20 abstentions. The resolution is scathing in its assessment of Bolshevism, quote. The political commissars and others appointed by government and not elected by us monitor every move of the local Soviets and ruthlessly crack down on peasant and worker comrades who make a stand to defend the people's freedom against the representatives of central government. The latter, styling itself the worker peasant government of Russia and of Ukraine, is blindly obedient to the party of Bolshevik communists who, in the narrow interests of their party, persecute all other revolutionary organizations in despicable fashion. Sheltering behind the slogan dictatorship of the proletariat, the Bolshevik communists have decreed themselves a monopoly on the revolution, regarding all who do not think as they do as counter-revolutionaries. The Bolshevik authorities arrest and shoot left SRs and anarchists, ban their newspapers, and stifle any manifestation of revolutionary discourse. To demonstrate its power and without consulting the workers and peasants, the Bolshevik government has opened negotiations with the allied imperialist governments, promising them all sorts of advantages and concessions and allowing them to bring troops into certain places in Russia which thereby come under the sway of the allies. The Second Regional Congress of Frontline Fighters, Insurgents, Workers and peasants from the Gulyai region calls upon comrade peasants and workers vigilantly to monitor the actions of the Soviet Bolshevik government which, through its handiwork, represents a real threat to worker and peasant revolution. That different revolutionary organizations, freely expressing their ideas, should exist is only normal, but we will not allow any to set itself up as the only power and force others to dance to its tune. In our insurgent struggle, we need a fraternal family of workers and peasants to defend land, truth and liberty. The Second Regional Congress urgently carried LS upon worker and peasant comrades to undertake for themselves, on the spot, without any constraints or decrees and despite all oppressors and aggressors the world over, the building of a free society without lords or masters and without subject slaves, without rich or poor. The Congress salutes all the workers and peasants of Russia who struggle as we do against world imperialism. Down with the commissarocrats and self-appointed representatives. Down with the Chika, the new Okrana. Long live the freely elected worker-peasant Soviets. Down with the exclusively Bolshevik Soviets. Down with the accords between the Russian and international bourgeoisie. Shame on the socialist government that parleys with the imperialist allies. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution. End quote. The Congress then passes a resolution against anti-Jewish looting, attacks and pogroms carried out by various suspect individuals who misuse the name of decent insurgents. 
Apropos of pogroms against Jews, this resolution spelled out the following stance, quote, National antagonism, which in some places has taken the form of anti-Jewish pogroms, is a bequest of the autocratic regime. The Tsarist government whipped up the unconscious masses of the people against the Jews, in the hope of thereby shifting responsibility for its crimes onto the poor Jewish mass, thereby distracting the attention of the toiling people away from the real causes of their misery, the yoke of Tsarist autocracy and its thugs. End quote. The movement's internationalism finds expression in the following points from the resolution, quote. The oppressed and exploited of every nationality and persuasion have revolted in solidarity with the Russian Revolution and the corning worldwide social revolution. The workers and peasants of every land and all nationalities face a huge common task, the overthrow of the yoke of the bourgeoisie, the exploiter class, the overthrow of the yoke of capital and state with an eye to establishment of a new social order founded on liberty, fraternity and justice. The exploited of every nationality, whether they be Russian, Polish, Latvian, Armenian, Jew or German, must come together into one huge united community of workers and peasants and then, in a mighty onslaught, deal a final decisive blow to the class of capitalist imperialists and their lackeys in order to shrug off once and for all the shackles of economic slavery and spiritual serfdom. Down with capital and power. Down with religious prejudices and national hatreds. Long live the social revolution. End quote. On the matter of organization of the front, Congress, repudiating mobilization through constraint, came out in favor of mandatory mobilization, each peasant capable of bearing arms ought himself to recognize his duty to join the ranks of the insurgents and to defend the interests of the whole toiling people of Ukraine. On the agrarian issue, the Congress passes a resolution based on the following principles, quote, the land belongs to no one and only those who work it may have the use of it. The land should pass into the hands of Ukraine's toiling peasantry gratis, in accordance with an egalitarian working arrangement, i.e. it should ensure that the needs of each person are met according to established norms and should be worked by each individual in person. Until such time as the agrarian issue is radically resolved, Congress wants local agrarian committees to draw up an immediate inventory of all holdings of the big landowners the common lands and all the rest, then they can share them among the landless peasants or peasants with inadequate holdings, supplying them with the wherewithal for planting. End quote. Document number two. Draft declaration of the, Maknavist, Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine adopted on October 20, 1919 at a session of the Military Revolutionary Soviet. The toiling classes of Ukraine are today confronting events of enormous importance and historic implications. Without doubt, the significance of these events goes beyond the limits of the revolutionary insurgent army's activity. But, being in the vanguard of the fight in progress, the latter deems it its duty to spell out to the toilers of Ukraine, Russia and the whole world the aims for which it fights, as well as its analysis of recent happenings and the current situation. In February-March 1917, Russia and Ukraine experienced the first revolution, which led to the fall of Tsarist autocracy and brought about the advent of a state political power comprised at first of personages from the big industrial bourgeoisie and then of representatives of the small and medium bourgeoisie. Neither of those two governments proved stable. Eight months were enough for the revolutionary masses to overthrow these authorities which had nothing in common with the interests and aspirations of toilers. As early as July 1917, the necessity of a second revolution was apparent. This took place at the end of October and paved the way for seizure of state power by the Bolshevik Social Democrat Party which looked upon itself as representing the revolutionary proletariat and poor peasantry or, to put it another way, the social revolution. That party was very soon waging an ongoing campaign against all competing parties with an eye to arrogating power to itself. Since its watchwords coincided with the aspirations of the toiling masses, the latter threw their weight behind it when the crucial time came. And so this eight-month period of government by the bourgeoisie in coalition and of rivalry between the differing political parties ended in the Bolshevik parties taking power. However it very quickly became apparent that this party had this state power, just like any party and, 
All state power functioned only for themselves and turned out to be utterly powerless to achieve the great objectives of the social revolution. By virtue of that very fact they were a hindrance to the free creative activity of the toiling masses who alone were capable of tackling this task. It is self-evident that in controlling the whole of economic and social life, any state power inevitably gives rise to new political and economic privileges and undermines the very foundations of social revolution. The Bolshevik Communist Party's inability to offer an authentic avenue of struggle for socialism quite naturally led to discontent, disappointment and bitterness among the toiling masses. The disorganized condition of economic life, the consequence of a bad agrarian policy led to serious disturbances in the countryside. The Bolshevik authorities have succeeded, however, in organizing in Russia a mighty state machine and a compliant army which it uses as its predecessors did, to stamp on any manifestation of popular discontent and resistance. In Ukraine the situation is otherwise. Before making the acquaintance of the Bolshevik authorities, Ukraine was occupied by the Austro-Germans who installed their vassal, the Hetman Skoropadsky there. They were replaced by the power of Putlura. The excesses of these authorities triggered an explosion of outrage from the people and a wholesale rejection of the very idea of state power, which assumed the form of a mighty popular insurgent movement, driven by an authentically revolutionary anti-party and anti-authoritarian mentality. In a series of engagements after the departure of the Austro-Germans, revolutionary insurgents purged Ukraine of supporters of the Hetman and of Putlura the Bolshevik communist authorities seized upon this to arrive and ensconce themselves in the spring of 1919, bringing disappointment very quickly in their wake. Within a few months, the discontent and hostility of the toiling masses of town and above all of countryside was made violently manifest. Large regions, such as the provinces of Ekaterinoslav and Tavrida, began to drift more and more unmistakably towards economic and social self-organization on a basis of animosity towards parties and state power. No political activity was allowed there. Towards the end of the summer, the whole country was prey to huge peasant insurgent movements against the Communist Party's arbitrary rule. The Third Revolution comes to light and guides this widespread insurrection. Meanwhile, the reaction had raised its head. The Third Revolution stood against the attempt to restore the old regime. In the hope of finding themselves once again masters of the situation by annihilating both their enemies, the revolutionary insurrection and the reaction, the Bolshevik authorities plotted and treacherously facilitated the crushing of the main core of the Maknavist insurgent army. However the state machinery and armed forces of the Bolshevik communist authorities in turn proved incapable of putting down roots in Ukraine and of replacing the revolutionary insurgent movement in its fight against Denikin. The revolutionary insurgents emerged from these difficult circumstances. Weakened but not defeated. Driven far from their home ground, they strove to survive at any price and while roaming other regions of Ukraine they prosecuted an all-out struggle against the Denikinists, against Trotsky's deliberate misrepresentations and the dangerous setback to the revolution. Now the flames of peasant insurrection and the struggle against reaction are raging throughout the whole Ukraine. A new enemy of the toilers appears, in the shape of Putlira's bourgeois, republican government. A confrontation, at once inevitable and critical, only time will tell who will emerge victorious from it, pits the notion of libertarian organization as taken up by significant masses in Ukraine against the notion of political power, be it monarchist, Bolshevik communist or bourgeois republican. Such, in broad outline, has been the hard revolutionary experience that we Maknavist insurgents have been through over these past two and a half years of revolution. It only remains for us to add that in our region and in many another more distant one, we have been witnesses to and participants in successful essays in libertarian social and economic organizing, free of interference from any government. Most of them were interrupted only following violent intervention by some authority or another. The upshot of this difficult but enriching experience, as well as the theoretical tenets that characterize it, leads us to make the following clear and specific declaration. The unraveling of the revolution has convinced us beyond all question that no political party and no state authority is capable of resolving the great issues of our day, or of relaunching and organizing the country's devastated economy while stimulating and meeting the needs of the toiling masses. 
We are persuaded that in the light of this experience, huge masses of the peasants and workers of Ukraine have come to the same conclusion and that they will not countenance any political oppression. Our reckoning is that in the near future all the toiling classes will arrive at the same conclusion and that they themselves will see to the organizing of their professional, economic, social and cultural lives on the basis of free principles, dispensing with the oversight, pressure and dictatorship of any personage, party or power whatever. We declare that the popular insurgent movement presently developing in Ukraine represents the start of the Great Third Revolution which will once and for all free the toiling masses of all oppression by state and capital, be it private or statist. We declare that our Maknavist insurgent army is merely the fighting core of this Ukrainian people's revolutionary movement, a core whose task consists everywhere of organizing insurgent forces and helping insurgent toilers in their struggle against all abuse of power and capital. Ukraine is on the brink of a genuine peasant social revolution. That is the import of the situation. We Maknavist insurgents are the children of that revolution, here to serve and protect it. Whenever it spreads like a mighty brush fire through the whole of the toilers Ukraine, freeing it of all aggressors and all powers, we faithful fighters will mingle with the millions of people's insurgents. Then, shoulder to shoulder, we will partake in the free building of a new life. As regards our thinking on the essential issues of economic and social reconstruction, we regard it as essential that the following be stressed, once toilers have the freedom required to determine their fate for themselves, they will naturally and inevitably, the vast majority of them, move towards realization of genuinely communist social principles. We reckon that only the toiling masses have the capacity to enact these principles, provided that they have access to the completest freedom of socio-economic creation, thus we consider imposition of our ideal by force as quite irrational and out of place. We think, likewise, that it would be wrong to seek to trail the masses along in our wake by means of leadership from above. We mean to restrict our role to simple theoretical and organizational assistance, in the form of proposals, advice, suggestions or guidance. Our thinking is that whereas the people should have the opportunity to listen to all opinion and advice, they alone should decide to act upon them with absolute independence and freedom, without interference from parties, dictators or governments of any sort. We make every effort to communicate these views to the toiling masses, whilst focusing their attention upon their own autonomous role in free Soviet construction. The Soviet System Our conception of an authentic system of free Soviets we express as follows. In order to introduce a new economic and social life, the peasants and workers naturally and freely set up their social and economic organizations, village committees or Soviets, cooperatives, factory and workshop committees, mine committees, railroad, post and telegraphs organizations and every other union and organization imaginable. In order to establish natural liaison between all these unions and associations, they set up agencies federated from the bottom up, in the shape of economic Soviets whose technical task is to regulate social and economic life on a large scale. These Soviets may be district Soviets, town Soviets, regional Soviets, etc. organized as the need arises on a basis of free principles. In no case would these be political institutions led by this or that politician or political party, who would dictate their wishes, as happens behind the mask of Soviet power. These Soviets are only the executive arms of the assemblies from which they emanate. Such a Soviet arrangement is a true reflection of the organization of the peasants and workers. If this creation is indeed the free handiwork of the peasant and worker masses themselves, if the bracing economic work of all the grassroots agencies and federative Soviet organizations begins to attract more and more toilers, without any interference or arbitrary meddling by any party or authorities whatever, then, by our reckoning, it will be possible speedily to introduce an economic and social system based on the principles of social equality, justice and fraternity and thereby put paid to the existence of class differences, political parties and states, as well as the domination of one nationality over others. Gradually and naturally the backward and non-toiler strata of the population will be absorbed into this system. All political activity which leads inescapably to creation of privilege and a mechanism for economic and political enslavement of the toiling masses will be proved redundant in practice, 
and political organizations will tend to wither away of themselves. Our answer to the questions that will be put regarding official agencies and sundry social pursuits relating to education, medicine, statistics, registration of marriages, deaths and births, etc. is that maximum scope will be afforded the priceless and prolific initiative of the individual, within the framework of the Soviet. All of this will be no problem and will be best resolved by local agencies of self-governance. Judicial and Administrative Machinery As far as the depiction of this machinery as necessity goes, we must first of all reaffirm our position in principle, we are against all rigid judicial and police machinery, against any legislative code prescribed once and for all time, for these involve gross violations of genuine justice and of the real protections of the population. These ought not to be organized but should be instead the living, free and creative act of the community. Which is why all obsolete forms of justice, court administration, revolutionary tribunals, repressive laws, police or militia, chica, prisons and all other sterile and useless anachronisms must disappear of themselves or be abolished from the very first breath of the free life, right from the very first steps of the free and living organization of society and the economy. The free organizations, associations, and Soviets of workers and peasants must themselves prescribe this or that form of justice. Such justice should not be enforced by specialist officials, but rather by trustees who enjoy the confidence of the local population, by arrangement with it and utterly repudiating sanctions prescribed in the past. Likewise, popular self-defense must be based on free organization, and not left to specialist militias. Not only does formal organization of justice and defense by the state not achieve its aims, but it is a betrayal of all true justice and defense. The question of supplies. At present this question could not be posed any more acutely. Resolution of it is of the utmost urgency, for the whole fate of the revolution hinges upon it right now. The major flaw in the previous revolution, the Bolsheviks A.S., proceeded from the complete disorganization of supplies, which led to a dichotomy between town and countryside. The toilers must pay the utmost attention to it. This issue was particularly easy to resolve at the beginning of the revolution, when life was not yet incomplete. Disarray and when food was available everywhere in more or less adequate supply. At that point, the contest between socialist parties for control of political power and then the Bolshevik party's struggle to hold on to it, monopolized the attention of the workers and peasants who left the question unresolved and failed to display sufficient vigilance. As for the Bolshevik authorities, they proved quite naturally incapable of resolving the matter. Here too we reckon that a just resolution of this matter and restoration to order of everything relating to it can only be devised by the toilers themselves through their free organizations. None but they will be able to settle the matter viably. In this regard, the toilers must fight shy of disunity, and close unity between workers and peasants has to be achieved. This will not be hard if they dispense with political organizations and verbose politicians. Released from all political authority, the towns will convene a comprehensive congress of workers and peasants and this will establish among its priorities the supply question and the re-establishment of economic links between towns and countryside, setting in train an equitable exchange of basic necessities. It will be up to trades organizations, cooperatives, and transport agencies to take this further. Suitable agencies will be set up to seek out, consolidate and relaunch industrial and agricultural production. These will introduce a system for trade and fair distribution of goods. In this context, the workers and peasants cooperatives and free associations will have to play a crucial role. Only in this way, we reckon, can this particularly important issue of supply be resolved. The land question. The process of rebuilding and rapidly improving our agrarian economy which is at present in ruins and very limited, requires reorganization of the working of the land through absolutely free and voluntary. Decision-making by the toiling agricultural population in its entirety, obviously help from experts can be assumed. The village traders will have to be removed from this process quickly. We are persuaded that the solution to this problem of land will emerge unaided through communist organization of the peasant economy. Everyone will quickly be persuaded that growth of output and the meeting of all needs can only be ensured by the community and not by private individuals. 
However, any imposition of communism through constraint or top-down administration must be rejected. The Bolsheviks' decree regarding nationalization of the land, which is to say the placing of all lands in the hands of the state, in fact the hands of the government, its agencies, and functionaries, must be disregarded. A state takeover of land will inescapably lead, not to fair and free agricultural structures, but to the reappearance, of a new exploiter and master in the shape of the state, which will have recourse, as bosses do, to wage slavery and will impose all manner of corvees, levies, etc. upon the peasantry by force, just as its Pomieski predecessors did. The peasantry will reap no advantage from being faced by just one master, the state, even more. Powerful and cruel than the thousands of little bosses, masters, and Pomieskis. Land seized from Great estate owners should not be at the disposal of the state but placed in the hands of those who actually work them, the peasant organizations, free communes, and other unions. The manner in which the land, equipment, and very organization of the agricultural economy are to be handled should be worked out freely at peasant congresses, after discussion and passed as resolutions, without any interference by any authority whatsoever. We consider that solution of all these matters by the peasants themselves will usher in a natural process of expansion of the social organizations of the peasant economy, beginning, say, with egalitarian and commensurate division of the land, farm equipment and livestock, with social organization of labor and of the distribution of produce on a basis of cooperation, with social usage of the land and equipment, etc., that is to say, according to a more or less avowedly communist formula. The manual and mental exertions of experienced and capable villagers, in dose concert with workers' organizations, will complement this process and speed its development. Meanwhile, private holdings will be speedily and easily whittled down. The active peasant population will readily gain the upper hand over representatives of the large proprietor class by first of all confiscating their estates for the benefit of the community and then integrating them naturally into the social organization. Let us draw the attention of the peasant population to expanded cooperative organizations, artels, and production for distribution. Our reckoning is that cooperative organization is, as an initial phase, the most appropriate and natural step along the road to constructing the agricultural economy on new foundations. What is called the Soviet economy, where, inevitably, wage slavery and arbitrariness and violence from Bolshevik communist functionaries prevail must be wholly eradicated. The issue of the role of capable and specialist agronomists, as well as sundry other problems can be settled through discussion, as will decisions taken by peasant organizations and peasant congresses. Wage slavery in all its manifestations must be eradicated beyond recovery. It is all too apparent that a fair solution and further evolution of the land question are largely and closely dependent upon an equitable solution of the labor question. It is also up to the workers' organizations to establish a number of links with the villages, enough such links to be in a position to barter all sorts of industrially produced materials and items for agricultural produce. Only a close, brotherly union of worker and peasant in organizations for mutual aid in production and in economic exchange, will be able to devise a natural, well-planned and fair solution to the agrarian question. The Labor Question Having witnessed many an attempt mounted by various political parties, businessmen or erudite personages to resolve the labor issue, and having scrupulously examined the idea and the results of state takeover, nationalization, of the means and instruments of worker production, the mines, communications, workshops, factories, etc., as well as of the workers' organizations themselves, trades unions, factory and workshop committees, cooperatives, etc., we can announce with certainty that there is one genuine and fair solution to the workers' question, the transfer of all the means, instruments and materials of labor, production and transportation, not to the complete disposal of the state, this new boss and exploiter which uses wage slavery and is no less oppressive of the workers than private entrepreneurs, but to the workers' organizations and unions in natural and free association with one another and in liaison with peasant organizations through the good offices of their economic Soviets. It is our conviction that only such a resolution of the labor issue will release the energy and activity of the worker masses, give a fresh boost to repair of the devastated industrial economy, render exploitation and oppression impossible, 
and put paid to speculation and swindling and bring to an end the artificial escalation of prices and runaway rise in the cost of living. We have come to the belief that only the workers, with the help of their free organizations and unions, will be able to secure their release from the yoke of state and capital, private and state alike, take over the working of mineral and coal reserves, get workshops and factories back into operation, establish equitable exchanges of products between different regions, towns and countryside, get rail traffic moving again, in short, breathe life back into the moribund shell of our economic organization. No state authorities, no party, no system for direction and supervision of workers, commissars, officials, political activists and others can, we are thoroughly persuaded, meet the target set. The organization of work, production, transportation, distribution and exchange should be the task of free workers unions, abetted by experienced and competent individuals, in a context of free labor in factories and workshops. In order to ensure that such organization is active and its development fruitful it is vital that, above all else, genuine worker congresses and conferences be prepared on free foundations, without pressures or dictatorship from parties or individuals. Only those free congresses and conferences will have the capacity to arrive at an effective resolution of all the urgent issues of worker life and of worker construction along necessary and purposeful lines. Needless to say, just resolution of and further progress on the worker question are largely dependent on an equitable solution to the supply issue and the division of the land, as well as the financial question, which is also closely bound up with the worker question. The housing issue is part and parcel of this and so we are offering only the essence of our position on this matter. One of the primary tasks of the free worker organizations is to see to equitable allocation of available accommodation and thereby pursue the construction of requisite housing and this is achievable only in collaboration with those in charge of housing management, the House and District Committee. The Financial Question The financial system cannot be divorced from the capitalist system. The latter will soon be replaced by free communist organization of the economy which will incontrovertibly lead to the disappearance of the finance system and its replacement by direct exchange of produce through the social organization of production, transportation and distribution. However this transformation will not be effected in a day. Although the monetary system today may be in complete disarray it must of necessity continue to operate for a time. For the moment, it is vital that it be organized on new foundations. Thus it is not a matter of retaining or re-establishing it, but only of adapting it on a temporary basis to fairer ground rules. Up until the October coup d'etat, the people's wealth was concentrated either in the state's hands or in those of the capitalists and their agencies. Compulsory taxation and growing exploitation were at the root of this concentration. The Bolshevik communist authorities set themselves above the toilers as a boss exploiter state. They see themselves as the rulers and organizers of the country's monetary system. In fact the Bolshevik state and its officials have sole disposition of the people's wealth. In our view, this situation has to change radically. In keeping with the introduction and expansion of the system of free toilers Soviets, ushering in a new and free life, all compulsory taxation should be discontinued and replaced by free and voluntary contributions from toilers. In a context of free and independent construction, these contributions will undoubtedly produce the best results. By implication, the state's centralized public treasury, in whatever form it may appear, evening the guise of People's Bank, should be wound up and replaced by the decentralized system of genuine People's Banks established along cooperative lines. The founders and depositors of these banks should be workers and peasants only, that is to say their associations, unions, and organizations, on the basis of a freely agreed levi. In the case of unavoidable outlay on this or that undertaking or service at a regional or even national level, take posts and telegraphs, for instance, the General Congress or Soviet of that agency should receive the required sum from the people's banks. These latter may be communal, Soviet or social, etc. as the case may be. The amount of these voluntary contributions will be determined by reckoning social needs and outlays. Not one single kopeck of the people's money may be spent without the express permission of the organization, be it Congress, Commune, Soviet or Union. 
At the appointed time, the different social services and agencies submit their projected expenditure to their respective agencies which, if need be, endorse the projected budget. Such, in broad outline, is the financial system which we think should be employed during the time when currency and money circulation are still extant. Only that sort of an arrangement is going to be fully compatible with an authentic Soviet system. As regards currency as such, at the outset there may be more of this in circulation than needed. Thus, as the new organization of labor is reinforced and develops, workers and peasants will move from the money system towards the system of simply recording social labor performed. Such recording will afford the bearer the right to draw from social stores and markets those items and articles of which he has need, and which will begin to be in plentiful supply thanks to the organization of the new need-centered economic machinery the day is not far off when every toiler, thanks to his, labors on society's behalf, and thus on his own behalf as a member of society, will upon producing the necessary proof, be able to obtain those products and goods he cannot do without. The National Question Clearly, each national group has a natural and indisputable entitlement to speak its language freely, live in accordance with its customs, retain its beliefs and rituals, draw up its school books and have its own managerial establishments and agencies, in short, to maintain and develop its national culture in every sphere. It is obvious that this clear and specific stance has absolutely nothing to do with narrow nationalism of the separatist variety which pits nation against nation and substitutes an artificial and harmful separation for the struggle to achieve a natural social union of toilers in one shared social communion. In our view, national aspirations of a natural, wholesome character, language, customs, culture, etc., can achieve full and fruitful satisfaction only in the union of nationalities rather than in their antagonism. One people's struggle for liberation leads naturally to the same chauvinistic struggle on the part of other peoples and the upshot, inevitably, is isolation and animosity between the different nations. Of necessity, this appreciation of the national question, a profoundly bourgeois and negative one, leads on to absurd and bloody national conflicts. The speedy construction of a new life on socialist foundations will ineluctably lead to development of the culture peculiar to each nationality. Whenever we Machnavist, insurgents speak of independence of Ukraine, we ground it in the social and economic plane of the toilers. We proclaim the right of the Ukrainian people, and every other nation, to self-determination, not in the narrow, nationalist sense of a putlura, but in the sense of the toiler's right to self-determination. We declare that the toiling folk of Ukraine's towns and countryside have shown everyone through their heroic fight that they do not wish any longer to suffer political power and have no use for it, and that they consciously aspire to a libertarian society. We thus declare that all political power of whatever provenance, that seeks to rule and direct by means of constraint and arbitrariness, is to be regarded by the toiling Ukrainian masses as an enemy and counter-revolutionary. To the very last drop of their blood they will wage a ferocious struggle against it, in defense of their entitlement to self-organization. Needless to say, in the society founded on truly Soviet foundations, such as we have spelled them out, the question of proportional representation and other political procedures do not arise. Culture and Education In a free society, culture and education cannot be the monopoly of the state, nor of government. They can only be the concern of individuals and organizations freely and naturally united with one another. The living and free creation of the cultural values to which the spirit of the toiling masses will cling only come about in those conditions. Civil Liberties It must be self-evident that the free organization of society affords every practical opportunity for realization of what are called civil liberties, freedom of speech, of the press, of conscience, of worship, of assembly, of union, of organization, etc. The defense of society. For as long as the free society may need to look to its defenses against outside attack, IR will have to organize its self-defenses, its army. We see this as a free contingent, founded on the principle of election to positions of responsibility, and closely tied to the populace. It should be placed under the authority of the toilers' organizations of the towns and countryside so as to protect them against any violent trespass on the part of any state or capitalist power, and to guarantee them freedom of social construction. 
relations with foreign states. The expanded congresses that represent all the organizations from the towns and villages, which make up the free society, will appoint a commission whose task it is to maintain regular relations with foreign states. This activity ought to be public and free of ambiguousness, no secret diplomacy can be countenanced. Issues that the Commission cannot resolve will be left for extraordinary Congresses to debate and determine. Such, as we see it, are the bases upon which the free, just and, wholesome society for which we are fighting, should be founded. It is not for us to impose these ideas, upon the toiling populace through coercion, our reckoning is that our duty is merely to make our view known and to offer workers and peasants the chance to debate this viewpoint freely, this and others as well, so that they may have absolute freedom to opt for this or that path to the economic and social reconstruction of society. We are convinced of it, it is only by appealing to the most comprehensive freedom of inquiry and experiment in matters of reconstruction that the toiling population will be able to devise the natural route that leads on to an authentic and wholesome socialism. This freedom of inquiry and experimentation in construction we shall maintain and defend with all our might. It will no doubt be defended in the same way by all the toilers of Ukraine whom we call upon to take a hand in our great common fight, amending as the need arises the inevitable mistakes and shortcomings, by displaying their sympathy and bolstering it through the continual recruitment of new fighters and defenders of freedom. It is through the concerted efforts of the broader community of toilers that the shape of the new society will be freely molded, and by defending this entitlement to creative freedom with armed force that we shall win. Document number 3. To the entire working population of the city of Alexandrovsk and environs. Comrades and citizens. Detachments of the Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine, Maknavist, are at present stationed in your city. That army has broken the back of the Denikinists, defeating them between Uman and Pomoshnaya, and is hotly pursuing the remnants of the enemy as they flee eastwards. The staff and the entire Maknavist movement deem it their most important duty to inform you of the following. 1. Hitherto you have been told on dot every side that Maknavists were bandits, brigands, and pogromists. Be informed that this is the foulest slander, the members of our insurgent army are decent revolutionary peasants and workers. In any case, let the peaceable population of the city, regardless of nationality, be assured of its safety, let it carry on blithely with its work and let it not look upon us as its enemies. 2. The revolutionary insurgent army has set itself the goal of assisting the peasants and the workers in their long and demanding struggle to emancipate toilers from every form of the yoke of capital and political power, a catastrophic yoke which they can well do without. For that reason, our army appears as the friend and defender of the workers, peasants and the poor generally. It relies not only upon their sympathy and their trust but equally upon their collaboration and involvement. Whilst not meddling in the civilian life of the population, the insurgent army will be taking certain essential measures aimed at the wealthy bourgeois class, as well as at Denikinists and their supporters. Measures that will be enforced in an organized way. Persons who may arrive to carry out searches and make arrests in the name of the Maknavists should, if they fail to produce a warrant, seal and signature from the unit commander and signature of the army inspection service, be instantly placed under arrest and brought before the unit staff or that of the inspection branch. The same procedure should be applied to looters and assailants who may face execution on the spot. 3. The revolutionary insurgent army urges the toiling population of the city and its environs to embark forthwith upon independent organizational endeavor, to wit, any organization representative of local factory workers, railroad workers, posts, and telegraphs employees and peasants shall convene a general conference of representatives of all the region's toilers. That conference is to raise, discuss and resolve a whole series of social and economic issues, city defenses, organization of fair distribution of essential goods and socially useful items available in the city, it will see to relations between the city and the villages so as to organize exchange of goods and merchandise. This assembly will lay the lasting groundwork for a free system of peasant and worker Soviets. Non-authoritarian reconstruction of social and economic life should thus be initiated. 4. The Revolutionary Insurgent Army calls upon the entire toiling population of the city and its 
environs to embark in a general way upon autonomous activity in matters social and military alike. The insurgent army will withdraw from the city just as soon as its work has been completed. The toiling population itself is to see to the organization of its social and economic life as well as its defenses against all trespass on the part of the bourgeoisie and any authorities, and is to take upon itself the struggle for the complete success of the revolution. Alexandrovsk, October 7, 1919 The Staff of the Insurgent Army, Maknavist Document Number 4 Peasant Comrades the toiling peasantry of Ukraine has been struggling against its age-old enemies and oppressors for many a long year. Thousands of the finest sons of the revolution have fallen in the struggle for complete emancipation of toilers from every yoke. A mortal blow was dealt to the butcher Denikin through the heroic efforts of the insurgent army of Ukraine. The peasant insurgents, with their guide, Bakko Markno, at their head, stayed for long months in the rear of the white guard enemy surrounded by an enemy outnumbering them ten to one, and decimated by the most horrific malady, typhus, which daily carried off hundreds of the finest fighters in their ranks, running low on munitions, they all swooped upon the enemy with daggers drawn, and under their mighty onslaught Denikin's best troops, the units of General Shkuro and Mamontov, took to their heels. At the cost of unbelievable effort and blood spilled by the best fighters, insurgent peasants destroyed Denikin's rear and opened up a route to brethren in the north. Peasants and workers, in the wake of Denikin's hordes, Red Army comrades entered Ukraine, workers and peasants from Dai North. In turn, the toiling peasantry of Ukraine was confronted by, besides the broader issue of the fight against the White Guards, the problem of building a real Soviet order, in which Soviets elected by the toilers would be servants of the people carrying out decisions that the toilers themselves would reach at a pan-Ukrainian Congress of Toilers. However, the Communist Party leaders who, in the Red Army, had created a blind and docile tool for defending the commissarocracy, set about mudslinging and peddling the worst calumnies about the best leaders of the insurgents, having determined to grasp the nettle and destroy the revolutionary insurgent movement which was hindering these commissar gentlemen from lording it over the toilers of Ukraine. In the toilers, these commissarocrats wished to see only a human weapon, as Trotsky said at one congress, only cannon fodder to be hurled at anyone one wants but who must on no account be afforded the right to dispense with the communists' help and make their own working lives and their own order for themselves. Peasant comrades. The insurgent army of Ukraine, Maknavist, is drawn from among you. Your sons, your brothers, and your fathers have filled our ranks. The insurgent army is blood of your blood, flesh of your flesh. Having sacrificed tens of thousands of victims, the insurgent army has fought for the toilers' right to build their order for themselves, to determine the disposition of their goods for themselves and not for all the world to hand over to the commissars. The insurgent army has fought and fights still for real Soviets and not for the chica and commissarocracy. In the days of the hangman, the hetman's day, and the Germans and Denikin, the insurgents rose up en masse against oppressors in the defense of the toiling people. Now too the insurgent army considers that it has a sacred duty to defend the interests of the toiling peasantry against attempts by these commissar gentlemen to hitch Ukraine's wiling peasantry to their chariot. The insurgent army knows these upstarts only too well and well remembers these liberator commissars. The autocrat Trotsky has ordered the disarming of the insurgent army set up by the peasants themselves in Ukraine, for he appreciates that as long as the peasants have their army defending their interests he will never be able to force the toiling people of Ukraine to march under his baton. By avoiding clashes with the Red Army and abiding only by the wishes of the toilers, the insurgent army, not wishing to shed fraternal blood, will take care to protect the toilers' interests and will lay down its arms only on the instructions of a free pan-Ukrainian toilers' congress, at which the toilers, themselves will articulate their wishes. The insurgent army, the sword in the hands of the toilers, calls upon you, peasant comrades, immediately to convene your own congress of toiling mujiks and to take into your own hands both the further pursuit of your well-being and your hard-earned wealth. It is true that the power-hungry commissars will take every step to thwart the holding of a free congress of toilers, for that reason and in the very interests of the toilers the stifling of this congress by the commissars must not be allowed, co that end it should be clandestine and held in a secret location. Peasant comrades, 
prepare yourselves for the holding of your congress. Make haste to accomplish your task. Your enemies are not sleeping, don't you sleep either, that will ensure your victory. Long live the free congress of the region's toilers. Down with commissarocracy. Long live the insurgent peasant army. February 8, 1920. The staff of the insurgent army of Ukraine, Maknavist. Document number 5. Who are the Maknavists and for what do they fight? 1. The Maknavists are workers and peasants who rose up back in 1918 against the oppression of the bourgeois power in Ukraine of the Austro Hungarian and German occupiers and of the Hetman. The Maknavists are toilers who have raised the banner of revolt against Denikin, against any yoke, any violence, and any fossid, from wherever they may come. The Maknavists are the very toilers whose labors enrich, fatten, and sustain the bourgeoisie in general and at present the Bolshevik bourgeoisie in particular. 2. Why do we call ourselves Maknavists? Because in the darkest days of the reaction in Ukraine we have seen among us through thick and thin, our friend and guide Markno whose voice has spoken out against all oppression of toilers throughout Ukraine, inciting struggle against all oppressors and all the marauders and political tricksters who misled us. Now this friend through thick and thin still marches in our ranks towards our ultimate objective, the emancipation of toilers from every yoke. 3. How do we see any emancipation coming to pass? Through the overthrow of all government, monarchist, coalition, Republican, Social Democrat, Bolshevik Communist, which must be replaced by a Soviet regime independent of them all, and without authority or arbitrarily determined laws, for the Soviet order is not the power of Bolshevik Communist Social Democrats which currently proclaims itself the Soviet power, but is instead the higher form of anti-authoritarian, anti-governmental socialism which expresses itself through the construction of a free, harmonious community independent of every power and the social life of the toilers, wherein every individual toiler and the community in general will be able to seek a happy, prosperous life in an autonomous way according to the principles of solidarity, friendship and equality for all. 4. What is the Maknavists' conception of the Soviet regime? The toilers themselves ought freely to choose their Soviets, Soviets that would carry out the wishes and decisions of these same toilers, which is to say executive Soviets, not authoritarian ones. The land, workshops, factories, mines, railways, and other assets of the people should belong to the toilers who work there which is to say that these must be socialized. 5. What are the means used by the Maknavists to attain these goals? Revolutionary, unflinching and consistent struggle against all falsehood, all arbitrariness and all oppression, no matter whence it may come, this is a fight to the death the struggle of free speech and true endeavor, conducted with weapons in hand. Through the elimination of all who govern, through destruction of all the foundations of their lies, whether in the political, statist or economic spheres. And it is only through destruction of the state and by means of social revolution that the realization of a truly Soviet socialist regime of workers and peasants will be feasible. April 27, 1920 the cultural instruction section of the Maknavist Insurgent Army. Document number 6. Down with fratricidal strife. Red soldier brethren, Nicholas's henchmen kept you in ignorance and led you into fratricidal war against the Japanese and then the Germans and many another people, simply to increase their own wealth, whereas all you had to look forward to was death at the front and complete ruination at home. But the dark clouds and fog that blinded your eyes lifted, the sunlight broke through and touched you and you put paid to that fratricidal war. That, though, was only the calm before a fresh storm broke. Now they send you out again to fight us Maknavist insurgents on behalf of a so-called worker peasant power which once again brings you shackles and slavery. The wealth and the delights go to this gang of parasite bureaucrats who suck your blood. Can you have failed to grasp this in three years of fratricidal strife? W.U. won you again shed your blood for the freshly resurrected bourgeoisie and for the commissars it has created who dispatch you to the slaughter like cattle. Have you not yet understood that we Maknavist insurgents are fighting for complete economic and political emancipation of the toilers, for a free life without these commissars and other agents of repression? 
May the dawn rise also over your camp and show you the way that leads to eradication of fratricidal strife among the toiling masses. On that road you will find us and you will go on fighting in our ranks for a better future, for a free life. At every encounter with us and in order to avert shedding of brother's blood, send us your delegates for talks, but if this is not possible and the commissars force you to fight us anyway, throw down your rifles and come to our fraternal embrace. Down with the fratricidal war between toilers. Long live the peace and fraternal union of toilers of every land and nation. May 1920. The Macnavist Insurgents. Document number 7. To all toilers of cart and hammer. Brothers. A new and mortal danger threatens all toilers. All the dark forces of the former lackeys of Nicholas the Bloody have come together and with the help of the Polish lords, French instructors and the traitor Putlura are bearing down on Ukraine to restore the autocracy among us and burden us with the estate owners, capitalists, land agents, gendarmes and all the other executioners of the peasants and workers. Comrades. The commissars and leaders of the Bolshevik communists are good warriors only when they are fighting poor folk. Their punitive detachments and chica are above all expert in killing workers and peasants and torching villages and countryside. But against the revolution's real enemies, against Denikin and the other bands, they shamefully take to their heels, like the despicable cowards that they are. You, comrades, will not have forgotten how last year, the gold braid wearers all but entered Moscow and, had they not, been stopped by the insurgents, the tricolor flag of autocracy would long since have been unfurled over revolutionary Russia. The situation is the same now, comrade. The Red Army, sold out at every turn by its generals and cowardly commissars, quits the front in panic, ceding region after region to the Polish lords. The towns of Jitomir, Kiev and Jmarinka have long since been occupied by the Poles, the White Guards front line nears Poltava and Kherson. And in the Crimea, Denikinists who have been dug in for the last four months await the opportune moment to reoccupy our native regions. Brothers! Are you going to blithely await the arrival of the whites without lifting a finger? Are you going to yield up your wives and your children to the exactions of the generals and the Polish lords? No, that must not be. As of one mind, to arms, and join the ranks of the insurgents. Rise up along with, all of us Macnavists against all oppressors. In every village, organize detachments and liaise with us. Together we shall drive out the commissars and Chica and along with red soldier comrades we shall build a solid fighting front against Denikin, Putlura, and the Polish lords. Comrades. This is not the time to delay, organize your detachments without delay. To work. Death and ruination to all oppressors and lordlings. Let us commit ourselves to the crucial final struggle for a true Soviet regime, in which there will be neither lords nor serfs. To arms, brothers. May 1920. The Cultural Instruction Section of the Revolutionary Insurgents, Maknavists, of Ukraine. Document number 8. To the young. Why do you stay at home, comrade? Why are you not in our ranks? Or perhaps you await the arrival of the commissar with his punitive expedition to enlist you by force. Do not kid yourself with the thought that they will not find you, that you will be able to hide to run away. The Bolshevik authorities have already proved that they will stop at nothing, they will arrest your family and your parents and will take hostages, when they so choose, they will have their artillery bombard the whole village and so, sooner or later, you and your chum who is still at large will be carried off by the government as soldiers. And then they will send you, weapon in hand, to kill your own worker and peasant brothers, the revolutionary Maknavist insurgents. So we Maknavist insurgents are not stay-at-homes, although each of us has a family and parents and dear loved ones, whom we have been reluctant to leave. But we are revolutionaries. We cannot look on with indifference as the toiling people is once again reduced to serfdom, as new, despots posing as socialists and revolutionaries and displaying the badge of worker-peasant power, lord it over us without control. Three years of revolution have clearly demonstrated that all power is counter-revolutionary, whether it be the power of Nicholas the Bloody or that of the Bolshevik communists. 
we Machnavists have raised the banner of insurrection for a complete social revolution against all power, against all oppressors and we fight for the free Soviets of toilers. Join us, comrade. Let the rogue and the coward hide behind someone's skirts at home, we have no need of those who hide behind anyone's skirts. But you, decent worker or peasant, your place is with us, with the Machnavist insurgent revolutionaries. We press no one into service. But remember that with their savage repression the Bolshevik authorities have forced us into a struggle without quarter. So make up your mind, comrade. Mobilized by the commissars, you will be sent against us and we will be forced to deal with you as an adversary and as an enemy of the revolution. With us or against us. The choice is yours. June 1920. The Machnavist Insurgents. Document number 9. The Machnavists address to the toiling Cossacks of the Don and Cuban. Cossack toiler comrades. For two years you have groaned beneath the yoke of the Tsarist General Denikin. For two years your sworn enemies, the big landowners and lordlings have forced you to defend their riches and the oppressors of the toiling people. For two years running, they have squeezed you in a vice, while the wealthy amassed their riches from your blood and sweat, made merry and gave themselves up to debauchery. For two years, the blood and tears of the toilers have flowed in the Cuban and on the Don. For two years, the revolution was smothered in your region, Cossack toilers. Through your efforts, comrades, the yoke of Denikin and his gang has been shrugged off and the revolution is triumphant once again in the Cuban and on the Don. However, scarcely had you had time, comrades, to recover from the nightmare you lived under Denikin, before new oppressors arrived in your regions. The party of the Bolshevik communists, having seized power, dispatched its commissars and chica to your villages and your stanitsas. They oppress you no less than their Tsarist henchmen predecessors, Cossack toilers. As under Denikin, the Bolshevik authorities' punitive detachments seize your wheat and livestock, and take your sons, and if you dare to protest at the violence done before your eyes, well, they will flog, imprison and indeed shoot you. Why, then, Cossack toiler comrades, did you revolt against Denikin if it was only to place yourselves under a new yoke now in the shape of the Bolshevik communists? Is that what you shed your blood for, to allow the commissars and power lovers now to lord it over you, stifle you and do violence to you? Listen, brothers, to what we Machnavist revolutionary peasants have to tell you. We too have been oppressed since the revolution by a whole series of powers and parties. At first the Austrian and German oppressors tried to reign over us along with the Hetman, then it was the adventurer Putlera, then the Bolshevik communists, and General Denikin. But we very quickly disabused them of any inclination to carry it on and, as you have certainly heard tell, as early as the summer of 1918, with the Guliapoli peasant, Toiler's friend, anarchist and revolutionary Nestor Markno as our guide, he whom the Tsarist authorities had locked up for more than ten years in its prisons and penitentiaries because of his love for the toiling people. We rose up and drove out the Austro-German bands and for nearly two years now we have been pressing on with our struggle against all oppressors of the toilers. We are now waging a relentless struggle against agents and commissars of the Bolshevik authorities, we execute and drive these oppressors from our regions. The ranks of our revolutionary insurgent detachments are swelling daily. All the oppressed and humiliated join our ranks and the time is approaching when the toiling people in our region will rise up and drive out the power of charlatan Bolshevik politicians, just as they did before with Denikin. But, having driven out the Bolshevik oppressors, it is our intention to entrust power over us to nobody from now on, for we Machnavists consider that the toiling people has long ceased to be a flock of sheep for anyone to lead as he may see fit. We find that the toilers will be able to organize a free regime of Soviets along independent lines, dispensing with party, commissars, and generals, a Soviet regime in which those who will have been chosen as members of the Soviet will not, as now they can, be able to command us and give us orders, but will instead be the instruments of what we will have determined at our assemblies and toilers' congresses. We will make every effort to ensure that all the wealth of the country such as the land, mines, workshops, factories, railways, and the rest belong not to private individuals nor to the state, but exclusively to those who work them. We shall not put up our weapons until such time as we have 
eliminated economic or political servitude once and for all, until such time as genuine equality and fraternity reign on earth. That, comrades, is what we fight for and what we summon you Cossack toilers of the Don and the Cuban to fight for. In our insurgent army there is a goodly number of Don and Cuban Cossacks, they formed two cavalry regiments which fought bravely with us against the Denikinists. We now call upon you Cossack toilers again, to join our ranks in order to wage a common struggle against the oppressors and the red hangman Trotsky and Lenin. Enough of slavish submission and toleration of the yoke and the power which calls itself worker peasant. To arms and into the ranks of the revolutionary insurgents, and then we shall quickly rid anyone and everyone of this urge to oppress and grind us down. Do not, comrades, believe the calumnies that label us bandits or which say that we are only a gang. These are lies peddled by the commissars for the sole purpose of misleading the peasant toilers and workers who are well aware that Machnavists are decent toilers who, having no wish to be enslaved, have risen up to free themselves once and for all from every yoke. Do not believe the Bolsheviks' newspapers which report virtually every day that Bako Markno has been killed and that we Machnavists have been crushed. These are only lies. Bako Markno lives and continues with us to defeat the regiments and punitive detachments of the power of the commissars day after day, striking mortal panic into the hearts of red oppressors. Rise up, Cossack toilers, against the yoke and oppression of the commissars. Do not let them set foot in your villages and stanitsas. Pay them no taxes. Deny them your wheat. Do not let them take your sons as soldiers. Organize your insurgent detachments. Execute the aggressors. Join with us. We will afford you all possible help. Enough of slavish forbearance. Let us put an end to the vexations visited upon us. Long live the insurrection for a genuine system of worker and peasant Soviets. Long live the free Don and the free Cuban. Long live the fraternal union of the toilers of every land and all nations. Long live the social revolution. June 1920. The Soviet of the Revolutionary Insurgents of Ukraine, Machnavists. Document number 10. Workers, peasants, and red soldiers. With your own eyes you saw how the villainous bourgeoisie, with Denikin and company at its head, sought to reduce the workers and peasants to serfdom for fully a century and tried to reintroduce the feudal system of the great landowners. But they have been definitively crushed through the spirit of revolutionary revolt that is abroad among the Machnavists. Now again the beast bears its fangs, abetted by the western bourgeoisie of which it seems to be the final card, it hurls its hordes upon us, seeking to subject us to its power and foist its yoke upon us. We can have but one reaction, to have no truce of any sort with them, for we have set ourselves a single goal, to fight to the last drop of blood to annihilate our bourgeoisie once and for all and with it the worldwide bourgeoisie, or perish in the attempt. Listen to what the Bolshevik communists, the agents of the worker and peasant government, say, about us. By means of craven faucets they accuse us in their slanderous propaganda of siding with Rangel, which makes them the laughingstock of workers and peasants the world over. Have they no shame? Do not they themselves represent the new counter-revolution with their authoritarian institutions like the Chica and the power of the commissars who make up a new aristocracy like the autocracy before them? Yes, we must record the fact that the only ones responsible for the emergence of the counter-revolution are the Bolsheviks themselves, the advocates of the socialist state. They lead us in the direction of state capitalism, of new despots at home and they revive private capitalism, our greatest enemy. We Machnavists will either fall in combat or we will win and destroy the new capitalism in both its guises, and we will build a new life under a genuinely free socialism. Down with oppressors of the toiling people, whether they come from the right or left. Long live the worldwide union of towns and villages. Long live the social revolution. July 1920. The Information Committee of the Insurgent Army of the Ukraine, Machnavist. Document number 11. The Machnavist Conception of Soviets. The first session of the Free Soviet of Guliaipoli was held in the Great Hall of the town's college. The teacher Chernanizny, chairman of the Soviet, gave this address, comrades. 
Let us salute the formation of Guliopoli's first Free Soviet. On this occasion, I think it essential that a brief general account be given of the nature, organization and import of free toilers Soviets such as they have been established at the toilers' own instigation in this free region of ours. Let it be stated first of all that the characteristic feature of social life among us takes the form of toilers' self-governance in local affairs, this going hand in glove with organization of the partisan struggle, and all of this is at odds with the Bolsheviks' conception of political Soviets. The free Soviets of toilers represent a firm realization of the principles underlying such self-governance, Soviets free, in that they are wholly independent of any central authority whatever and are elected with complete independence to boot. Soviets of toilers, in that they are founded on a basis of shared labor and embrace only toilers, operate in accordance with their wishes, serve their interests alone and are wholly impervious to any and all political influence. Each such Soviet is executor of the wishes of local toilers and their organizations. Soviets elsewhere, which are to liaise closely with them, will be able to set up popular self-governance bodies, coordinating their activities insofar as their territorial remit and economic activities require. Publication of a declaration on the principles, broad characteristics, and organization of free Soviets on the part of the military revolutionary Soviet one represents the prescribed constitution of these organizations. It is interesting to note that since its inception, the idea of free Soviets has begun to be favorably and instantly received by the masses, and has spread in very quick order to regions far removed from Guliopoli. Having instinctively grasped the simple system of free Soviets, the peasants have striven slowly but surely to establish such organizations. Once they have accomplished this, they will indubitably become its staunchest supporters and will without the shadow of a doubt feel that this is a wholesome foundation that guarantees the construction of a shared, free existence. Likewise appreciation of the necessity for direct union with the workers of neighboring towns is beginning to ripen and gain ever greater sway over the peasant masses. Let us quote the example of the Guliopoli peasant's appeal, Worker, hold out your hand to the peasant, which has not gone unheeded, it spreads and is discussed and has become our region's watchword, among the urban workers whom it has reached it arouses lively interest. And neither encirclement by hostile forces from every camp, nor the expression of other schools of thought, are impediments to propagation of the notion of a rapprochement between workers and peasants. The conception of free, toilless Soviets springs from life itself. This transitional form of self-governance leads on in practice to the non-authoritarian order of the future, founded upon principles of unrestricted freedom, complete equality and fraternity. In other words I would say that the libertarian current will, in this way, have found its true expression, its rightful one, social action. The receptivity of the toilers is an irrefutable demonstration that love of liberty is abroad among the peasants, as is the unshakable determination to play their parts in the building of a free, independent and egalitarian life. In a different, less troubled context, that same movement could have taken a different tack, found expression in quite different ways and would also have been quite wholesome, original and deliberate in its development. Ultimately, we must believe that it would have led to construction of the groundwork of a really free society of toilers. But to our regret, these are at present naught but dreams, for harsh reality presents a very different face. What does this consist of, exactly? The fact of the matter is that even now the traditional enemy of labor and of liberty, authority, is making inroads in this region of ours. The essential and underlying motivation of the exploiters who invade our region, Bolsheviks and Denikinists, consists of their steadfast determination to assert their power by violently eradicating everyone else's freedom and, what is more, wholly reducing the toilers to the status of inanimate objects. By such methods, all these statist authoritarians will annihilate all the efforts and advances of the toilers. In the first instance, the peasants' life and labors would be saddled with the yoke of the chica. And the Sovnarkom, Soviet of People's Commissars, which is to say a gang of adventurers, expert in political chicanery, the very same people who have adroitly deceived the toilers and have turned the Russian social revolution into a vague effervescence of the masses. In the second instance, the peasant has to look to the rule of the kosh of these privileged gentlemen who hide behind the gold-braided saber-draggers. 
The peasantry could not and of course would not accept this prospect, once having sampled the fruits of the liberty tree. For that very reason, it has risen up as one man in defense of its derided interests. It has risen because it has once and for all rejected state exploitation of society, rejected economic plunder and political whimsy. I call upon you, Chern and Isni closed, to watch over the peasantry's ideal of free, toyless Soviets, as you would over the apple of your eye, for, as I have indicated, such Soviets assure the people of authentic self-governance by the toilers themselves and lead on to real freedom, genuine equality and honest fraternity. Bibliographical Afterword, 1984 It seems opportune here to review some new publications and information that have come to light since the publication of our biographical study, itself the fruit of 18 years of research and authentication, which is to say that it was by no means improvised, which is more than can be said of most of the publications on the subject. Generally the sensational aspects of certain accusations and allegations is played up so as to overshadow the real import of the Machnavist insurgent movement. This is true for example of the publication by Pavel Litvinov, the grandson of Stalin's foreign affairs minister of that name, of a Samizdat text, i.e. a clandestinely self-published text, entitled Nesta Markno and the Jewish Question. Litvinov is at pains to show that Markno was never an antisemite, quite the opposite indeed, that he deserves to be held in high regard and have his memory honored by Jews. Quite an attractive and welcome undertaking this, were it not for the fact that it is bringing coals to Newcastle. For, as we have pointed out before, even Bolshevik historical studies have always repudiated this absurd allegation of antisemitism on Markno's part. What is more, Litvinov ties in this issue with the rebirth of Jewish nationhood and indeed with the attempt to create some revolutionary Jewish Zion in Ukraine. What is to be welcomed though is the fact that Litvinov capitalizes upon the opportunity to retrace the main features and accomplishments of the Machnavist movement, especially its crucial part in defeating the Whites. Let it be noted that essentially the sources that he has used have been published outside Russia. Some come from Russian anarchist reviews and other works published in France and in the United States during the 1920s and 1930s, which is to say that against all the odds they have achieved their objectives even inside Russia by helping to restore the truth of events. Aside from a few mistakes Litvinov has Markno working in Paris as a film technician. This essay does deserve to be more widely known, especially in Israel and among Jewish readers, given that many of these still place credence in the rumors about Markno. On the other hand, it has nothing new to offer Western readers who have access to much more comprehensive texts and works on the subject. Also, it is hard to fathom the sensational publicity accorded Litvinov's essay by certain French and Italian anarchists. Maybe because for such a long time there was a dearth of historical and theoretical investigations and works on the subject of anarchism, this accounts for many anarchists having become avid consumers and applauding as soon as some academic or somebody quite removed from the movement and its beliefs, deigns to show an interest in anarchy. We have also come by another Russian manuscript text dealing with the life of Lev Zadovsinkovsky, the commander of the unit that smuggled the gravely wounded Markno over the border into Romania in August 1921. The author of this manuscript, one Jacob Gryden, describes himself as a former member of the NKVD, the Chica was first renamed the GPU, then became the NKVD before becoming the KGB of today, and a recent emigrant to Israel. According to Gryden, Zadov, who had for a time been chief of the Machnavist intelligence service allegedly contacted the GPU while in exile in Romania and rendered it valuable services. In particular he is alleged to have lured a captain of the French counter-espionage service into an ambush in Ukraine and to have murdered him in his sleep, all in order to prove his bona fides to the GPU and secure rehabilitation for himself as well as dot for his brother. This little spy story even features a grieving and pretty widow whom this Sadoff allegedly took it upon himself to console. Where the shoe pinches is with the allegation that Zadov had been ordered by his Muscovite superiors to liquidate Mark Nohu, it is alleged was then, in 1922, to be found in one of Warsaw's finest hotels, in fact, Markno was then sampling the delights of a lengthy and uncomfortable stay in the city's political prison. 
Zadov purportedly accomplished this task successfully and lived a life of ease up until the nasty Stalinist purges of 1938, whereupon he is alleged to have met his end. As we know nothing of Zadov's true fate, it is still feasible to embroider upon what became of him, however, unlikely circumstances are rather too thick on the ground here and we should bear it in mind, first, that in Bolshevik studies, Lev Zadov and his brother are portrayed as the executors of Markno's dirty work and especially as unmerciful Bolshevik killers and, secondly, that they had been convinced anarchist activists ever since 1905, which fact had earned them several years in Tsarist prisons, and thirdly, that they had repeatedly given proof of their devotion to the Maknavist movement's cause. All of which makes us skeptical about such unlikely claims about them, unless they have been confused with other individuals. Moreover, we should expect further revelations of the same sort from emigrating Soviet Jews, for a goodly number of them have, like Gryden, been ex-members of the GPU, or indeed privileged members of the state apparatus or other agencies of the regime, or indeed children, or parents of such. Self-evidently there is no question of placing the slightest credence in this sort of misrepresentation, unless of course there is documentary or tangible evidence to substantiate their ravings. In our book we mentioned the existence of a manuscript essay of Memories of Nesta Markno. By Ida Met, a member of the Diallo Truda group from 1925 to July 1928. A small publisher has had the bright idea of bringing this out as a 28-page booklet, starting from an original of just six and one-quarter pages, augmented by a few personal remarks on the radicality of Nesta Markno, in which respect he emerges as determinedly modern, in that, practically and historically he steps outside anarchist ideology. For Markno the revolution simply cannot be the endorsement of any ideology, even the anarchist one, but rather is the destruction of all ideologies. For some years now, it has been fashionable to toss the term ideology around, until it has become universally applicable and all-embracing, but if one takes it to signify a coherent view of life and society there is much to be gained from comparing such glib and empty assertions with the views spelled out in great profusion in Markno's own articles. As for Ida Met's essay, we have already spelled out its limitations. Certain of her remarks are well over the top, she is Markno jealous of the Jews, but capable of being a friend to a Jew without a second thought. She also has him jealous of intellectuals and, more seriously, jealous of the careers of Red Generals Budiany and Voroshilov, so much so that his mind was stalked willy-nilly by the idea that he too could have been a Red Army General. However, he himself never told me as much. Such a telepathic approach greatly undermines the relevance of her opinions and might even border upon base slander and Baxter's gossip, it would have been better to call a halt to it. I demet whom we knew personally deserves to be assessed on other, more pertinent of her writings. We come now to one of the most interesting of bibliographical novelties. In our biography of Markno we mentioned the existence of certain manuscripts by Volein which had remained unpublished to date and to which we had been unable to gain access. They had been in the possession of Rosa Dubinsky, the widow of the first publisher of Volein's posthumous book The Unknown Revolution before being retrieved forcibly by Volein's eldest son, Igor Eakenbain who at that time subscribed to political views far removed from those of his father. On the strength of what we had been told by Rosa Dubinsky, the historian Daniel Guerin seemed to have played an ambiguous role at the time of this episode. He subsequently forwarded to us a denial wherein he stated that this episode had taken place unbeknownst to me. Duly noted. We have also learned since that several copies of these manuscripts were in circulation, first of all in the hands of Daniel Guerin, then with the Historical Secretariat of the French Anarchist Federation and finally Leo Eakenbaim, Volein's second son, had deposited a copy with the Bank du Sun at Der image founded by Roland Fourneri. Thanks to the kindness of the latter, we were able to consult these famous unpublished notes by Volein. And what do they contain? Well, to our great astonishment there is first and foremost the conclusion to the unknown revolution, which for successive editions of that book have thus deliberately jettisoned. And a rather substantial text it is too, 110 pages, and only the portion dealing with the meeting with Volein and Trotsky in New York, shortly before their return to Russia in 1917, was used by Daniel Guerin in the latest edition of his anthology Nidiu Nimitre, 
no gods no masters. Given that Guerin was also involved in the publication of the two latest, French, editions of the Unknown Revolution we asked him why they had been bereft of this conclusion which is part and parcel of the whole. His reply was that the decision not to use it had been made jointly with Igor Eakin Baim in that it struck them that the contents of the conclusion weakened the rest of the book. Once we read it in our turn, we reached a different opinion for it strikes us as being quite consistent with Volein's psychomoral analyses and whereas he is mistaken in presenting events worldwide from 1914 up until September 1940 as the destructive period of the worldwide social revolution. One could forgive him this error but not in any way condone censoring his posthumous book of its conclusion, which should be making sense of the whole thing. We can only hope that the next time the book is due for republication, this amputation will be well and truly repaired. Among Volein's unpublished papers there is also correspondence of his from towards the end of his life, and here he tackles the subject of interest to us here. In a letter from Marseilles dated November 4, 1944, to one Henri, he berates a certain Fremont for allegedly peddling rumors about my relations with Mark No Fremont had it from, Mark No's own tips that since a particular moment, the latter and I have not been such good friends as once we were, and had supposedly leveled the stupid charge against Volein of having stolen some documents from Mark No. By way of formal and palpable proof of the nonsensicality of this crude invention, Volein cites three things in his defense, one, he had allegedly sacrificed two whole years of my activities in 1921 to 1923 to bringing out Arshinov's history of the Maknavist movement. He goes on to say that, and I mean sacrificed, for I could have devoted my free time instead to literary work of my own that I was pressed to do and that interested me. Two, he had taken a back seat to Arshinov because he himself had only been involved with the Maknavist movement for six months whereas Arshinov had been there right to the end and was consequently better qualified to write its history. Subsequently he had only made use of the latter, and made do with adding a few personal anecdotes to that portion of the unknown revolution dealing with the Maknavist movement. This is only a banal statement of facts obvious to any reader, but it is good to see Volein making it explicit himself. Three. He alludes to his work as literary editor of volumes 2 and 3 of Markno's memoirs which appeared in Russian in 1936 and 1937. Translations into French of his forewords to both volumes followed, as did part of his introductory essay on the Maknavist movement, lifted from the unknown revolution. Wallein concludes his second letter of November 11, 1944, again to Henri, by hoping that his explanations will satisfy the comrades. Curiosity and prove to them that the yarns about my conduct are merely the consequences of a crass and stupid calumny that was predicated upon many comrades' ignorance of the true situation. Without more detailed knowledge of the precise contents of this alleged calumny, we can only record what Volein has to say and of which everyone may make what they will. Let us above all note Volein's important clarification of the fate of Markno's manuscripts, Galina Kuzmenko, Nestor's wife, is supposed to have burned the valise filled with her spouse's papers during the German occupation and to have let Volein know shortly before she left for Germany in 1942. Let us stress her lack of imagination in so doing, she would have been better advised to entrust the papers to reliable friends or to some library. In other letters addressed to Marie-Louise, Berneri, Volein outlines a complete history of his writings on the Russian Revolution and makes them the basis for the unknown revolution. He also announces a forthcoming work on Markno but is having trouble finding the way to tackle it. He is counting upon using the notes that he had used during lectures on Markno in 1935 to 1936. Tuberculosis denied him the time to complete the undertaking and he died a short while later, leaving the project at the notes and outline stage, though these by themselves amount to 236 partly typewritten pages. Let us look at their contents. The text is entitled Markno, a contribution to studies on the enigma of the personality. Drafted in 1945, it deals with generalities regarding the Russian Revolution and supplies autobiographical information on Volein himself. The first item of interest for our purposes is its disclosure of Volein's influence on Arshinov's history of the Maknavist movement. It had been at Volein's insistence that Arshinov had mentioned the movement's shortcomings and those of Markno himself, 
After having retorted that set alongside the immeasurable positive aspects of the movement what few shortcomings there may have been are truly of no significance. According to Volein, such an omission on the movement's flaws was profoundly to be regretted for they are, in my estimation, more important than its positive sides. That comment encapsulates the general tone. He alternates eulogy with the most acerbic criticism in, say, this thumbnail sketch of Mark No. He was an extremely complicated personality, muddled would be the right word, a sort of formidable raw genius riddled with boorish as well as refined shortcomings as outstanding as his traces of genius. Incontrovertibly he belongs in the Russian Revolution to that category of personalities who remain in history forever a little woolly. Enormous positive qualities coexist alongside deep-seated negative dispositions. In an uncompleted chapter entitled The Nub of the Matter, Volin berates the existence in Ukrainian peasants as well of course as among peasants, and even among manual workers generally, everywhere, of a sentiment that is a blend of mistrust, contempt and unspoken hostility which can stretch to fits of acute hatred towards intellectuals, non-manual, workers, and non-peasants. He then complains of the harmful prejudice very widespread among revolutionary militants, concealing as much and as tongue as possible from the public and indeed from the ordinary party militants, shortcomings, blemishes, faults and failings of the movement. For his part, he had documented with disheartening and piecemeal slowness, the dark sides of Mark No's personality, in 1938, he already knew a fair amount, but, by the conclusion of my work, the end of 1941, I knew a lot more. 1. Could marvel at such belated intelligence, for, as he himself admits, although he had spent six months in Mark No's company in 1919 to 1920, he had known nothing of the personal and intimate life that would have afforded access to the very depths of Mark No's personality. Furthermore, the latter had never made the slightest move to strike up a more personal friendship with me, thus in order to divine his real personality, he was to use as his chief source confidences of Mark No's spouse Galina Kuzmenko who it seems had been challenged by certain Machnavist commanders living in France, Volein unfortunately refrains from giving their names, who allegedly regarded her as mismatched with Mark No. Volein draws a very eulogistic portrait of Mark No's qualities, a very quick and, I should say, complete grasp of the truth which he managed to unravel from life as a whole. Just and proper attention that never diminished to all that he regarded as important in life, his own or life in general. Possession of an extremely solid and luminous masterthought, that too is a stroke of genius. Boundless daring and rashness in the face not just of combat but of life as a whole, he sought to make life what he wished to see of it. A specifically fighting gift, I do not mean military, he never lost his cool head, his boldness and acted with simplicity precision and at the same time with cold clear tactics until the objective was achieved. However, as an unbalanced man of genius whose excitability was also beyond the norm, the more that Markno displayed signs of genius, the more he knew of its ups and downs. But after these roses come the thorns. Volein notes the temperamental incompatibility between them, so much so that when Markno had him freed from Czechist jails in October 1920, Volein hesitated before he set off to join him in Ukraine. Furthermore, Markno had, according to Volein, the infuriating habit of constantly toying with his revolver even to the extent of threatening his future spouse with it, perhaps to put her character to the test, as well as members of the Maknavist movement Soviet and above all he was wont to gun down deserters from the front, or insurgents guilty of outrages where they stood. He had allegedly killed folk without having looked into their case and not knowing if they were innocent or guilty. If well-founded, this charge strikes us as the most considerable of Volein's criticisms, for it seems to us, where the rest are concerned, that we are dealing with a somewhat obsessive fixation on his part, deriving probably from the frictions between them as exiles, both personal, Markno had accused him of dishonesty, and theoretical, Volein championed the synthesis, whereas Markno was a fervent supporter of the platform. Let us also take note of some startling inaccuracies in Volein's data, he is Markno dying a year later than in fact he did and attributes to him as his real name the pseudonym, Miknienko, which he had adopted upon arrival in France. These mix-ups and recriminations can perhaps be explained in terms of Volein's living conditions at the time when he drafted most of these jottings, 
It was under the German occupation in Marseilles where he had everything to fear from the Gestapo and Pitanist militia and was experiencing the rigors and privations of clandestinity. Yet it seems to us that the key to the animosity between the two men lies in the contrast that we have already mentioned between the peasant activist and the moralistic intellectual disconnected from social practice. Moreover, Wallein seems to have nurtured this rancor for he recalls that in Berlin in 1925, upon seeing Mark Noe again for the first time in years he told him that he an intellectual, Arshinoff a worker and Mark Noe a peasant made up a team and that they should remain irreparable. Mark Noe allegedly failed to heed this and had supposedly thrown it all away by hitting the bottle maybe even more than before. His was a nature undoubtedly brilliantly gifted, capable of actively and doggedly pursuing an objective that he had set himself, a man who had marvellous expertise and at the same time could plummet from such heights into the lowest depths even to the point of becoming a human wreck. Likewise, in Ukraine, he had been unwilling to come under Volein's moral sway because he was under that of a Camarilla of a segment of the Maknavist commanders. In spite of all his qualities, Markno remained, in Volein's estimation an unlettered, philistine, uneducated man, especially as he had an aversion to anything that was not peasant. Being himself a peasant through and through, he had a thoroughgoing understanding of peasant life and went so far as to criticize all that was not peasant. He did not have a lot of confidence in workers because the worker, according to him, was already to some extent depraved by the crazy bad life of towns and of industry where he rubbed shoulders with the bosses. He had even less confidence in intellectuals and poked fun at them. In these conditions, it was very hard to talk to him about the flaws in his organization because he responded with all sorts detail I, which left you nonplussed and denied you any chance of settling things one way or the other. Also. Volein mentions these character traits of Marknos even more clearly, blind trust in the peasantry, mistrust of all other classes in society, a certain contempt for intellectuals, even anarchist ones. There is the rub and the thorn in Volein's side. He strove to act as director of Marknos' conscience in his capacity as a morally irreproachable intellectual, so as to steer him onto the straight and narrow. Instead of which Markno refused his advice, perhaps mockingly, and surrendered instead to his base music instincts. And while an emigre in Paris, had not Volein publicly dismissed him as a music one day, a term of abuse which must have been equivalent for him to dreadful idiot or something of the sort, until an anarchist on a panel had to get together to smooth out their differences. In fact, of the 236 pages supposedly dealing with Markno, only a tiny number touch upon the subject directly the bulk being merely digressions in every direction. To back up his criticisms, Volein sets out some specific instances in which he purports to have been a witness or protagonist, whereas the rest are mere impression, hearsay and superficial confidences from Markno's spouse who seems rather cavalier about the gravity of her accusations. Thus it seems obvious to us that the credence to be placed in this should be measured by the degree of hostility that he bore towards Markno. He would have been better advised to offer detailed descriptions, not of a few episodes, but rather of his full term among the Maknavist insurgents, unless he spent that cloistered in his cultural activities and had no desire to mingle with Mujik so as to be able to address them directly and pertinently without having to make use of second-hand reports. He could also have recalled the circumstances which had led to his arrival in the insurgent camp. It was Markno himself who had sent out a detachment to rescue him from the clutches of Petlierist partisans. It was also at Markno's suggestion that Volein had been made chairman of the insurgent movement's revolutionary military Soviet for several months and again it was Markno who had made Volein's release one of the conditions for honoring the military and political agreement concluded with the Bolsheviks in 1920. Volein also omits to mention the deposition that he made before a Czechist examining magistrate, a deposition that was, moreover, critical of the Maknavists to say the least, in that Soviet historians have since used it as a means of damning them. All in all, all these random jottings, swamped by general considerations strike us as more revealing of their author's personality than of Markno's, which probably accounts for their having remained unpublished to date. However, in spite of their blatant exaggeration, these texts deserve to be better known, certain passages being of undoubted value for the times. As for Markno's true personality, 
that can be sufficiently divined from all his writings, memoirs and articles, and we need not have recourse to the anarchist grapevine in hope of sensational disclosures. Within the framework of this bibliographical update, let us take note of the oral testimony of a historian of Ukrainian origins, Oleg Koschuk. His mother was interned in Poland in the same camp as Markno and remembers that certain petly jurists wanted to assassinate the libertarian, probably on account of some clash in which they had been bested. At which point high-ranking nationalist leaders let it be known that any action against Markno would be deemed a hostile act against the Ukrainian cause. In spite of political differences, ethnic solidarity thus came into play to bring Ukrainians from both sides of the Dnieper closer together. Afterward This book was drafted nearly 20 years ago on foot of research begun in 1964. In 1984 we added a bibliographical afterword when we published an anthology of articles by Nestor Markno, in which we commented upon certain new sources, including some unpublished manuscript materials by Volein. Later, in 1987, we published a lengthy examination of the organizational platform of the Dialo Truda group, of which N. Markno and P. Arshinov were the main authors, and of the ensuing controversy. In a way, it amounted to a historical and practical assessment of the Ukrainian insurgent experience and of the part that anarchists played in it. It only remains for us now to look at all the new information dished up since then in a range of publications in the West as well as in Russia and in Ukraine. Let us begin in chronological order, by harking back to the book by Serge Mamontov referred to in our foreword, Carnets de Route d'Un Artilla a Cheval 1917-1920 as it devotes a fair number of pages to his military meanderings through Maknavis territory and offers us his thoughts on civil war, displaying a rare bluntness and candor, quote, confident that they were beyond punishment, the Reds descended into utter bestiality and lost all human dignity. Not that we were angels either and often we were cruel. Every army has its share of perverse personnel, we had our share in our ranks too, looting is a ghastly thing, one that does an army a lot of harm. All the world's armies pretty much loot, there is a rule to be observed in time of war, turn a blind eye to the blood and the tears. I have to laugh when the rules of warfare are cited. War is the most immoral of undertakings and civil war is worse still. Rules governing absence of morality. Is it supposed to be all right to kill and mutilate the able-bodied but forbidden to finish off the wounded? Where is the logic in that? Notions of chivalry are out of place in warfare. Such talk is merely propaganda for imbeciles. Criminality and murder become heroism. One tries to get the jump on the enemy, under cover of night, from the rear, by ambush, through superiority of numbers. The truth goes untold. What nobility is there in all that? My thoughts are that an army composed exclusively of philosophers would be a very poor army and I would rather an army of criminals. Better, I reckon to speak a cruel truth than pedal faucets. End quote. To this muddled thinking the author adds Fossard when he claims that Markno had come up with the slogan, Kill the Jews, save Russia. Although, he remarks, Markno himself saved no one and lived high on the hog, with no thought except for his own pleasure. Obviously, an adversary portrayed in such colors is good only for extermination, like some bothersome insect. The Whites and the Cossacks. Nicholas Ross's book, published in Germany in 1982 and dealing with the Crimea under Rangel, contains unpublished material drawn from the archives of the white generals deposited with the Hoover Institute in Stanford, California. In particular, it records how Rangel speculated upon the chances of military collaboration with Markno against the Bolsheviks. In a secret order issued to his units, the Baron General wrote that in the name of the sacred goal, wiping out communism he might just rub shoulders with Markno and other anti-communist Ukrainian groups. In the fight against the principal enemy of Holy Russia, he ordered his commanders to coordinate their operations with all Russian folk fighting the Bolsheviks to bring back the greater fatherland. Yes indeed, Rangel had understood nothing of what had been going on in recent times and he carried on denying the Ukrainian character of the insurrections in the land. This attitude is reminiscent of the old Russian saw according to which there never have been any Ukrainians and never will be. 
The specific and distinguishing features of what Muscovites used to dismiss as little Russians are denied utterly. Furthermore, asking Markno to fight for Holy Russia and the Greater Fatherland was a crackpot notion. Nicholas Ross reprints in its entirety a letter from General Shatilov, Rangel's chief of staff, to Bakko Markno, going on about the suffering of Russian soil and informing him that the command of the Russian army is fighting only against the communists and commissars and is wholeheartedly on the side of the Russian people, its motto being land to the people, truth to the people, the people alone must determine its own fate, we share a common goal. It is put to Markno that he should coordinate his military operations and, to that end, organize his detachments into a division which is to be furnished with arms and munitions on the same basis as other divisions of the Russian army. Markno is confirmed in his command of that division. The Maknovist commanders become regimental or brigade commanders, all who would defer to the Russian army are offered guarantees that both their lives and their property will be safeguarded. An emissary, a Captain Mikhailov, bearing messages from Rangel, was dispatched to Markno. A bad move, for this well-intentioned ambassador was recognized as the man who had captured a full company of the Novosposovka insurgent regiment in 1919 and who had had 70 insurgents shot and a further 50 hanged, on the grounds that they were on their way to join Markno. He himself was strung up, bearing a placard that read, No compact between Markno and the White. Guards can or could ever be entered into, and should the White camp send us another emissary, the same fate awaits him. And that is precisely what befell that second emissary, a colonel. Yet Rangel's pipe dreams managed to bamboozle several Maknavist detachments. Cut off from the main body of insurgents, they accepted Rangel's claims regarding alliance with Markno at face value. This was the result of the unspeakable terror enforced by the Chika and the Reds' punitive expeditions. The Maknavist detachments that went over to the Whites were organized into a brigade of several thousand men and dubbed the Bakko Markno Brigade. Even so, Rangel's howler eventually backfired on him in the worst conceivable fashion. The brigade was deployed in the northern Tavrida, directly facing the offensive by the Maknavist insurgent forces. When the Maknavist Chali commanding the brigade discovered that he had been gulled, he sought to redeem himself by handing over to the Maknavist command all the white officers staffing his brigade. These disclosed the precise locations of white troop deployments. On the basis of which intelligence and with the assistance of the Bakko Markno brigade, now defectors, the Maknavists routed the enemy's divisions, thereby breaking through the white front. Rangel's political blandness prompts us briefly to review the white's failures. The godfather of their movement, the prematurely deceased General Kornilov, whilst a great Russian patriot, was a democratic republican and supporter of the Constituent Assembly. He managed to come to an accommodation with the Roda, the elected sovereign assembly of the Cuban Cossacks, thanks to which he was able to register his earliest successes. The Cuban Cossacks, like the Don Cossacks after them, had only gone over to the volunteer army because of persecution they had endured at the hands of Red Invasion forces. They had no notion of conquering Russia, they wanted only their own independence under the auspices of US President Wilson's recently proclaimed right to self-determination. But, neither France nor Britain nor any other Entente power was prepared to recognize them. The Entente was only prepared to furnish the Whites with weapons and munitions, the Whites being, to their mind, the heirs of its former ally of 1914, Imperial Russia. Driven by the Reds into the arms of the Whites, the Cossacks persistently had to fend off overtures from the White High Command which was eager to bring them to heel. Denikin proved to be not merely a dismal military strategist but also a disaster as a politician. He had no real program other than overthrowing Bolshevism, the downfall of which he regarded as imminent and inevitable, so much so that in September 1919 he circulated commanders of the most forward volunteer army units with a questionnaire asking them to indicate what course they would like to see the country follow. He forbade the Cuban Cossack General Shkuro from capturing Moscow, on pain of court-martial. But he went too far when he covered up the murder of Ria Bavoy, the chairman of the Cuban, Roda, whose father before him had been murdered by the Reds. He then had a Kalabukov, a priest, and chairman of the Cubans' delegation to the Paris Peace Conference in June 1919, hand and tagged with a placard that read, Traitor to Russia. 
Such was the impact upon the Cossack units embroiled in fighting in the front lines that not only did they quit the front in droves, but they went further and severed their links with the whites. By pulling out, these elite troops, accounting for three-fourths of the forces deployed against Moscow, men who had repeatedly driven the Red Armies backwards, brought about a caving in of every one of the white fronts. Worse still, the White High Command and Denikin, instead of acknowledging their own strategic and political blunders, blamed the Cossacks. So much so that they refused to see them evacuated from Novorossiysk to the Crimea. General Sidorin, the commander of the Army of the Don, came close to killing Denikin where he stood, such was the explosive nature of their encounter. Bereft of all command, Shkuro was obliged to leave the country for exile, whilst General Mamontov was poisoned on the night of January 31, 1920 before the very eyes of his powerless spouse in the hospital where he was recovering from typhus. We cannot be certain who was responsible for this murder but suspicions fell on hardliners from the volunteer army, members of Osvag, the Denikinist Chika, who had already eliminated Ria Bavoy. It should be said that General Mamontov had, on foot of the prerogatives of the Don Sovereign Assembly, the Krug, violently opposed Denikin, although he himself was only Cossack by adoption, which just goes to show his democratic leanings. Let us add that he was extremely able and very popular with the Cossacks and could, by himself, have turned the military tide against the Reds. The dim-witted Denikin deliberately sawed away the limb upon which his entire venture rested. Rejected by his own, forced to flee far from home territory, and after his closest collaborator and friend, General Romanovsky, was cut down practically in front of him at the Russian embassy in Constantinople by an ultra-nationalist officer, Denikin turned to the writing of his memoirs, or rather, to a self-serving apologia for all his plans. Many years later, in 1937, he still had learned nothing for in a little pamphlet entitled Who Rescued Soviet Power from Perdition. He claimed that the man responsible had been Pilsudski, the Polish marshal and president, who had refused in the autumn of 1919 to coordinate his operations against the Reds with Denikins. He forgot to say that he himself had at no time been willing to recognize Polish independence and intended to absorb Poland back into the Russian Empire, perhaps because his mother and his wife were Poles and he was trying to hold his family together. In any event, he had unnecessarily made himself an irreconcilable enemy in the shape of the former socialist and rabid Polish nationalist, Pilsudski. His successor, Rangel, repeated the same mistakes vis-a-vis -vis the Cossacks who retreated with him into the Crimea. On April 8, 1920, he had General Sidorin hauled before a court-martial on charges of Cossack separatism. Sentenced to four years' penal servitude, then pardoned by Rangel but denied the right to wear a uniform, having been discharged from the army, Sidorin emigrated to Prague. Rangel, who was equally short-sighted in military affairs, was so confident of easy victory over the Reds that he deployed only 40,000 men in the front lines, whilst retaining 300,000 in the rear. In spite of all his efforts, he therefore tasted the same disappointments as his predecessor but at least, to his credit, oversaw the evacuation of all the troops that expressed a desire to place themselves beyond the reach of the Chika. Lenin, Trotsky and the Bolshevik leadership could scarcely have dreamt of finer nincompoops with whom to grapple. The fateful year of 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, witnessed the first stirrings. Inside the USSR of revisionism regarding Nestor Markno. On February 8, 1989, a young investigative journalist, Vasily Golovinov, had a wide-ranging article published in Literaturnia Gazeta, the influential weekly paper of the Writers' Union on Bakko Markno, the Civil War werewolf. It amounted to a sort of rehabilitation of the Ukrainian revolutionary. We immediately contacted this journalist with an eye to the chances of our publishing our works on the subject in Russian. Progress editions in Moscow, the then specialists in works of the sort, devoted a lengthy review to this present book. Written by N. Silin, the review was rather favorable but and this was evidence of the critic's plight at being confronted with a long-forgotten past, he scolded us over the omission of Soviet archival sources, when he himself acknowledged that these were inaccessible even to Soviet researchers and for not having dwelt longer on Western sources, oral sources or Markno's own writings, which were not available in the USSR. 
The upshot was that our book could never see publication in Russian unless complemented by Soviet archival materials. In point of fact, this delicate refusal amounted to an acknowledgement of the ignorance and powerlessness of official Soviet historians in the face of a mass of data emanating from the West and concerned with a past history consigned to oblivion by single-party rule. The Fate of Markno's Wife and Daughter Golovinov's article was the starter's flag for a whole series of sensational publications. We might focus on that from Sergei Simonov, the last Soviet historian to have shown an interest on the topic, through a mischievous piece back in 1968. Under the title Underneath the Black Flag, The Life and Death of Nestor Markno, he tells of the lengthy correspondence and conversations that he had with Markno's widow, Galina Kuzmenko, and his daughter, Lucy. He might have been better advised to publish this only in an edition with commentary in the margin, because it is of tortuous construction and endlessly intercut with personal thoughts of the most maudlin sort and the whole thing makes for a difficult read. Even so, let us draw out the substance of it. Following publication of his article, he received a letter dated April 4, 1968 from the town of Jambula in Kazakhstan, from Galina Kuzmenko who gave him a lengthy account of everything that she had been through, not merely as an emigre in France but also inside the USSR to where she had been deported from Germany in 1945, along with her daughter. Let us take a look at the main new information on offer. Galina offers a precise description of Nestor's last days and final hours in the Tenon Hospital. She confirms that his real year of birth was 1888, a year earlier than the date shown on the official records, the purpose being to put off his being called to the colours, this being something that played a crucial role in the commuting of Markno's death sentence to one of imprisonment for life, precisely because of his tender years. She recalls how his father's real surname had been Mknienko who, being nicknamed Markno, had adopted this surname instead and registered all his children under it. Galina confirms the authenticity of her celebrated diary, seized by the Reds in 1920, wherein she gave a day-by-day -day account of the activities of the Cormacnavist group from February 19 to March 26, 1920. Written in Ukrainian, translated into Russian, this text has been reprinted many times over since then. All in all, it has the ring of truth, except in the passages where she has Nestor a drunken Nestor at that dancing to his own accordion accompaniment. Remember that Markno himself challenged this diary, supposedly kept by his spouse, certain passages of which had been used by Soviet historians to discredit him. As Vasily Golovinov wrote us, only handwriting analysis could establish its authenticity. The main point to emerge is just how extremely severe Markno and his comrades were not shrinking from on-the-spot execution of all insurgents guilty of extorting money. From or bullying the populace. They were not ones to bandy words about revolutionary ethics. Simonov makes a passing reference to the fate of Leon Zadov, executioner of many Bolsheviks, bodyguard to Markno and the man who carried the wounded Markno in his own arms into Romania. Of Jewish extraction, which puts paid to any charges of antisemitism leveled against Nestor, not to mention all of the protracted rebuttals offered Markno himself or by others, Zadov was later recruited by the GPU. He worked for the GPU up until 1937 when he was purged, as were virtually all protagonists of the Civil War. Simonov notes with amazement that Zadov's son made a glittering career for himself in the Soviet Navy under his father's real name of Zinkovsky before retiring with the rank of rear admiral. Simonov wonders, without however advancing anything to substantiate his thesis, whether Zadov might not have been planted inside the Maknavist movement right from the outset by the organs, which is to say, the Chika. The argument may be a bit raw, but Simonov argues that the Chika was capable of anything. Galina continues her tale, with Nesta and a dozen other insurgents she was evacuated to Romania, before moving on to Poland in the spring of 1922, where she was jailed with Nesta for 14 months in Warsaw, charged with having fomented an armed uprising in eastern Galicia, then part of Poland. There she gave birth to her daughter Elena on October 30, 1922. On their release all three of them moved on to Danzig where they were rearrested by the German authorities on charges of having persecuted German settlers in Ukraine. She was freed shortly after that and made her way to Paris with her daughter. 
And for Nestor, he then made his escape like something out of a novel, a rope made of torn blankets, bars sawn through with a file, etc. without giving her the full details, in accordance, no doubt with the rules of revolutionary conspiracy at that time. Among the other intriguing details offered by Delina, although Simonov explains that she was cautious in her choice of words, this being in 1968, when she had not yet been rehabilitated by the regime and was therefore still under surveillance, we have confirmation that Schwarzbard, member of a Yiddish anarchist group, was well known to Markno in Paris. Markno did not agree with his holding Putlera responsible for anti-Jewish pogroms carried out in Ukraine, because Putlera had in fact opposed them, even though Markno had no great liking for him. Galina stresses that Schwarzbard's defense lawyer, Henry Torres, helped Nesta and her smooth over their difficulties with the French police, probably to overturn proceedings to have them expelled from French soil. Their daughter Elena, pet name Lucy in French, was often taken in by French anarchist families, never learned Ukrainian and even forgot her Russian. Galina worked fitfully for a variety of Ukrainian organizations in France. Conscripted under the STO, compulsory labor, service, scheme, her daughter was sent to Berlin in 1943 and Galina went with her. On August 14, 1945, they were both arrested by the Soviet authorities and repatriated to Kiev. Galina was sentenced to eight years in a labor camp in Mordovia. Curiously enough, there she met the wives of Yakir, the man who persecuted the Maknavists back in 1919, and of General Vasov, turned by the Germans during the Second World War and handed over to Stalin by the British and Americans, before being hanged in Moscow along with Shkuro, Krasnov, and other generals. She must have had a hellish time there for she wound up in the invalid section of the camp. She was freed on May 7, 1954 and assigned residence in Jambula in Kazakhstan, where her daughter was also assigned. When they met at the railway station they did not recognize each other, such were the changes in their appearances. It was only later on that they were reunited. Which leads Simonov, a young, unassuming citizen in 1968, moved by this picture, to say that Galina was worthy of featuring in a play by Homer, Shakespeare, or in Quiet Flows the Dawn. The impression she made upon Simonov, after their many encounters, was that of a strong and extraordinary character, the ordeals to which she had been subjected had not broken her nor her dogged common sense, the suspicion-driven caution which, according to him, was a legacy from the ghastly times in which she had lived. Simonov notes here that the misfortunes she had endured had not steered Galina's spirit in the direction of God and that she was, from her younger days through until she breathed her last, a dyed-in-the-wool atheist as well as a genuine, robust revolutionary. He was not afraid that this might not quite square with his graphological reading of Galina's handwriting which identified ambition, bordering even upon despotism, plus a degree of dissimulation discernible in the formation of the letters A, O, B and L. As we see it, the overriding impression was that she had remained true to herself, to Nesta and to the movement in which she had played a large part. Hats off! She died in 1978. Simonov also offers us information as to the fate of Lucy, Elena, Markno. Banished to the middle of the Asian steppes, under police surveillance, she was only able to survive by turning her hand to a range of exacting manual trades, canteen worker, factory worker, piggery employee, etc. from which she was often fired once the identity of her father was discovered, and this went on for many a long year. When Simonov met her in 1968 she was not yet married nor a mother but was living with a civil aviator. She had reluctantly agreed to the rendezvous, she was edgy, irritated and trusted no one. To him she seemed still young and elegant with her dark eyes and dark hair and bore a stunning resemblance to her father. He found her very much the Parisian, as he imagined one at any rate. Her Russian was still heavily overlaid with a French accent. In her mother's presence, she declared to Simonov that she had always despised politics, that she remembered her father well and recalled that his house had always been filled with people and newspapers. Way back then she had pledged that she would take no interest in politics or newspapers. She reckoned that she had no homeland and could not bring herself to regard either France or Russia as such. Many men had shown an interest in her but on learning whose daughter she was they had promptly made themselves scarce 
sometimes properly, sometimes in a cruder or more craven fashion, thereby exposing their own true natures. I never wanted children. Bring more wretches into this world. So that they might share the same fate as me. When I was in France I knew nothing of my father's part in your history. When I found myself incarcerated in Kiev, one of my fellow prisoners, discovering whose daughter I was, asked me if he was the renowned bandit. I took offense at that and slapped her. At the end of their meeting, she asked Semenov to send her some French newspapers as they just could not be had where she was living. It has to be said that Semenov in no way retracts any of the comments regarding the negative views expressed in his 1966 study of the Maknavist movement. Quite the opposite. His text closes bizarrely with his imploring the Lord to forgive his servants Galina and Nesta, for they knew not what they were doing, and calling upon him to forgive all of us poor sinners, he probably means all Russians. As for himself and in spite of the belated onset of compassion, he never lifted a finger to help Galina and her daughter back in 1968. What hypocrisy! Lucy, Elena, Markno died an untimely death in 1993 at the age of 71, still confined to Jambula. We can only suppose that she had had to grapple with the straits caused by the breakup of the Soviet Empire and visited upon the Russian and Ukrainian minorities by the nationalist authorities. Belasha's key book. Scenting the dangers of an historical and political rehabilitation of Markno, the ideologues of the Communist Party of the USSR, while they still held absolute power, urgently commissioned a negative study of the subject. 1 V.N. Volkovinsky published Markno and his downfall in Moscow in 1991. Rehashing all the old Leninist clichés and relying upon a one-sided critical apparatus, he delivered his latest anathema upon the Ukrainian insurgents. Alas, the USSR, so called, met its own spectacular downfall, whereby the party state's right of imprimata over historical publications evaporated. Whereupon a whole series of works much more favorably disposed towards the subject saw publication. We shall dwell upon the most significant of these, Victor Bilash's memoirs, to which we have referred earlier. Simonov wrote that in 1976 he had had a visit from Bilash's son who had given him some information about his father, released by the Reds, he had been banished to Krasnodar in the Cuban, where he worked as a mechanic in the workshops of the Hunters' Union. In December 1937 he was arrested and sentenced to face a firing squad. On April 29, 1976, he was posthumously rehabilitated on the basis of insufficient evidence. The published book contains the full text of his self-justifying memoirs, drafted in a Chica jail and fleshed out by his son through the addition of a large number of documents. In spite of our reservations about passages in which the author claims that he was always a passionate advocate of honest alliance with the Reds and offers the occasional criticism and reproach directed at Markno, it was this that earned him his freedom, one thinks here of the confession that Bakunin wrote for the Tsar and which also earned him his freedom and facilitated his escape from Siberia. The book as a whole represents an important source of information. For our purposes, we shall make do with rehearsing the main items of information from Belash which present our monograph in a new light. Take for a start, the Gulyai Polyanarcha Communist Group in the aftermath of 1905. It had 50 active activist members, each of them in touch with a further for sympathizers. It was in close contact with local and regional anarchist groups, having a supply line to libertarian literature and arms from Ekaterinoslav and Moscow, through Voldemar Antony, the group's founder and leader. He was of Czech origin. The group's members got together with Antony on an almost daily basis in order to familiarize themselves with the thought of Proudhon, Stirner, Bakunin, and Kropotkin. The reforms of Stolopin, the Tsarist prime minister reforms that destroyed the rural commune, were fiercely criticized. In 1905 the group passed a resolution attacking any trespass against the physical integrity of any member placed under arrest by the authorities, such trespass would be answered by implacable revenge. Let us leap forward in time to a hill reprint, CPP 73-89 of Belasha's book, of the minutes, of the Second Congress of Insurgents on February 12, 1919, which we ourselves have reprinted in part in our book, see Chapter 14 and the Documentary Appendices. 
This, a document of the greatest significance was drawn first from the archives by Bilash's son. It records the composition and affiliations of the 13 elected members of the Revolutionary Military Soviet, three left social revolutionaries, three Bolshevik communists, and seven anarchists. For good measure, Bilash's son also reprints the minutes of the Third All-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets controlled by the Bolsheviks. Also included is the resolution from the Congress of the Maknavist Revolutionary Military Soviet which drew delegates from 32 districts of the region, and which issued a call for a united front of revolutionaries. It recognized the authority of freely elected Soviets, it repudiated any party dictatorship, it called for the death penalty for looters, bandits, and counter-revolutionaries to be closely supervised by the local revolutionary military tribunal for immediate abolition of the Chika, for all unit commanders to be elected, for freedom of speech, press and assembly for all left-wing organizations, without any repression whatsoever, there was an insistence that there be no national persecution within the revolutionary army, and a strict fraternal discipline rooted in awareness of revolutionary duty was introduced. This text was omitted from both Arshinov's book and my own book here. The Belashes, father and son, cite several Bolshevik memoranda and reports on frictions between the insurgents, the anarchists, and communist political commissars, offering the occasional interesting and unexpected detail, for instance, that two wagonloads of literature and appeals meant for the inhabitants of Berdyansk and Marupol and escorted by anarchist and social revolutionary agitators, were sent out in March 17, 1919, provoking the wrath of the political commissar author of the report, for they included an appeal from Markno denouncing the parasites arriving to talk down to and order people around. Look at the resolution from the Nabat, Toxin, Anarchist Congress of Ukraine, the one from the Third Regional Congress of Insurgent Soviets, held in Guliaipoli on April 10, 1919. Belash gives a detailed breakdown of the military deployment on each front, which affords us some idea of the part played by the Maknavists. He reprints numerous appeals and proclamations from Markno, as well as other articles or texts lifted from the insurgents' newspapers and now made available for the first time. Precisely what Markno did not have at hand when he came to write the remainder of his movement's history, having stopped at December 1918. A secret order from Trotsky that the Maknovskina be mopped up without prevarication or hesitation and with all firmness and severity, also drawn from the archives, deserves to be publicized, as do other, hitherto unpublished, orders along the same line, pp 238-239 at sec. This amounts to a veritable indictment of Trotsky who stabbed the insurgents in the back and had them gunned down whilst they were trying, with scarcely any arms or munitions, to hold the line against the white offensive, Trotsky's responsibility here is exposed with plenty of supporting evidence. It is also a terrific indictment of the Bolshevik regime as a whole, which opted to surrender the front to the whites rather than allow an autonomous popular movement to spread. Victor Belash drafted his memoirs on the basis of his staff notes and campaign diary. They offer us a highly detailed picture of insurgent numbers, their organization, the military operations in which they engaged and the outcome thereof. Apropos of the crucial battle with the Whites in Paragonovka in September 1919, he cites the figure of 18,000 Whites slain, a considerable toll in terms of the numbers committed. Nearly 7,000 others were eliminated, including 2,500 Chechens, near Alexandrovsk and in the ensuing fighting, etc. At that point the Maknavists numbered 100,000 men, 250,000, if we count the unarmed reserves in their rear. Their units completely smashed the white rearguard, cutting them off from ports, arms and munitions supply lines in the rear. Denikin was obliged to pull troops out of front-line service against the Reds in order to send in his best troops to halt the Maknavist onslaught. What we have now are detailed figures regarding what we already knew about the crucial significance of the famous encounter at Paragonovka in terms of the outcome of the civil war. It should be stressed that Belash claims the credit for having dispatched numerous units to all four corners of the territory in order to reap maximum benefits from this victory and this contrary to the opinion of Markno who allegedly upbraided him for weakening the insurgent army. Among other interesting items, he cites the distribution of wheat to the peasants, free of charge, 
A 50% prior deposit was paid on clothing orders placed with workshops and garment factories, even though the insurgents were often in no position to pick up those orders on account of the fluid military situation. There are intriguing statistics regarding the social extraction of the insurgents. 25% were farmhands or landless peasants, 40% were medium-sized or poor peasants, 10% were well-to-do peasants owning no land of their own, 10% were landless peasants who earned a living from fishing, 5% were drovers, 7% industrial and transport workers and, finally, 3% were petit bourgeois. Broken down according to age, it transpires that 80% of insurgents were aged between 20 and 35. As a result, Many had been participants in the 1914-1917 war. Their geographical provenance is similarly intriguing. 50% were from the Ekaterinoslav province, 25% from the Tavrida and Kherson, 7% from the Don, 8% from Poltava province and the remaining 10% were drawn from several other regions. In October 1919 the front manned by the Maknavists covered 1,150 kilometers from end to end when the Whites' entire front facing the Reds covered 1,760 kilometers. Note that in the wake of the second agreement with the Red Army, nearly 8,000 partisans refused to accept this accommodation and left the main body of the army. Even so, the latter fielded 13,000 insurgents along the lines facing the Whites, where they played the telling part of which we know. One of the most important statistics quoted by Victor Belash relates to the movement's political persuasion. Of the 40,000 partisans in the insurgent army, in November 1919, 35,000 of whom were laid low by typhus, 70% were Maknavists and sympathizers, 5% of whom were anarchists, 20% were sympathetic to the social revolutionaries and Putlira, and only 10% were former Red Army soldiers, 1% of them Bolshevik communists. In short, the Belash's book represents a crucial source on the Maknavist movement. Not merely on account of the statistics cited and the minute descriptions of operations mounted but also because of its reprinting of lots of texts lifted from the archives. It is a splendid book and we look forward to seeing it translated and published in French. The Archives and the Markno Publishing Boom From the use made of them by the younger Belash, it is plain that there are lots of archival materials available, especially in Ukraine itself. The state archives in Kiev appear to be the best equipped, but every town of any significance has its own archival collection as well. We salute the archives in Dnipropetrovsk, formerly Ekaterinoslav, which in 1993 published a pamphlet reproducing a number of documents and drawing up a detailed listing of its holdings on Markno and the Maknavist movement. Unfortunately, Access is not easily come by for a variety of different reasons, in the immediate term at any rate. Be that as it may, there must be materials there on the basis of which a number of other facets of the Maknavist movement can be explored further. As we said before, lots of publications on the subject have seen the light of day. However, it is very hard to get hold of them in current circumstances, for there is no national distribution network either in Ukraine or in Russia and it requires a good network of connections before one can lay hands on them. For instance, none of the books recently published have been able to cite Belash, due to their having been unable to get hold of a copy of his book. We salute the 1995 republication of Arshinov's History of the Maknavist Movement by Rough Country Publications in Zaporozhye, formerly Alexandrovsk of several editions of the Memoirs of Markno, including a 334-page one in Moscow in 1992 from Republic Editions, albeit that much of the first volume has been dropped the 192-page anthology put together by V. F. Verstiak in Kiev in 1991, even though it offers no details or source for the texts presented the literary study, Tachankas from the South by the journalist V. Golovinov, Moscow 1997, a joint publication by Mars and Rough Country editions containing many irksome and ambiguous personal remarks, citing numerous unpublished testimonies and heavily reliant, indeed, upon our own monograph. In Moscow and Smolensk, Olympus and Ruzich publishers produced Vadim Taylitsyn's for 44 page Nesta Markno, using the works published previously, albeit without acknowledgement finally. There is Alexander Shubin's 176-page Markno and the Maknavist Movement, Moscow 1998, 
MIG Publishers, which represents a political rehabilitation of Markno and of the call for free Soviets. Shubin cites examples to show how self-management operated in the region. He is a historian, a one-time anarcho-syndicalist and leader of the Greens in Moscow. His plentiful references to sources and archives which are not plainly identified and not reprinted as they are in the Belash book, which he ignores, hoist it into the academic register but undermine its interest as a source of documentation. Note the smallness of its print run, 1,000 copies were printed, indicative of the publishing and distribution problems in Russia today. By comparison our own book, 10,000 copies spread over three editions, is a very respectable effort and speaks well of the French public's interest in the matter. Speaking of which, we salute Helene Chatelaine for her documentary film, Nesta Markno, Peasant of Ukraine, broadcast by the Art Television Channel on February 26, 1997. Among projects in the making, there is the plan for a Russian-language edition of the anthology of Nesta Markno's writings published by us in French in 1984, and by AK Press in English in 1996 as The Struggle Against the State and Other Essays, to mark the jubilee of Markno's death. This will prove a real find for Russian and Ukrainian readers, these essays being utterly unknown to them. This present monograph was issued in Russian in Paris in 2000. An important anthology of documents, including a contribution from ourselves, regarding Nestor Markno and his wife Galina Kuzmenko was issued in 1999 for simultaneous publication in Russian and Ukrainian in Kiev and Guliopoli. Some homecoming that will be for the prodigals to the land of their birth. Which is only right as far as a matter of this significance is concerned, because in the 20th century an age of calamity upon calamity, the Machnavist experiment and that by the Spanish comrades in 1936 to 1939 represent the only attempts to install a society wherein human liberation might be something more than empty rhetoric. Alexander Skirda. Paris, 2001. Nesta Markno, Anarchy's Cossack, The Struggle for Free Soviets in Ukraine 1917-1921. Retrieved on the 31st of December 2020 from Libcom.org. Translated from French by Paul Sharkey. Audiobook created by Revenomous. The Anarchist Library, anti-copyright, theanarchistlibrary.org. The End. Thank you for listening.